we can go ahead sir all right good morning friends uh, i can see 86 uh, people have already joined on the second day of the fifth steve rosha memorial stimulus pg teaching course the first virtual course of its kind uh, let me welcome uh, again professor dr gr joshi head of department bharti vidyapeet orthopedics dr madhav khadilkar head of unit bharti vidyapeet we have dr sanjay dev head of department of uh, orthopedics at dy patil medical college and hospital and to start off today's proceedings is dr yogesh panchwag who is a well renowned orthopedic onco surgeon following him will be dr varid altaf who is going to talk about hand examination and then i will talk to you about uh, the limping child before we go to a few case presentations so welcome and i hope again today is a fruitful day because later on in the day we have lot of uh, table viva stuff instruments implants x ray reading specimens and of course orthotics dr nagesh naik will be joining us so let me hand over to yogesh to start the first talk of the day examination of a tumor case over to you yogesh well thank you very much sir and a, and a big thank you to all the organizers at uh, sanjeet institute and bharti uh, vidyapeet medical college uh, i'll be taking you through the you know just just the important aspects of what is to be dealt with or what is to be seen when you are you know examining or presenting a tumor case uh, in your examination uh, i may not be able to cover all the nuances all the details of of the tumors but uh, i'll just quickly try and brush through the important aspects uh, that you need to know uh, maybe this will be helpful for you to sort of uh, brush up uh, your knowledge about tumors and understand what you need to say in the exam and what you need to be aware of uh, in order to pass uh, the exam typically a tumor case is going to be a short case for you so uh, you need to be very precise and uh, correct in giving your answers so what uh, an uh, an uh, a resident who is going to give his exam need to know about bone tumors is to uh, understand how you will approach a particular case how will you work it up how will you read the imaging done for that particular case uh, more importantly uh, if i am your examiner i'll expect you how to do a correct biopsy where to place the correct biopsy site what are the broad principles of management i would not expect you to know the details of the surgical uh, details of or the techniques of uh, treating these particular tumors and what are the various uh, limb salvage options available for uh, say Uh, a, a primary malignancy affecting the skeletal system so these are the basic uh, outline uh, on to which i'm going to base my talk today and uh, in the next maybe 20 25 minutes or so try and take you through the uh, essentials so let's take two case scenarios on the left hand side of the screen you can see that this is a 10 years old boy who was presented with a very rapidly growing swelling in the distal thigh on the left hand side as as you can see Uh, the history duration you have to note it is a short history about say four to six week duration and on the right hand side you have a homemaker a 35 years old lady who is presented with the symptoms for about three to four months of a similar swelling same site distal femur on the right hand side there is a swelling over there in the distal femur so note the age difference and note the difference in the history because these are the pointers that will tell you how aggressively the disease or that particular lesion is behaving in the body uh, that will give you a certain idea of what you are dealing with and why is age important age is important because there are certain conditions uh, certain tumors neoplastic conditions of the skeletal system which will be common for certain age groups for example an having sarcoma or a simple bone cyst will be commonly seen in the first decade of life and osteochondroma or an osteosarcoma or a chondroblastoma will be common to see in the second decade of life whereas a giant cell tumor is more common in the third decade the fourth decade is where you get to see some cases of giant cell tumor or osteoclastomas and chondrosarcomas as well and as the patient crosses into the fifth sixth seventh decade then these primary bony neoplasms start becoming rarer and what is commonly seen are metastatic bony lesions as well as certain cases of hematolymphoid malignancies like lymphomas and myelomas so in general even if this is not a compulsory rule that the tumors will follow in a patient's body this is the general broad 
differentiation or distribution of that particular neoplastic uh, lesion that may be presenting in age-wise population. Once you get a patient like this, once you have seen that patient, typically in a very rapidly, aggressively growing lesion, as is the case with a 10 years old boy, you will notice that he may not allow you to sort of palpate that particular lesion because it may be tender, it may be painful. The patient may have a sort of a flexion deformity. The terminal range of move movement will be restricted usually, not always, but usually. It, it may be restricted because of sympathetic effusion, because of pain, because of mass effect, or simply in certain cases because of intraarticular extension of the disease. So you have to note these particular points in inspection and palpation. Whereas a 35 years old lady that we were talking about on the right hand side, she'll be very comfortable. She'll allow you to examine uh, and palpate the lesion pretty well. You can know that it is arising from the bone. There is a diffuse expansion of the bone. The knee movement, range of movement will be almost near complete. And typically in bone and soft tissue tumors, unless and until the lesion is very big or it's arising from the uh, nerve, you won't have any distal neurovascular deficit. Typically, except for a few cases of, say, a typical uh, synovial sarcoma or epitheloid sarcoma, which are basically types of soft tissue sarcomas, you won't have any lymph node involvement also. But for the sake of completion of local regional examination, you need to have a, a look at the distal neurovascular conditions as well as the regional lymphadenopathy. Now, once you have seen this patient, obviously, the examiner is going to ask you what is going to be your next step. And please, at this particular time, don't forget to say, that you will do an x-ray of the affected part more likely you know more uh, better answer will be to get an x-ray done of the affected bone in its entirety and on the left hand side you have the x-ray of the 10 years old boy and on the right hand side you have a x-ray of the you know, 35 years old patient and you can see the difference the way they appear i'm not going to go uh, through the details but obviously the 10 years old boy has a lesion which is very ill-defined you don't know where exactly the lesion has started and where it's ending, at least on the x-ray. You can see that there are some light sclerotic lesion in the intramillary area of the distal femur. You can see that there is a soft tissue extension of the lesion with some periosteal reaction of typical Cotman strangle and sunray spiculing that is seen. And you know that you're dealing with a very, very aggressive lesion over there. Have a look at the distal growth plate in an immature skeleton and have a look at the joint uh, if it is involved, the nearby joint, whether it is involved or not, and comment about anything about the X-ray. So these are the things. Obviously, it is now clear that the 10 years old boy is probably having a highly malignant lesion, such as an osteosarcoma, which is most likely, though he's only 10 years of age. Evings is also likely differential in this particular case on the radiology. And on the right-hand side, you have seen that the X-ray is showing a very well-defined lesion what we call as a narrow zone of transition. You can see that there may be some sort of an internal septation or pseudo septation as we call it, uh, which is giving rise to sort of a soap bubble kind of an appearance. The bone is expanded, there is cortical thinning, there is cortical expansion, but there's no obvious breach in the cortex except for maybe the posterior side where seem to be a good cortical rimming in the, in the soft tissue extend, extension part. And this indicates that the body is trying to wall off the lesion and probably this is a benign lesion or to be more accurate, this is a benign aggressive neoplasm that we are dealing with. In both the cases, the adjoining joint doesn't seem to be involved. It will be a good idea to image the entire bone proximally as well because especially in cases where you are suspecting malignancies so that you are not missing any obvious lesion or skip lesion in the proximal part of the bone. So do say in the exam that you will like to get an x-ray of the entire affected uh, area with the proximal and the distal joint included in the x-ray. What does this particular location of the tumor tell you? Now, if, it, if, the, if the lesion is in a less than 30 years old patient, more commonly the epiphysis, which is an area where you will be seeing infections and chondroblastomas as the likely neoplastic etiologies. Osteosarcoma is in the metadiaphyseal location. So is chondromyxoid fibroma and aneurysmal bone cysts, but these are eccentrically located. Simple bone cyst is in the metadiaphyseal region, but it is more centrally located. And in the diaphyseal area, the commonly seen neoplastic lesions are having sarcoma in younger population and fibrous dysplasias. So these are the common uh, neoplastic etiologies that you'll get to see as far as the location in the bone is concerned. 
If you are considering a patient who is more than 30 years of age, then these particular differentials start changing. In the epiphyseal region, in a patient who is 30, 40 years old, more likely possibility is that it's a giant cell tumor or it could be infection or in certain cases it could be a subarticular cyst such as a GO. And metatiphyseal lesion may be an enchondroma or a chondrosarcoma. And a diaphyseal lesion in an elderly individual or an elderly patient can be either a metastasis or a hematolymphoid malignancy, which is a lymphoma or myeloma. So these are the differentials based on the location. That, that is what you have to see on the X-ray, what you are probably dealing with. So that's when we decide that, okay, the 10 years old boy probably has a very aggressive neoplasm and the middle-aged lady has probably got a benign aggressive lesion that is affecting the distal end of the femur. So X-rays are done. What are you going to do next will be the obvious question. So the right answer will be to do more imaging of the affected part. And in four bony neoplasms, the best sort of uh, investigation to get done after an X-ray done, X-ray is done, is getting an MRI scan. Obviously, because MRI gives you a lot of information, ideally ask for an MRI scan with a limited CT cuts of the affected area because that together is going to give you a lot of more information. A lesion such as an osteoosteoma, which is uh, uh, not very evident on an X-ray, is not very classically clearly seen on an MRI scan, but a 1 mm uh, CT scan is going to give you a very good clear picture of an osteoosteoma. So this particular boy, as you can see, uh, has got a neoplasm which is affecting the distal femur on the MRI. The intramillary lesion now you can see is very uh, big as compared to what was seen on the X-ray. The soft tissue component is all around the bone, as you can see on the sagittal and the coronal images, and it's almost reaching the epiphysis. The lesion is reaching the epiphysis. What about the lady? The lady's got this particular cystic and solid lesion. In the periphery, there are there is a solid mass, and in the center, there, is, there are cystic cavities. Probably multi -lo multiple loculations are there, but you don't see those classical fluid fluid levels which are seen in addressable bone cyst. So again, this corroborates the fact, as you can see over here, the posterior breach in the cortex is very well rimmed by this particular black periosteal newborn formation. So again, this particular image tells you that the 35 years old lady is suffering probably from a benign aggressive lesion. Joint is not involved. There is no intraarticular extension. The articular cartilage is reasonably very well maintained. And in the 10 years old boy, you know that this is a very aggressive neoplasm again. MRI, the actual sections also give you a good idea about what the relation with the neurovascular bundle is. So this particular case where we are thinking of an osteosarcoma or an amic sarcoma, and you can see that there is a big soft tissue uh, mass uh, or a component that is surrounding the femur, distal femur. The neurovascular bundle is just at, at the periphery on the surface of the mass posteriorly. The muscles have been pushed to one side as you expect in a sarcoma. It is a centrifugally growing lesion. So it is going to push the muscles to the periphery and not really invade like a carcinoma invades. And on the actual section again, in this particular middle-aged lady, you see that the neurovascular bundle is completely free. There is not a very big soft tissue extension of the tumor posteriorly out there. And this, in general, will give you an idea about how you are going to treat these patients uh, correctly in the future. Obviously, the next questions are going to be something like, what other investigations are you going to do? So you will need some lab investigations in cases in case of this 10 years old boy. You will, in addition to the routine lab investigation, should ask for something like serum alkaline phosphatase and lactate dehydrogenase, which will point towards the prognostication, higher the alkaline phosphatase in case of osteosarcomas and higher lactate dehydrogenase in cases of waving sarcomas may indicate a poorer prognosis to begin with. These are more likely to serve as uh, markers for response to treatment because as we start treating these patients with chemotherapy in the future, this particular levels of alkaline phosphatase and LDH are expected to fall respectively in cases of osteosarcomas and aiming sarcomas. And that will indicate how well the patient is, going, is responding to the treatment that is being administered. In an elderly patient, if you're suspecting a metastatic lesion for some reason, then there are other multiple markers which actually uh, point towards certain organ, primary organ of involvement, and you might have to get them done right at the outset. What about this lady that we were discussing about with a benign aggressive neoplasm in the distal end of the femur? 
Well, you do the routine preoperative labs, but you also have a look at the alkaline phosphatase levels. Because as we know, Brown's tumors of hyperparathyroidism, as is evident on this particular X-ray and MRI scan, can very well mimic a giant cell tumor and they may be wrongly treated as giant cell tumor. And they will look exactly like an benign aggressive neoplasm. So if the alkaline phosphatase levels are raised, if there is hypercalcemia, get a serum parathormone levels done so as to find out a case of hyperparathyroidism. What about getting a chest X-ray done? Well, in cases uh, of benign aggressive neoplasms, a chest X-ray, simple chest X-ray is good enough for staging of the lungs so as to rule out any lung metastasis in the lungs because in benign aggressive neoplasms, there is a 2 to 4% chance that you may have lung lesions as well. But when you are thinking of this 10 years old boy who's presented with a very aggressive malignant looking lesion on the X-ray, you have to get a CT scan of the chest with thin slices so as to find out the presence of any pulmonary metastasis at the time of diagnosis. About 10 to 12% of our cases do have pulmonary metastasis at presentation. That is one poor prognostic marker. And so you have to be aware of what the staging is like in this particular cases. Now, classically, in a case of osteosarcoma or Eming sarcoma, a CT chest and a bone scan with local X-ray and local MRI is what you require for complete investigation. Nowadays, you know that you have a advanced uh, modality like a PET scan that is available, which is sort of used in cases of osteosarcomas and aiming sarcomas, but they are not mandatory. Uh, PET scan actually has a certain problem about low specificity and very high sensitivity. So it may pick up infections, it may pick up granulomas and may upstage the patient when actually they are not having pulmonary metastasis. It may show as if the patient is having some other metastatic lesions. So the report of PET scan is to be taken with a pinch of salt. And what we advocate in uh, staging for osteosarcomas currently is a bone scan, a three-phase bone scan with a plain CT chest with thin slices. For aiming sarcoma, bone scan, CT chest, and a bone marrow aspiration biopsy. And in select cases, when PET scan has been done in cases of waving sarcomas, you may do away with a bone marrow aspiration biopsy for staging investigation. So staging is a, is a, is a technique where uh, you are trying to find out whether the lesion has affected any other part of the body or not, more so the other skeletal uh, area and the lungs, because obviously you know that sarcomas are more likely to metastasize to the lungs than any other organ in the body. So once all these investigations are done, then you start thinking of treating this patient. And before you start treating this patient, so you need to establish the tissue diagnosis. You need to know what the histopathology is like. If you're planning a major surgical intervention in any patient, let it be benign, let it be aggressive, let it be overtly malignant to begin with on the X-ray, remember that you should not do the surgical treatment unless and until you have a tissue diagnosis. So in both the cases, the 10 years old boy, as well as the 35 years old lady, you have to do a biopsy to establish the histopathology report because the treatment is going to differ according to the histopathology report. Now, a quick word about biopsy. How is the ideal biopsy done? Usually, we now advocate doing needle biopsies. As far as possible, we try to avoid open biopsies. There are certain pros and cons of both. Remember, the correct biopsy site is which is a shortest route to the tumor, which violates only one compartment which is placed in the line of incision of the definitive surgery and it should be away from the nearby joint and it should be away from the neurovascular bundle. So that is what you should know. There are a lot of advantages of getting more material by doing an open biopsies, but nowadays these are discouraged. As far as possible, if you have an experienced pathologist with you, it is better to do a needle biopsy. It is an OPD basis procedure, can be done under local anesthesia, it, there is highly, uh, you know, there is no risk of any infection or there is no risk of tissue contamination or causing an iatrogenic fracture. And the main advantage is that you can take course from the depth of the tumor from all areas, but the incision site or the insertion site of the needle should be the same. Remember, as you can see in this particular picture on the top, that the incision of the biopsy has to be in the line of incision of the definitive surgery, because this has to be taken out at the time of final operation when you are going to operate on this particular patient. So needle biopsy is the way to go. Another word, if an examiner asks you about FNAC, FNAC has no role in establishing the primary diagnosis of bone and soft tissue neoplasms. It is used only in select cases when you are trying to detect recurrences or very small nodules. 
Otherwise, you have to do a biopsy to have a histopathological tissue for diagnosis. So once you have come to this particular stage in your viva or in your case presentation, you may be asked, okay, doctor, on the left-hand side, the 10 years old boy, what you are suspecting, all right, you have done a biopsy. You have done a biopsy from, say, the lateral side, and it has turned out to be an osteosarcoma. And this lady on the right-hand side, uh, the X-ray that you see, uh, we have done a biopsy through the lateral approach, and it has turned out to be a giant cell tumor. So how are these to be treated? Obviously, both the cases are to be treated in a different manner altogether. And this is where you need to have some broad idea about how you're going to go about the treatments. So when you're thinking of treating a case of malignancy, the main question that you'll be facing is whether a limb salvage surgery is possible in that particular case or not. We do it very safe. We know adequately well that there is no difference in the overall survival and the local recurrence rate in a cases which have been treated with amputation vis-a-vis -vis limb salvage surgery, provided that the case has been treated with chemotherapy and a surgery has been done with adequate margins. So nowadays, that's the way we go uh, uh, by. We treat all the cases of osteosarcomas and avic sarcomas with new adjunct chemotherapy. There are multiple advantages. You know that it makes the surgery easier by reducing the vascularity, by forming a pseudocapsule, by healing the pathological fractures, by reducing the satellite lesions in the reactive zone, and thereby reducing the local recurrences. There are other advantages of new actual chemotherapy, which you should be aware of, like evaluation of the chemotherapy response after you send the biopsy specimen for pathology after you have resected it, having time for customization of processes and improvement in the overall survival. So these are the added advantages that you need to know about chemotherapy. You may not know the detailed doses of the chemotherapeutic drugs. You may, uh, it will be helpful if you know a few drugs which are used in osteosarcomas and amic sarcomas. Obviously, the prognosis in primary bony sarcomas depends on how the, well the patient has responded to chemotherapy and how well you have resected the tumor. And while we are talking about margins of resection, you need to be aware of the classification system that this particular gentleman, Dr. Uh, Enneking, had put forward. And you all know that there are four types of resections. One is an intralesional excision, one is a marginal excision, the third is known as a wide excision, and fourth is a radical excision. So when we are dealing with primary bony neoplasms, remember that wide local excision where we have removed the tumor with a bit of extra margin of bone as well as soft tissue is preferred. In a benign or a benign aggressive neoplasm, an intralesional excision and a marginal excision is what is typically done. And radical excision is now reserved only for cases where you are not able to do a limb salvage surgery or doing a limb salvage surgery is going to be uh, uh, carrying a very high risk of local recurrence. Uh, Professor Kawaguchi has given this concept of curative margins where they have proven that quantity of margins like 5 centimeters, 8 centimeters is no longer important. The quality of margin that you get uh, while resecting these tumors is important. So this is a concept that you need to be slightly aware of. So remember, how do you resect the primary bony neoplasms? You resect them with at least three centimeters or two centimeters margins in the bone. You should have one healthy muscle cover over the extortious soft tissue component. If you have a barrier like a physis or a cartilage or a bony cortex, it acts as if it's uh, equivalent to two centimeters of margin, even if it's only a few millimeters in thickness. And you can go closer at the neurovascular bundle, leave the neurovascular bundle fascia over the tumor, and you can still say that you are about one, one and a half centimeters away. So not all cases are manageable by limb salvage surgeries. This is dependent upon what is the staging, that is how whether the patient has got metastasis or not, and how many, whether they are treatable or not treatable. Whether you can really resect this particular tumor uh, well by keeping good amount of function intact in the uh, extremity after resection and reconstruction. And obviously, in our sort of patients, you have to think about the socioeconomic status of the case, uh, case as well. As far as the the locally aggressive or benign neoplasms are concerned, as was this case of a giant cell tumor, you attempt to preserve and save the joint because that is going to give the best sort of functional outcome to the patient. Treat it intralesionally like has been done in this particular case by doing an extended curettage and do a reconstruction, use either allografts or bone cement and use appropriate internal fixation as and when is necessary. 
you have to have an idea about what are barriers to limb salvage surgeries in malignancies. There are only two absolute contraindications. One is encasement of a major motor nerve and inadequate muscles which are left behind after resection. If that's going to be the case, then you don't select that case for a limb salvage surgery. What about cases of benign aggressive neoplasms like giant cell tumor? When do you resect them and not treat them intralesionally? Well, it's pretty simple to know if the joint is involved, if the lesion has recurred multiple times, or if there is no bone left after you have done a curettage and there is hardly, you can do any sort of a reconstruction, then that's the case where you resect that particular area and then reconstruct with some option like mega processes or arthrodesis. So these are the things that you need to be aware about. I think this is the last slide. You need to be knowing about the multiple options that are available for reconstructing the defects that result after resection of a neoplasm, say a sarcoma. You can use either and customized endoprocesses or you can do an arthrodesis. In very young kids of six, seven, eight years old, rotation plasty acts like a very good option. Read a little bit about rotation plasty, be aware of what it is. Nowadays, we are using a lot of extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation. Osteoarticular allograft is something that is not very commonly used in India. An allograft process composite is another uh, particular resection modality that can be used. Obviously, the choice of treatment depends upon various factors. What is the age of the patient, site involvement, what are the demands, what is the expertise available at the center, and the financial status of the patient. Well, that was in short about how you will go about uh, examining, approaching, working up and treating a particular case. I've taken two examples, one of a malignant, uh, malignancy and one of an, a giant cell tumor. Uh, if you want to read more about it, go to our archives of Journal of Bone and Soft Tissue Tumors. In the first few uh, uh, issues, we have laid down the guidelines. And also there are short notes. There is an area called Students' Corner. So there are short notes which will be useful for you to try answer your uh, theory questions in the examination. Uh, thank you very much again. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Yogesh, for that absolutely lucid presentation on uh, an approach to examining and uh, all about bone tumors. So thank I will request all delegates to type in their questions in the Q and A box so that Yogesh can answer them if you have any queries regarding tumor. And uh, we'll move on quickly to Dr. Varid Altaf, who's a hand upper limb and microvascular surgeon at Sancheti on hand and wrist examination for postgraduates. Over to you, Varit. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I would like to thank the organizing team for giving me the opportunity. So quickly, I'll, I'll go with the examination of the wrist and hand. Uh, I think it is one of the commonest cases to have. And in, in one of the short case, probably you'll end up having, having a uh, case of an upper limb uh, maybe a nerve injury or or some malunited fracture. So it's a short case. The commonest possibilities are a malunited distal end of a radius fracture, any tumors or cysts around the wrist joint, a rheumatoid hand or a post-traumatic arthritis, say a slack wrist or a snack wrist, or any infective arthritis of the wrist, any nerve uh, chronic injuries like a chronic median nerve palsy or an ulnar nerve injury or chronic tendon injury. So these are the particular possibilities. Uh, this is a list of cases which you, which you are uh, expected to know and you, uh, uh, and you may get one of the cases, something like this in your exam. So what I believe is that in, in, a, in a short short case, you are asked three questions. And if you answer these three questions properly, you will, you will very easily pass in that particular case. So the first question will be, what is your diagnosis? And if your diagnosis is on track and examiner knows that this, is, this, this seems to be a reliable diagnosis, the next question he will ask you, what are the points in favor of your diagnosis? And at that particular time, you have to say points which are pertinent to your particular case, uh, the, which, the positive points which favor your diagnosis. And the next question will be, what will you do? And what will you do means, uh, what investigations you will do and what management will be from your side in that particular case. And if you answer this, I think your short case will get over in maybe 10 to 15 minutes and you'll easily pass in that particular case. But to go through all this, you have to examine that particular case in a very short time, which is 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, so that is why I'll, I'll go through a pro forma, which, which, which will help you in, in, in examining that particular case. 
so while examining whenever you get a short case history is important but your history has to be very quick very quickly you have to take the history maybe while examining that particular patient you keep on asking whether there was a trauma was it a blunt laceration or a penetrating wound is there any tingling or numbness pain any diurnal variation any swelling and so while examining the hand you will have to keep on asking these questions and always follow the sequence like all of us have been telling inspection palpation movements measurements and then special test so in a hand case i i i must tell you that your 80% of your diagnosis will be on inspection if you know the differentials in your mind and when you do a proper inspection of a patient you will you'll be spot on your diagnosis will be spot on so uh, maybe something like this if you see this particular picture there is there is some rotational deformity in the ring finger so it can be any malunited metacarpal fracture in this particular case you see there is there is an opposed extension in the little finger and there is a scar here so that means there is there is injury to the flexor tendons and probably to the fds and fdp both in zone 2 area this is a claw hand classical claw hand hyperextension at the mp joint and there is flexion at the interphalangeal joints and this is a chronic median nerve palsy what you called is as a ape hand deformity so so all these deformities if you see on an inspection when right away when the patient will show you the hand you'll be you'll you'll be easily able to diagnose this on inspection and subsequently you'll have to do further tests to confirm your diagnosis clinically so one important thing is on while doing an inspection only you have to tell the patient to make a fist open the finger and see whether there is normal movement in the finger whether there is any rotational deformity any drift is happening for example this particular case if you see the uh, the patient with the extended fingers it looks pretty much normal but when the moment when you tell him to flex the uh, fingers the there is a rotational deformity happening at the ring finger so <clears throat> so that is that this is again on an inspection you can tell him to make a fist open and you can see there is there is some drifting of the ring finger so probably there is some malunited metacarpal or a, a phalangeal fracture again this is a rheumatoid hand all of us know that on an inspection you can diagnose this this is a mallet finger and this is dupuytren's contracture so most of the obvious cases which are kept in exam the you will be you will be easily uh, able to diagnose them on inspection and once your inspection is over from all around and always compare it to the other side like we do in any examination and then you start with the palpation so quickly doing a palpation you <clears throat> you start from the radial styloid you can start from any of the sides actually but you it's better you start from the radial styloid and then you go around Uh, in the center of the wrist from the dorsum then you go to the ulnar side ulnar corner and then you come back to the radial styloid so that is easily you can you can go all around the wrist so when you are palpating the radial styloid you can have you can you can palpate for uh, the first cmc joint which is just distal to the radial styloid so you can uh, you can see for some cmc joint arthritis you can go look for a decurvin stenosynovitis or something known as a wardenburg syndrome which is proximal to the radial styloid that is compression of the superficial radial nerve so these may be three differential diagnoses on the radial side then you go into the center that is the lunate you you palmar flex the wrist and then you palpate on the center of the wrist if whether there is any tenderness maybe some kin box disease is there if there is a tenderness in the center of the wrist and and then you go towards the ulnar side and you you palpate over the ulnar snuff box and look for the tenderness over the uh, tfcc region and the ulnar distal then you go to the distal radio ulnar joint so if you follow this sequence very less likely you are you, you will be able to uh, miss any particular pathology again well while examining for the radial styloid you have to you have to go into the snuff box and palpate for the scaphoid to look for any tenderness in the uh, snuff box that is the same thing which i told you you go around the uh, the from dorsal to volar side always compare it to the other side and you will get an idea whether there is any wasting of muscles or any other deformities which you can pick up by comparing to the normal side so range of motion again is very important in hand you have to compare it to the other side you 
uh, normally sometimes what is, is some examiner may ask you the range of motion of particular joints that is the MP joint or the IP joint or the distal interphalangeal joint. So one should be aware of the normal range of motion of these particular joints. Another favorite question of most of the examiners is demonstrating the actions, the movements of the thumb, which most we have seen most of the residents get confused. They fumble and they, uh, they sometimes give wrong answers when they are asked to demonstrate the thumb movements. So uh, to make it simple, the abduction of the thumb, abduction of the thumb is, is perpendicular to the palm. So always bring out your thumb 90 degree to this and this is the abduction of the thumb. So some, uh, some residents we have seen doing something like this. This is actually extension. This is not the abduction. This is in plane with the palm. That means it is extension. When you go 90 degree to the palm, it is abduction. So this is your abduction of the thumb and this is your abduction of the thumb. This is extension. And then you cross the midway and this is flexion of the thumb. And this is a position, all of us know that. So most of the times they are confused with abduction and adduction of the thumb. So just remember that because very high chances that you get this question. So hand is all about special tests now. You, 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 are about, you should know about all the muscles which are there, how to test for each and into each individual muscles like uh, FDS, FDP, extensor, abductor. So, so you, should, you, you, you should have a thorough anatomy of, of all your uh, muscles, origin insertion. And then you can easily uh, demonstrate that particular action. For example, this in this particular case, what is being checked when you when you uh, support all the other fingers and one of the finger you have to flex means the examiner is checking the flexor digitorum superficialis here. That is how the FDS has to be checked. And when you stabilize the middle phalanx and then you ask the patient to flex the distal interphalangeal joint, that means the flexor digitorum profundus is, is being checked. So you have to stabilize the joint, which is proximal to that, because we know that FDP is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx. So that is how the FDP is checked. Similarly, extensors, we, uh, we know the first compartment is abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. And then when you go more laterally uh, uh, towards the ulnar side, this is the extensor pollicis longus tendon. So this is the first compartment and this is the second compartment. Sometimes the examiner may ask you to demonstrate the action of EPL and uh, then you have to, I'll, I'll tell you how to do that. So this, the pointer which is showing is, this is an abductor, this is the first compartment, APL and EPV. You are, you are all supposed to know about the all six dorsal wrist compartments. I'll not tell them now, but uh, we assume that all of us should know about this. There are six dorsal compartments and what are the contents of each dorsal compartment and what is its clinical relevance of each particular compartment. That is also very important because it's one of the favorite questions of most of the examiners. And this is uh, how you check for the ECRL and the ECRB when, the, when, you, when your hand is, finger is flexed with a clenched fist, when you extend and you give some resistance here and at the same time you have to palpate for the ECRN and ECRB, just proximal to that to see the bulk of the muscles, whether that is contracting. Because as a rule, whenever we are checking power of any muscle, one of the hand should be supporting, giving some resistance, and the other hand should feel the contraction of that particular muscle. So the bellies are somewhere here proximal in the forearm of ECRL and ECRB. And while doing an ex extended finger, you are, you are checking the long extensors of the fingers. That is the extensor digitorum. This is the extensor pollicis longus. So you keep your hand flat on the surface and then tell the patient to lift up the thumb and then try to feel that tendon and that is that is the extensor pollicis longus. Similarly, an ulnar deviation and try to palpate the muscle here in this corner that is the extensor carpi ulnaris. And that is the opposition of the thumb. This is the flexor pollicis longus. Again, stabilize the proximal phalanx of the thumb and then tell the patient to flex and then see the movement for the flexor uh, pollicis longus muscle. So ulnar nerve, again, a very common case to get in an exam. You may get a high or a low ulnar nerve palsy. 
so this particular case again in on an inspection you will be you you will come to know that he is, the patient is having an ulnar nerve palsy sometimes it's a combined claw, complete claw hand something like this in this particular picture that uh, there is all the four fingers are getting there is a hyperextension deformity of the mp joint and there is a flexion deformity in the ip joint so that is a complete claw hand probably because of both ulnar and median nerve palsy again there is if you see this uh, arrow is pointing at the wasting of the first web space a very important finding again this is this is the muscle where the adductor pollicis muscle is there and whenever we have an ulnar nerve palsy there is gradual wasting of this first web space which otherwise is a very very strong muscle if you palpate this muscle and then you see in those patients you will not find any muscle there it will be just a hollow and there is on an inspection also you will see a a, a hollow here that is the wasting of the first dorsal compartment this is again showing wasting of all the intermetacarpal areas where uh, you can see that the all the, that is means the dorsal and, and introsia uh, palmar and dorsal introsia are all wasted so there is a hollowness in the in between the metacarpals which which again tells us that it is an ulnar nerve palsy because introsia are supplied by the ulnar nerve again one of the favorite question is a froment sign basically uh, probably asked to every student who uh, gets an ulnar nerve palsy case in exam so basically to know in details about this test this test test three muscles the mm. three muscles are <clears throat> adductor pollicis first dorsal interosseae and flexor pollicis longus out of these these three muscles are being tested when this test is done and out of these three muscles two muscles are supplied by median nerve and one muscle is supplied by the ulnar nerve so basically what happens is whenever a patient is asked to do this i i'll have to, yeah whenever a patient is asked to do this in this particular case if you see the left right hand side is i am examining this the left hand side you can see the patient so when he is trying to hold the paper he is he is he is flexing his uh, ip joint in order to get the grip because his adduction is weak the adductor pollicis is not working otherwise this particular action is done by adduction and when that is not working so is trying to flex the thumb to get hold of the that is the fpl which is supplied by median nerve which is paired so the flexor pollicis long, longest is taking over and uh, trying to grab that which we call it a card test or a book test so that is a froment sign again you can see this in chronic cases you can very uh, nicely see wasting of the uh adductor pollicis and while doing all the routine day to day work sometimes they you know develop this kind of an attitude and in chronic cases you can see a flick fixed uh, deformity in the ip joint of the thumb again important sign for diagnosing the ulnar nerve is an ogawa test you tell the patient to move your middle finger on either side and touch the index finger and the a ring finger and if you and and do it on both sides simultaneously and you will realize that the patient is not able to do this particular movement on the affected side you cannot that, that is because of this interosseae are paralyzed and uh, patients are not able to do that so again a very important sign in diagnosing an ulnar nerve palsy then abductor digiti minimi always check this is again a very strong muscle on the just in the on the ulnar border of the hand you see for the strength of this muscle you tell the patient to abduct the little finger give resistance and you can feel this muscle it's a very strong muscle and you will you'll be surprised to see that there is uh, there is complete loss of this tone of this muscle when there is a low particularly a low ulnar nerve palsy sometimes when there is a compression in the gyans canal so this one particular muscle becomes completely wasted and there is an opposed pull of uh, and and there is this kind of a deformity is there in the little finger something like this unopposed pull because of the extensor digiti minimi muscle because the interosseae are not working so that is uh, we see in low ulnar nerve palsy first dorsal interosseae you just abduct the index finger give resistance and then palpate for the muscle somewhere over here in this region coming to the median nerve median nerve is all the th we, we know all the thinar muscles are supplied by the median nerve except the adductor pollicis which we have seen previously so 
checking for the abduction of the thumb is very very important i told you earlier abduction of thumb is 90 degree to the palm so bring it out like this and that is how you check that is what we called it as a pen test so in a pen test you can see in this particular patient that is the normal side a patient is able, easily able to touch that tip of the pen and and if you see on this side the patient is uh, is, is flexing the ip joint flexing the ip joint rather than ab ab abducting the thumb and bringing it out you can see the wasting is there so they are unable to abduct so that is one of the that is known as a pen test so that's how it is done so this is another as a benediction sign it's seen in anterior interosseous nerve so whenever you try tell the patient to make an o like this they cannot make like it's showing in the left side so this goes into extension because the flexor pollicis longus is not working the flexor pollicis longus is not working and fdp of the index is not working which are supplied by the deep branch of the median nerve which is the anterior interosseous nerve so that is why they cannot make an o sign that is a deep a, 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 a low a median nerve palsy which is um, the ain branch particularly that is pointing index they cannot make a point whenever that ochsner's class test and a pointing index the patient cannot be able to make uh, whenever they are make a fist and there is an unopposed pull of the extensor then there is a pointing index sign sensory supply again very very commonly asked to all the students what is the autonomous zone of the radial nerve median nerve ulnar nerve and where do you check for the sensations of these particular three nerves in detail another important question which is asked to most of the students is when you have to check the extension of the mp joint and the ip joint so whether the lumbricals are working or the it is the posterior interosseous nerve when you have to rule out whether the it is the long extensors which is causing extension or it is the lumbricals which is causing extension because lumbricals also cause extension of the pip joint and the long extensors which are supplied by radial nerve also causes extension of the ip joint so this particular video i'll try to show you so when the fingers are extended that is the long extensors we are checking the long extensors and the moment when you flex and then when you extend this is sorry this is when you uh, check the long extensors and when you extend that means you are checking the interosseous and lumbricals and lumbricals particularly that is causing the extension of the ip joint so sometimes the examiner may ask you that you have to differentiate the extension of ip joint whether it is caused by a radial nerve is involved or an ulnar nerve so that is a trick moment when you when you when you flex then you negate the action of the lumbricals and then you extend that is the long extensors are extending and when you do it in extension that means the lumbricals part is working so that is again important thing so another special test in some special scenarios like this is a carpal tunnel syndrome in which you do a phalanx test you do a durkan's test or you do a direct carpal tunnel compression test a two point discrimination is also very very important some of the examiner may ask you whether you have demonstrated it how do you do it a monofilament is used and what is the normal two point discrimination in, in in the fingertips what is the normal range decurving stenosynovitis we all know frinkel seen time uh, seen test and what test that is the wrist hyperflexion and thumb abduction test is more specific to diagnose this this is a <coughs> foveal sign which is classically seen in a tfcc injury so when you palpate in the ulnar snuff box that is how it is done and and you just relax the make sure that the elbow is rested on the table and then you ulnar deviate and just palpate on the in the soft spot here then that that will give you a positive test piano key sign is when you that's like a ballotment test for the druj pathologies you can always you should always compare it to the opposite side because sometimes there is a ligamentous laxity and there can be the same amount of laxity on the other side so you can see what is being demonstrated here is 
This is a Volkmann sign, which is seen in a Volkmann's ischemic contracture. So when you flex the wrist, you are able to extend the interphalangeal joints. But when you extend the wrist, you are not able to do the same thing. Sure. So that is a constant length phenomena. When the forearm muscles are contracted, you try to increase their length. You are able to extend the finger. But when you dorsiflex and then you do it, you cannot do it. So that is that is a Volkmann sign. Uh, another important cases which you can get in exam are swelling across the wrist joint. I think Dr. Panchwag has wonderfully explained about all the tumors which are you are expected to know. In the distal end of radius, you, can, you may have, you may get a lipoma, you may get a giant cell tumor of the lower end of the radius, and you may get some other malignant swelling, uh, swelling also. I think when you get a tumor case in exam, when you get a swelling case in exam, if you are able to answer whether it's a benign or a malignant with your proper justifications, you will pass in that case. So differentiating whether you are dealing with a benign tumor or a malignant tumor is very, very important. And we have seen residents getting confused, you know, in, in justifying is, is it a benign or a malignant. So a shorter duration of a history, a rapid growth, it goes towards the malignant tumor. If there are dilated veins, something like this, it can be a malignant tumor. You know, if there are constitutional symptoms, it is a malignant tumor. If it's a long-standing uh, swelling for years altogether, that can be a benign tumor. So these are all clinical things which you can, which you should know how to differentiate between a benign and a malignant tumor. So, uh, for example, something like this, you can see a shiny skin. You can see the whole distal and radius is is, is, is the cortex is uh, perforated and soft tissue extension is there. So you are dealing with some aggressive tumor here. It can be a malignant tumor. So it's a giant cell tumor, which is a which is an aggressive tumor. Similarly, you can see a bony swelling, something like this, and on X-ray you can see some lesion like this. Irina. Yeah, and that that is what you that is a giant cell tumor of the ulna. Again, a common thing. Similarly, this is an osteogenic sarcoma of the lower end of the radius. You can get a giant, a malignant tumor sometimes, or a giant cell tumor of the phalanges, which 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 present like a malignant tumor clinically. So that this is an osteosarcoma. This is again a bony swelling, hard in consistency, coming from the phalanx. You can see it it it, it classically looks like an exostosis of that that was an osteochondroma, which which was excised. Sometimes the diffuse swelling in the wrist all over. So whenever something swelling like this is there. Uh, you, it's probably an infection you're dealing with, maybe some kind of an, a cellulitis or, or septic arthritis and there is infection. Similarly, if you see sometimes a boggy swelling crosses right across the wrist joint from uh, the forearm to the palm, you can see in on MRI, this is a dumbbell shaped swelling. So that is a compound palmar ganglion that is again most commonly kept in exams. So that is how it extends right across the carpal tunnel. So these are all swellings across the wrist. Uh, sometimes you, you may get a tumor in in exam. So I'll end with this. Thank you so much. We can take some questions if if the, if they are there. Thank you, Varid. Thank yeah. you. I think there are a four or five questions in the chat box <coughs> which you can answer. We can um, type it or we'll answer it live. Yeah. Do we have time? Or what? I'll just check. Yeah, we have about yeah five minutes. You can answer them. Okay. Uh, so, Bunnell's O test versus OK sign, any difference? So, OK sign is basically a sign which I told you, uh, which is uh, for the anterior interosseous nerve. That is the sign when you check for the deep branch of the median nerve, which supplies the deep compartment, which is uh, flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. So whenever you you are you are checking the OK sign is you are checking for that anterior interosseous nerve. I think the Bunnell O test is is something different. Bunnell O test is when you check for the intrinsic intrinsic tightness. That is, Bunnell, that is the Bunnell test. So OK sign and this they are they are different. So can you elaborate between Finkel screen and Ecoff test? Yeah, see both of these tests are done for Kikiruin spinocinovitis. 
So the Finkelstein test is a test actually which you should not do because it's very painful test. You have to put your thumb inside and then you do a dorsiflex, then you do an alar deviation and you see that there's a lot of pain. So that is that is the Finkelstein test. Then came the Ekoff test because the Finkelstein test is very painful. Then uh, then many of these uh, uh, books show the Ekoff maneuver, which is holding the thumb uh, in distal phalanx like this, and then just gently pushing it, uh, uh, pulling it. Sorry, so pulling it in this direction. That is an Ekoff test. It is very less. Uh, it is less painful than Finkelstein test. So whenever you are seeing a patient, you first do an Ekoff test and see how much pain it is there before doing directly this. Because sometimes what you do is we directly do something like this and there is a lot of pain and patient will, you know, jump off the chair. So that is, that is the difference between these two. Okay, sign is which I have. Okay, sign is which test? I don't know what this question is. Mechanism of Elson, Elson test. You know what is Elson test? Elson test is when we do uh, extension, we check for the extension of the central slip avulsion basically whenever there's a central slip avulsion you know you keep it uh, your finger with on the end of the table and give a resistance and then tell the patient to extend the pip joint so that is usually done for when you check for the integrity of the central slip of the extensors on the side okay. of the table you put the, your hand and then you do the extension that is elson okay and last thing I think is in brief between intrinsic plus and minus deformity and then I'll start my talk. Yeah, so see it is uh, I think for to make it very simple intrinsic plus deformity and intrinsic minus deformity intrinsic plus is when you it, it's a deformity like this intrinsic contracture when there is extension of the IP, and IP joint is flexed IP joint is extended that is the intrinsic plus. And intrinsic minus is a claw hand when there is hyperextension of the MP joint and flexion of the interphalangeal joints. So that is the intrinsic minus hand. This is the intrinsic plus hand. So I don't know what is the question is in short regarding. So that is how you, you have to examine for ulnar nerve to see whether the, that is involved when you are checking for the intrinsic minus hand. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Varit. Uh, I think yeah, other questions you can type in the answers, whatever are there. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. So from from uh, tumors and hand, I think we'll just move to uh, the third part, which is limping child. All the pediatric short cases that you get usually will be a limping child. So I'll just briefly go through this and then we'll do some cases. So the first thing I would like to tell everybody is the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. So it's important that you read your books and you have seen so many cases that Varit showed you today. Once you see something, you will always remember it. To define a limp, it's any deviation from the normal gait pattern, which means you should know the normal gait first. The gait cycle of stance and swing and the phases of stance and swing is what you should know. Now. A limp may be caused by the following causes, to put it simply. Pain, weak muscles, abnormal muscular activity such as spasticity dystonia, abnormal fulcrum, which means painful joints or dislocated joints, and limb length discrepancy. If there is shortening, then you will have a limp. When you see a limp, first thing you should differentiate is, is this a painful limp or is this a painless limp? In a child, that simply differentiates into various conditions. If your child has a limp with pain, then you are looking probably at traumatic conditions, infective conditions, inflammatory conditions, tumors, or metabolic or hematological conditions. Whereas if your child has a limp which is painless, then probably what you are looking at is a congenital condition, a developmental condition, a neurological condition. Again, metabolic hematologic conditions may have painless limbs. So you can. So why am I telling this? Because people give differential diagnosis of a painful limb with a painless limb. That cannot happen. Okay, you cannot give a differential diagnosis of this child has DDH or TB hip. It is not possible. Do you understand? Because one is a painless limb, 
and one is a painful limb so please remember when you say something in exam first is it painful limb or is it painless limb second you need to quantify pain now pain simply anywhere in orthopedics is of four types mechanical pain mechanical pain is pain which comes on loading and is completely relieved by rest and does not need analgesics for relief inflammatory pain is pain which comes off and on increases with activity is partially relieved by rest but needs medication to be relieved completely infective pain pain which is there at rest dull aching insidious in onset aggravated by activity not relieved by rest not relieved at sleep so they have night pain and not relieved by analgesics you will need antibiotics in addition to analgesics and finally tumor pain tumor pain which is aggressive as yogesh said is rapidly progressive destructive the last two qualities of the pain infection and tumor are very severe because they destroy bone in mechanical and inflammatory there is no destruction whereas last two there is actual destruction of bone so tumor pain is not relieved by anything is aggravated by everything and is not uh, relentlessly progressive so when you start you must always get the story i always call it his story rather than history because they tell you a story and that story can tell you what the diagnosis is depending on the age odp associated complaints what aggravates and what relieves is there increase in disability and what earlier treatment was taken so when you examine the children make sure they are suitably undressed in a long corridor make them run hop get up from sitting position cross leg sitting and ability to squat rules out any kind of hip pathology immediately beware of the clinic gate because the parents will complain that he is walking funny at home but in the clinic they walk straight in front of you so you should make them run jump hop so that it unmasks the problem that the parents perceive observe the trunk pelvis hips knees ankle and feet when you are looking at the child and observe the shoes for any signs of wear on local examination again this has been pointed out orthopedic examination is only five things look feel move measure and special test okay there is no auscultation or percussion in orthopedics so we have look feel move measure and special test anywhere on systemic examination look for spinal alignment any midline swellings any limb asymmetry wasting torsional problems so let me put it in perspective at what age group will you see what kind of problem in the toddler age group which means 1 year to 3 years if you get a child with a limp you are going to have either transient synovitis of the hip septic arthritis of the hip a toddler's fracture cp kids muscular dystrophy congenital coxa vara developmental dysplasia of the hip very rarely zero negative spondyloarthropathy so this is the spectrum in this age group now as you can see the transient synovitis is mild pain septic arthritis is infective severe pain toddler fracture trauma and pain cp is painless dystrophy is painless ddh is painless coxa vara is painless sna is mildly painful inflammatory kind of pain and torsional problems causing limp are commonest but they are completely painless right so remember all this when you have a child between 4 years to 10 years your problems are slightly different transient synovitis is still here infection is still here but perthes creeps in so like calf perthes disease discoid meniscus can come in with clicks in the knee and pain and limp now when the child undergoes a growth spurt the limb length discrepancy becomes obvious so remember that a painless limp between 4 and 10 can be shortening tethered cord comes in and hematological malignancy should be considered if there is chronic multifocal bone pain and other tumors may start coming up between 4 and 10 again adolescent age group when the child has undergone a growth spurt is a different ball game here you start seeing another condition coming in which is scfe slipped capital femoral epiphysis residue of dysplasia so you may have the spectrum of congenital dysplasia which means it may not be dislocated but if you have residual dysplasia you start getting edge overloading and pain on 
activity because they are now in the sporting activity chondrolysis young girls sudden onset trivial trauma and stiff hip overuse syndromes because of sports around the knee joint especially osteochondritis desiccans tarsal coalitions come up because again children start running jumping playing football and they start getting foot sprains and pain and then you notice that the child has a stiff flat foot tethered cord also is still here so let's go one by one torsional problems are benign problems of appearance they are really not problems they walk in toe or out toe and may have varus or valgus with hyperlaxity this is the batens criteria look for hyperlaxity genu recurvatum valgum pes plano valgus and just give me a moment हेलो आई थिंक देयर इज सम नेटवर्क इश्यू देयर या आई थिंक ही जॉइनिंग बैक नाइस ओके so i have answered most of the questions so to all the delegates i have answered most of the questions in the chat box uh, i would request all of you if you have any questions you can type in there we can we'll be answering or we can discuss it in the end क्या हो गया वरिद संदीप हैज लॉस्ट कनेक्शन क्या आई थिंक ही हैज लॉस्ट कनेक्शन ही इज जॉइनिंग बैक ओके देयर इज सम प्रॉब्लम आई थिंक या नेट का इशू नेट का इशू होगा सो आई देयर इज वन मोर क्वेश्चन टिल दैट टाइम आई कैन आंसर द क्वेश्चन व्हिच इज इन द चैट बॉक्स आई थिंक देयर इज वन क्वेश्चन व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन लिंप एंड लर्च डॉक्टर माधव कैन यू आंसर दैट या या ओके सो आई थिंक संदीप हैज कम बैक नॉट येट ना नो नो नॉट येट नॉट येट ओके सो बेसिकली uh lurch is classically a uh, trendlenburg type of gait wherein there is a defect in the abductor mechanism right. so wherein when the patient bears weight on the affected side the pelvis drops on the opposite side instead of getting pulled up and the body sways to the affected side that is a classic lurch or yeah. a abductor gait or trendlenburg gait and limp is something it can be a uh, uh, defective gait because of any cause i mean it could be a fracture in the toe to a arthritis to a hip arthritis to a ununited fracture anything that is causing pain Absolutely. or a uh, short uh, shortening of the limb that can cause a limb that so is. that is a limb and lurch is a specific term used when there is a problem with the abductor mechanism right right i think a limb has a pain element with it maybe the lurch may Correct. Correct. Having pain, and correct. it can be it can be originated because of a problem in any part of the lower limb. It could correct. be a foot fracture, a thorn in the foot, or ankle arthritis, knee arthritis. Anything can cause a limb, but a lurch is something which is specific to the hip joint. Right, absolutely. So there is another question: is what are the autonomous zones of radial, ulnar, and median nerve? I think I have shown it in one picture. I can again quickly tell you the. autonomous zone of the radial nerve is the first web space on the dorsum the autonomous zone of the median nerve is the pulp of the index finger and the autonomous zone of ulnar nerve is pulp of the little finger on the ulnar side so these are the autonomous zones and another the median nerve you said so okay, i think sandeep is back he is back yeah yeah okay median nerve i said is pulp of the uh, index finger Yeah, that is back. Uh, 
come back please can you yeah are you able to see yes sir. yes can you hear me yeah okay okay sorry so sorry yeah, for no, dropping no, off yeah. my battery died uh, so laxity of joints i was talking about and uh, okay. so excessive femoral antiversion oh, that is what you will see now toxic or transient synovitis how do you diagnose that as i said i am going to put everything into his story and then look feel move measure what is his story less than 3 days duration painful limp may or may not have trauma but usually we will have antecedent urti some viral fever or gastroenteritis when you look at the child there will be apparent lengthening flexion abduction extension rotation attitude when you feel there might be a little tenderness in the groin with a swollen scarpa triangle with restricted internal rotation measurements will show you there is some increase in the apparent length however the labs are usually normal mri is rarely needed hip aspiration is almost never needed what happens is that within 3 to 10 days they become all right with just rest and anti inflammatory but you must keep a differential of monoarticular rheumatoid that is jia juvenile inflammatory arthritis and incipient perthes because some children can get recurring such episodes which might be perthes septic hip a low grade tubercle start up may be a possibility resolve in one or two two weeks rarely you need traction moving on to septic arthritis the story is an acute painful limp with systemic signs fever chills malaise again you will have the flexion abduction extension rotation attitude with pseudo paralysis typically when i tell residents normally a transient synovitis child comes to your opd walking with a limp whereas a septic arthritis has to be carried into the opd he is either on a stretcher or he is not able to load the limb that tells you that this is infective you will see redness swelling dilated veins you will feel the warmth joint tenderness and fluctuation if any more severe restriction of movement in all direction that is global restriction and on measurement again apparent length and thigh girth may be increased x ray will show you widened joint space subluxation erosion destruction lab will show high crp high wbc if you aspirate again it's very high with more polymorphs and blood cultures are positive in 50% bone scan may be done to rule out osteomyelitis treatment is essentially surgical debridement metaphyseal decompression and if the hip is dislocated reduction and spica cast iv antibiotics as necessary so this is how a short case of septic hip will come to you example widened hip destroyed head and neck and residual sequelae tuberculosis of the hip the story is a little chronic it's insidious longer duration a night pain which is not completely relieved with rest with systemic complaints when you look at the child tb is a chronic debilitating condition so you have a ill child with attitude of flexion abduction extension rotation initially but as the destruction progresses it will go into adduction inter rotation with wasting scar sinuses and lymph nodes may be palpable when you feel feel for the warmth thickening of trochanter and tenderness in the groin again deformity will be very obvious in advanced tuberculous arthritis with stiff hip significant shortening and wasting depending on duration of disease example here it shows a mortar and pestle appearance with a destroyed hip make sure that you know the shanmukh sundaram different types of tuberculosis of the hip treat x ray will show osteolysis with severe osteopenia non concentric joint space reduction now these words are very important when you read x rays you must say that there is non concentric joint space reduction with osteopenia because of increased blood supply and if the hip is damaged advanced arthritis you might have subluxation protrusio wandering acetabulum or a mortar and pestle appearance mri may be helpful so this is an example where the hip is destroyed and that's a debridement you can take tb pcr from aspirate biopsy when is a, a good idea to do a biopsy and give prop, appropriate anti tubercular treatment traction and keep the child non weight bearing what is the end stage of a tb hip if it is in advanced arthritis stage you have only four options if it is reasonably congruent and stable with less pain with akt use it as long as possible 
otherwise you lose it which means excision arthroplasty and otherwise you fuse it which means arthrodesis okay joint replacement is not an option in tubercular hip in children so either you have to debride and continue to use it in whatever best position or you lose it or you fuse it juvenile rheumatoid now this is her story not his story because more girls than boys morning stiffness small joints remissions exacerbations symmetrical joints ip joints may be swollen may be deformed feel for the warm tenderness and stiffness and in chronic long standing there will be wasting always look for additional signs like sacroiliitis rash and iridocyclitis ra titer crp aso anti ccp should be done a bone scan can tell you about the poly polyarticular nature in uh, jia x ray initially may be normal treatment essentially with the help of your medical colleague is conservative depending on the aggressiveness of the disease may require dmards radiation sinectomy and rarely do they need surgery ddh painless limb with a wadal click on shortening without systemic signs look for increased skin folds increased lordosis toe walking trendelenburg typical example galiazzi sign positive prominent trochanter with telescopy and there will be exaggerated range of motion but if you try to abduct and the head hits the acetabulum there will be restricted abduction true supratrochanteric shortening and this is a typical waddling gait that the child will have widened perineum and a side to side waddle when the child walks so a bilateral ddh will present with this kind of a waddling gait this is for just your observation if you have not seen a bilateral hip waddle so this is trendelenburg positive you should know the risk factors when you have a child who has various features like torticollis plagiocephaly congenital hyperextension of knee metatarsus adductus or a club foot look for the hip because the hip is a hidden anomaly always examine proactively and do hip screening okay so i will not go here but suffice to say that there are two types of hip screening in neonates you do ortolani test or the barlow test you can read about them but when you get a exam case you will have a walking child now in a walking child never talk about ortolani and barlow because these are neonatal screening tests in a walking child you have to talk about shortening and telescopy and galiazzi sign x rays are usually diagnostic ct mri rarely needed draw the appropriate lines the vertical line and the horizontal lines and make sure where, uh, uh, what is your acetabular index so this is how you see when you reduce an arthrogram may be needed treatment depends on age at presentation close reduction arthrogram spica or open reduction with or without vdro and acetabular procedures okay an example of a older child open reduction with a dega osteotomy that is how it heals now congenital coxavara the only differentiating finding opposing to dh is restricted abduction and rotation which in ddh are exaggerated and they don't have telescopy okay so they will have a painless limp with shortening in coxavara but there is no telescopy and you will have restricted abduction x rays are diagnostic and treatment is always surgical you need to correct that varus perthes we'll discuss during the case but i will not talk much here we'll go on slipped capital femoral epiphysis now here you have an adolescent boy so the characteristics are very important with trivial trauma and groin pain and an external rotation attitude and with a sudden increase recently obese child hypogonadic features externally rotated leg groin is tender transtrochanteric thump is positive obligatory external rotation is possible po positive internal rotation is always restricted typically you will have true shortening so this is the child and the appearance chubby cheeks and on a x ray always look at the ap closely and draw the klein's line when you draw the klein's line if the head lies medial to it that tells you this is a sifi frog leg is diagnosed stick however doing a frog leg may displace the slip even further so you should be very gentle when you do the frog leg ct or an mri will be conclusive so these are the angles that you draw and treatment is either in situ fixation or today we do reduction with modified duns osteotomy or in situ with a 
intertrochanteric derotation osteotomy. Chondrolysis again and antalgic limp with a insidious pain in adolescent age group. Girls are more than boys. Normal labs on X-ray you will have concentric joint space reduction as compared to TB. This is a concentric joint space reduction which is non-destructive. MRI is again classical. It shows a typical patchy central uh, signal change. Treatment is extended non-weight bearing, ROM exercises and sometimes intra-articular steroids. Some non-hip conditions where you can have limp is discoid meniscus, osteochondral desiccans, overuse syndromes and remember growing pains. So look at all this in addition to the common conditions which I showed you. Okay, so particular tendinitis, Osgood-Schlatter disease. Always keep at the back of your mind that a limping child may have a limp from a spinal infection. Child who doesn't bend, the coin test is positive, will have a stiff back kind of a limp. And finally, leg and foot conditions. Tarsal coalitions, a stiff, painful flat foot. Limb length discrepancies in fibular hemimelia or post-septic growth arrest. And toddler fracture in one to three years always seen as a periosteal reaction. So examples of limb length discrepancy, tarsal coalition, spiral fracture of toddler. Can, tumors also happen in children, benign tumors, malignant tumors, and hematomalignant tumors. So remember that these also can cause limp, sickle crisis, leukemias, and tumors Yogesh has already spoken. Some tumors here, exostosis and osteoderma. So always end with looking at the gait. So the gait is also very important. Neurological limp comes with a painless limp in CP, muscular dystrophy, tethered cord or congenital uh, motor neuron disease or Charcot-Marie tooth. So typical gaits I will just show you for so that you can identify them. This is a hemiplegic gait. Leg is in equinus, knees flexed, but it's a walker. This is a jump and a scissor where you get adduction. The base of the gait is very narrow and the child is on the toes with flex knees and hips. Now this is an assisted jump. A crouch gait where you have hyperflexion in the knee and hyperdorsiflexion in the ankle. So that is called a crouch gait. And then you have a stiff knee gait where you can see here that the knee goes in recurvatum and he cannot clear the ground. So flexion is restricted. So rectus is overactive here and the child cannot clear the ground. There is no swing phase. The stance is prolonged. Dysraphism, dystrophy. Look for pseudo hypertrophy and Gower's sign. Short limb gait happens when discrepancy exceeds 5% and there will be toe and shoulder which drops on the same side without pain. Antalgic, you know this is short stepping. Stance phase is reduced and you lean on the opposite side to relieve pain on the affected side. And antalgia may be from spine also, where there is a slow, stiff gait. Trendelenburg, where there are weak abductors, abnormal fulcrum, pelvis drops to opposite side, and there is compensatory leaning. So to conclude, it's important to interpret your findings after you examine very, very thoroughly. And always interpret your findings correctly, depending on what all we have told you, so that you have a good diagnosis and you pass your exams. Thank you very much. Hello? Yeah, I think now we have the case presentation. We'll start with the presentation. Yes, yes. So I think I, I will invite Dr. Nagesh Naik, Dr. Sanjay Dev, and Dr. Madhav Khadilkar to join me for examination in these next two cases. So the first case, I think, is being presented by Dr. Siddharth. If you can uh, share your screen. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, today I'll be presenting a case on a limping child. So, an eight year old boy uh, brought by his parents to the OPD with the chief complaints of pain in the left groin since eight to nine months associated associated with a limb intermittent pain in the left knee joint since eight months 
patient was apparently all right uh, nine months back when he developed uh, pain in the left hip joint, which was insidious yeah. in onset. Yes, sir. Which was insidious in onset, uh, dull aching, non-progressive, mild to moderate in intensity, and occasionally refers to the left knee joint. Mother gave a history of pain aggravating after playing, and is relieved by uh, rest and medications. He is able to sit and uh, squat and sit uh, cross-legged with mild difficulty. There is no history of any significant trauma, blood transfusions, or any medication. There is no uh, history of evening rise of fever, URTI, loss of weight, or loss of appetite. His birth history was it was a full-term normal delivery without any perinatal complications. He is the only child born out of a non-consanguineous marriage and no history of delayed milestones. There is uh, no cox contact in the family, and personal history is insignificant. Okay, just stop. Yes, sir. Uh, so based on history, you heard the lecture now. Yes, sir. Uh, based on history, what do you think is the type of pain or the type of disease that this this limping sir, child has? Uh, on the basis of history, I would uh, uh, suspect a mechanical type of pain. Uh, okay. uh, probably uh, due to a low-grade infection like uh, tuberculosis, or uh, uh, probably due to uh, os so. Siddharth, you are contradicting yes. yourself. You are saying mechanical pain, and then you are saying low-grade tuberculosis, where we said infective pain quality is different. Uh, yes, sir. I would al also suspect uh, uh, Perthes uh, disease uh, uh, or a, trans a transient synovitis like uh, like condition. Okay, transient synovitis is acceptable. Perthes is acceptable. What yes. else? Why were you saying tuberculosis? Tu tuberculosis will have a different kind of pain. Uh, so because. Uh, Because is there anything you see you shouldn't give differential for the sake of it will have a off and it will not have an off and on pain and infection yes. will have a continuous pain it will not have an off and on pain okay okay yes sir. has the child received any medication uh no sir the, there is no history of uh, any medications and uh, is the child otherwise healthy and active? Uh, yes sir the child is uh, he is uh, averagely built and his uh, height and weight are uh, no no you are going to examination on yes. history is he active does he go to school does he play with yes his... sir yes sir on history he is an active child and uh, there is uh, no history of uh, uh, any constitutional symptoms like uh, correct so, so when you have a non toxic non ill child yes, tuberculosis sir. shouldn't be at the back of your mind oh yes sir so say, say, a transient synovitis, Perthes is okay. What else can it be? Sir, it could uh, probably also be a missed out uh, DDH of the left hip. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the that is that is acceptable. Maybe he has a mechanical pain because of a limb uh, discrepancy and instability. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That, that might be it. Uh, also, uh, I would uh, suspect uh, congenital coxa vera. Uh, okay. In this, uh, so did you ask for developmental history? Does the child limp yes, since sir. he was walking? He he has achieved his. Uh, he, there is no uh, developmental uh, delay, and he has achieved all his milestones um, as per the age. No, no, the history is since how many months? So the history is, is is since eight months, nine months. Okay. So if there is a DDH or if there is a congenital coxavara, when st will it start? So it will start uh, when the child will uh, uh, will start walking. Exactly. So does the mother give history that there was a limping child from one year of age? Uh, no, sir. So then that you shouldn't keep in your mind because your history is only eight months and child is eight years old. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just yes. because I am leading you on, you shouldn't get led on. Yes, sir. Okay. Go to examination. Okay, on a general examination and systemic examination, uh, patient is conscious, cooperative, well oriented to time, place, and person. He's averagely built and nourished. There is no pallor ictoris, cyanosis, clubbing, or lymphadenopathy. Uh, there are no neuroketonious markers and stigma of TB. Uh, I've examined the patient in sitting, supine, and standing position. His gait is unassisted bipedal Trendelenburg gait with a mild limp. 
Okay, what is Trendelenburg gait? The Trendelenburg gait is when the patient bear uh, while walking when the patient bears weight on his uh, on his affected side. There is drooping of the pelvis on the opposite side. Okay. Uh, so that would be a what Trendelenburg gait. Uh, what happens to the torso? When you are describing, uh, there is swaying towards the affected side. Yeah. Swaying of the yes, sir. Swaying yes, sir. Body. There is lurch towards the affected side. Uh, that is, the body sways towards the affected side, and the pelvis droops on the uh, opposite side. Sir. Pelvis droop and all will come in Trendelenburg test examination. While there, you should say body should body sways to the sways. affected side. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, so should I continue? Yes, on uh, patient uh, uh, on inspection uh, uh, from the front, patient is lying comfortably on the bed in supine position. Both oh, yeah. both anterior superior relax spine right? appear to be at the same level. There is yeah, no right? apparent shortening of the limbs. Attitude of the limbs is in extension yeah, at right? hip and knee, we and slight you. external rotation at hip. There is no visible fullness in the scarpa strangle. There are no visible scar sinuses, venous dilatation or positions. On examination from sides, the patient is standing comfortably. There is no increased lumbar lordosis. Head appears to be in line with sacrum. Thigh muscles on both sides appear to be normal and there is no visible wasting. Uh, examination from the back, head is centered over the shoulder. Both shoulders and scapulae appear to be on the same level. There is no presence of lateral curvature or both posterior superior iliac spines appear to be at the same level. Gluteal folds on both sides appear to be at the same level and, and there is no visible wasting of the gluteal muscles. Inspectory findings are confirmed on palpation. There is no local rise of temperature. There is mild tenderness on deep palpation over the anterior side of the left hip joint. The trochanters are normal and there is no tenderness. On measurement, there is no wasting of thigh and calf muscles uh, on the left side uh, on circumferential measurement. There is no apparent shortening of the left limb and uh, there is no true limb length discrepancy as confirmed by the Bryant strangle and the Nilatin's line. The movements at the hip joint are as follows. There is no fixed flexion deformity at the hip joint as confirmed by the Thomas's test. Abduction is less than 40 degrees of, the, there is less than 40 degrees of abduction on the left side as compared to the right side. There is, uh, how much is it? So, less than 40 degrees. So, the, no, what do you mean? No, it is 30 degrees, 40 degrees, whatever it is. Less than 40 is 0 to 39. Yes, sir. How zero, much is it? Yeah, 0 to 40 degrees uh, is the amount of abduction that is present on the left side. Uh, is present. Yes, sir. What is normal abduction? Sir, uh, 0 to 50, 40, 45, 50 degrees. 50? Don't you think it's a little too much? Mm, yes, sir. Is it definitely less as compared to the normal set? Yes, sir. It is uh, less as compared to the normal set. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, then the internal rotation uh, is 0 to 25 degrees on the left side as compared to the right side. Uh, the flexion, extension, uh, adduction and external rotations uh, are normal on the uh, left side. So where did you learn this less than 25 degrees? So you have to quantify the rotations or movements exactly. Na? So it is 30 degrees, 40 degrees. You can see on the right as it is 30 degrees on that side as compared to 40 degrees on 40 the right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is this, is this, this is not how you present range of motion. No? So, okay, sir. Okay, if you have a goniometer from midline zero, you have to say, okay, my goniometer shows there is 20 degree abduction. Okay. Less than less than 40, as I said, is zero to 39. Anything in between. So probably what I feel he wants to say, it is less by 25 degrees to the other side. Uh, so okay so the total so, uh, the total internal rotation which is there on the on the left side it is 0 to 25 degrees okay on the other side yes sir where other movements are normal uh, as compared to the right side that so, performed a trendlenburg test was positive 
uh, active SLRT was positive, the NARAT sign was negative, the Patrick's test and uh, the telescopy test and the Galilee Z sign were all negative. When you say active SLR no. test is positive, what, what, what do you mean to say? Sir, uh, uh, I have done the active SLRT test for the uh, patency of the extensor mechanism. Uh, extensor? Uh, extensor mechanism? And of and the flexion at the hip. No, no, you be very clear. What are you talking about? What do you mean extensor mechanism? The extension of the knee joint. Extension of the, uh, the knee joint. That is the quadriceps, the... the, uh, the the femoral head, the quad head, neck, or the uh, the quadriceps, which which are. You, th you think quadriceps is disconnected? Why would you do that test? You are talking in a hip case. What is the significance of SLRT in a hip case? That's what he wants to know. Now, why you yeah. are joint? In a child, why are you doing an active SLR test? First thing is, what is the difference between an active SLR and passive wow. SLR? Sir, uh, uh, passive SLR, uh, uh, we do it you know, for uh, examination of the um, of the spine, which is where we uh, where we examine if the patient has any sci sci sciatic uh, kind of pain or uh, prolapsed uh, intervertebral disc kind of okay. pain. Okay, and when do you do active SLR? And active SLR when we have to confirm the uh, the extensor mechanism of the. Uh, knee and the flexor, the, the extensor the, mechanism of the knee. How does an active SLR tell you, sir? If the patient is uh, able to, no, no, who has where is this given, sir? I'm not. We are presenting the hip case, ma. Tell us about its relevance to hip. Sorry, sir. Tell us what? its relevance with, uh, about the hip joint now. Leave the knee joint. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, the the active SLR will test the patency of the of the head, neck, or the uh, or the the flexor muscles of the hip. So, so in which case, to... in which case do you want to examine active SLR? Whether the patient can do? Uh, sir, in cases of uh, uh, non-union neck femur or non-union IT or correct, uh, correct, or accepted. Yes. Accepted. So, what is the age of this child? Are you suspecting non-union IT or non-union neck femur? No, sir. So, then why are you doing this test? See, Siddharth, basically yes, you, you are going okay and you have four examiners who are bored because we have nothing to ask you. And then you yes, give sir. us a full toss like this. You understand what happens? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In an exam, all residents should be aware that don't try to act over smart by doing some tests which is not really indicated because yes, we will latch on to it. Because there yes, is nothing sir. else to ask so far. There is no finding, there is no flexion deformity, there is only little yes. restriction of range. And suddenly yes, you say active SLR test and then you are confused because you don't know why the hell did you do it. Yes, sir. Okay, so never try, always stick to what is relevant and what is going to get you through exams. Yes, sir. Don't go for gold medal. Nobody should go for gold medal. Right, sir. Okay, go ahead. Then I would come to my uh, my provisional diagnosis. No, go back. Uh, last part I didn't hear. I have examined the bilateral sacroiliac joints, the spine uh, sp uh, spine examination and bilateral knee and ankle examination and for abdo are normal. There is no inguinal lymphadenopathy, bilateral lower limb pulsations are felt at dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial and there is no neurological deficit. Okay. This uh, My provisional diagnosis would be, this is a case of nine-year-old uh, nine year old boy uh, with left hip pain of nine months duration with trend. No, no, that is not a diagnosis. Yesterday, Dr. Harish told you very clearly how to give a diagnosis. What is your clinical diagnosis? What is your etiological diagnosis? And what is the functional problem? So the uh, clinical uh, diagnosis uh, would be, uh, uh, I would like to give a differential diagnosis of... Uh, a For a clinical diagnosis, what differential you want to give? Etiological, I can understand. Uh, In a joint pathology, please remember yes, all, all PGs who are listening. Okay, you have two kinds of cases you will get. Either a bone case or a joint case. In a joint case, there are only four diagnoses. 
साइनोवाइटिस अर्ली आर्थराइटिस एडवांस्ड आर्थराइटिस और कॉम्प्लिकेटेड विच मीन्स एंक्यूलोसिस और डिसलोकेशन नाउ वाई इट हैपन्स मे बी ट्यूबरक्यूलर रोमेटॉइड ट्रोमेटिक और एनीथिंग बट द जॉइंट डायग्नोसिस क्लिनिकली कैनॉट बी एनीथिंग अदर देन दिस in the bone it can be a tumor infection osteomyelitis etc where the long bones are involved in cases but where joint pathology now this is a hip joint case yes so sir. what is your clinical diagnosis first working diagnosis so this is a uh, this is probably a uh, synovitis of the left hip joint okay accepted why uh, synovitis so because the has to has to have a answer it is a dull aching type of a pain uh, which is mild no no synovitis is not decided by character what type of restriction of movement you get on clinical examination on clinical examination there is a mild restriction of abduction and internal rotation in this case correct correct uh, and uh, duration is not Uh, the duration is uh, is is a uh, chronic duration which has been which has been there for uh, the past nine months. So does is that going in favor of synovitis or early arthritis? Uh, See, I will tell you in case of synovitis in superficial joints, you must have only last ten percent range of motion restriction. Ninety percent range of motion is preserved. second there is no deformity third yes, there is effusion or palpable synovium with fluid accumulation and duration is usually less than 3 months okay sir. in early arthritis you will get restriction of more than 30% in more than one plane with early deformity and a duration of more than 6 months and in advanced arthritis duration over a year and fixed deformity in more than one plane yes sir so here you don't have deformity you have some restriction of motion your duration is more than 8 months yes sir. okay so it fits into it is evolving into early arthritis early arthritis yes sir so uh, this is uh, uh, early uh, this is a 9 year old male with early arthritis no of, limb length uh, discrepancy uh, there is no limb length discrepancy there so it is a 9 year old uh, boy with uh, left early arthritis of left uh, hip joint um, probably uh, due to perthes disease i would also like to give a differential diagnosis of um, a transient synovitis tuberculosis uh, developmental dysplasia of hip with a functional uh, disability of mild difficulty in squatting and sitting cross leg justify your diagnosis again initially i already pointed out to you developmental dysplasia justify why you are giving that as differential sir it, it could have been a missed uh, uh, kind of a ddh uh, on the on the left side which the patient uh, the, which the you have already you have already examined the child yes sir at 8 year old dysplasia of the hip what will be your findings and there will be significant shortening uh, so you said there is no shortening then why are you saying yes sir do your findings confirm shortening or telescopy no, sir there is no shortening there is no telescopy is then where where does ddh come into the picture yes sir so more or less painless you find that you should give differential diagnosis list you have to give you can say i feel this is perthes disease i have thought of many conditions and i have come to a conclusion that this is the only diagnosis which is there in my mind now you can say like that na absolutely right okay it is not mandatory that you have to give the differential diagnosis if everything is fitting into a single picture or especially when right. the part of discussion already you and been pointed on tuberculosis ddh synovitis all three points already are discussed why you want to tell them again now transient synovitis does it last for 8 months uh, no sir so now tell us positive findings in favor of perthes sir uh... Uh, positive finding in this case uh, it is a uh, it is a mild painless uh, mild uh, there is uh, there is limp basically 
then there is uh, mild pain which is uh, which is of a chronic uh, duration uh, the age sorry sir age does it fit with parthis the age also fits with the uh, diagnosis of parthis disease uh, which is which is around 4 to 8 years of age uh, and uh, there is must, there is history you know? of yeah sorry go ahead there is history of uh, uh, increased pain after playing and uh, or uh, uh, increased activity and there is and the pain is relieved on rest uh, or medications correct so your answer should be very precisely sir i have a 7 8 year old child with a relatively painless limp yes sir. with paucity of positive findings no deformity who is non toxic the commonest condition with these findings of mild restriction of abduction interrotation is parthis disease yes sir if you say so much confidently nobody will cross you okay sir okay what do you want to do sir i would like to get uh, his x rays done x ray okay. uh, what x rays x ray pelvis in ap and frog leg view okay show us the x rays yes sir so these are his x rays uh, this is an x ray of a uh, of pelvis with both hips in ap and frog leg view of a skeletally immature uh, skeleton uh, there is increased joint space on the uh, left side uh, there is increased uh, uh, sclerosis or the uh, hey, siddharth uh, before you go ahead i want to make a point here for all pgs okay it is not important for you to keep on saying skeletally immature i don't think any of our examiners pay any attention to that it doesn't fetch you any gold medal points it doesn't fetch you any points okay second when you are asked what will you do i would like if you can say precise x ray what will you do i will take x rays then i ask which x ray rather than that if you can say i would like to do pelvis with both hips x ray ap and frog leg view okay, okay? is enough yes. and last last point i want to make because i go as a pg teacher everywhere and give lectures people from south india especially have this habit of saying i will do rontgenograms okay then the exam can be held on rontgen and when did you discover x rays because again oh. again as i said it is not important for it you to call it uh, skyagram rontgenogram it doesn't this is not english language exam yes sir everybody please remember to say i will take x rays examiner understand x rays yes sir okay go ahead so there What is it increased uh, there is increased uh, uh, joint space on the uh, in the left uh, hip joint uh, there is increased density of the capital femoral epiphysis on the left side uh, okay yes. those are my sir positive findings and frog leg in frog leg uh, there is uh, again there is uh, increased uh, density of the capital femoral epiphysis uh, that is all and the medial jo joint space is also increased that's all anything else how much part is it one uh, sir is happening to the capital height of the capital femur there is uh, there is some loss of uh, uh, height of the uh, capital epiphysis uh, showing uh, a, a crescent sign sir yeah so the positive findings you should say the size of the epiphysis appear smaller than opposite side yes. that is a significant finding and you can see a lucent line going from front to back that is the crescent sign yes sir okay so does this confirm your diagnosis uh sir uh, i would also like to do an mri to uh, confirm Why? my diagnosis why you don't believe yourself Uh, you don't believe x-rays or you own an mri center <laughs> no no uh, sir i would this would confirm my diagnosis but to uh, this would manje kya in which other condition you get sclerosis of the head in a child with a crescent sign which decrease in height of epiphysis so only for so then why do you need an mri 
so to uh, plan my uh, treatment the is treatment uh, planning dependent on mri sir i would like to uh, see whether uh, the uh, how much of the femoral head uh, the severity of the uh, ne, osteonecrosis of the femoral head i would like yes. to con- get con- get it confirmed by with the help of an mri by a radiologist a radiologist is the one who will tell an orthopedic surgeon how much is the disease come on why do you need why do you need external validation from a radiologist does mri decide treatment uh, no sir then why do you want to do mri so to see the viability of the femoral head mela satatu when do you want to see viability of the femoral head what disease is this what is the difference no, no. between adult avian and pediatric avian yes, sir not a Hmm. simple no pediatric head avian revascularizes that is what is perthes disease yes sir so how will the mri tell you viability when it's an ongoing process the fact that there is why is there increase in density so there is uh, increase in density due to the uh, uh, there is deposition of new bone which is formation and due to the lack of vascularity over there uh, there is lack of resorption so uh, so you you make up your mind you make up your mind is it deposition of bone or lack of resorption uh, sir lack of resorption okay so that is why the head resorption. appears sclerotic sclerotic yes sir and then what happens what are the stages of perthes radiology so the stages are uh, the there are four stages uh, the first stage is the stage of avascular necrosis the second stage is of uh, uh, fra- uh, fragmentation Uh, the, the the third stage is of healing uh, or new bone formation and the fourth stage is of the healed stage uh, so theory vicharle ki sagla mait asta samor dolyacha hai te nahi sangat what does that x ray show you increased density with crescent sign what does that say which stage it is in sir it is in the stage of uh, healing sir healing main patient is the guy has fragmentation happened how do you differentiate between healing bone and sclerotic dead bone there not be i don't know sir <laughs> okay static so what do you want to do now sir uh, i would mara hai to nahi milne wala hai yes sir aise bhi dekh ke tu kya karega report padega what is the basis of treatment and purpose what is the principle Sir, uh, of uh, we would look for the uh, the signs uh, the he- head at risk signs and uh, decide our treatment uh, so again siddharth let me just stop you here you are giving the exam we are not giving it so you say i would do it yes sir uh, i so would what do you mean we would decide this and we are not deciding sir. for you you decide yes, your exam i would uh, i would look for the head at risk signs uh, in this case and i would uh, go no no are you seeing head at risk signs sorry sir are you seeing head at risk signs uh there is in front of you this, sir not in this case sir so we are asking you about this case what will sir, you do i would uh, i would like to uh, treat this patient with uh, with uh, complete bed rest analgesics uh, with uh, traction uh, and abduction splintage sir okay dev sir asked you a very important question what is the principle of treatment in perthes disease so the principle of the treatment is uh, uh, basically we need, uh, uh, we need to uh, establish the range of motion uh, the the head should be contained in the acetabulum uh, till the head uh, reossifies uh, and uh, uh, functional real monitoring yes sir so while you are monitoring and waiting for the head to revascularize and reform the head if it is contained into the socket and has good range of motion will end up spherical yes sir okay so now this child is 8 8 years old and refuses to wear abduction braces 
and keeps on running around and jumping around sir uh, in then i would uh, give him uh, a broomstick cast uh, how long for uh, uh, at least 8 uh, weeks sir okay why 8 weeks why not 5 weeks sir uh, i don't know sir. you must know <laughs> hey, you can't make arbitrary statements no then what is the purpose of a broomstick spike sir uh, the purpose of the broomstick uh, broomstick spike is that the uh, the uh, child uh, the both the limbs of the child are kept in abduction uh, no, no i know what is a broomstick spike i said what is purpose to prevent the child from uh, walking or bearing weight uh, on his you... limbs correct agreed so when he has an acute exacerbation or loses range of motion or you feel that because yes, of effusion the head is subluxating yes sir you can put him into abduction internal rotation to reduce the hip and give rest for a short period of time yes sir will that take care of the healing of the parthis uh yes sir how much how yes how much time does it take for parthis to heal well sir uh not okay. aware but sir you must you must know that <laughs> yes sir see parthis takes 2 and 1/2 years to heal at least minimum okay and during this two and a half years it is very difficult to hold the hip into the contained position yes sir if you start seeing the head collapsing fragmenting and subluxating this is called stage yes, of extrusion and then you will have to do early varus derotation osteotomy to contain it surgically yes sir but there is a thought process which says that rather than wait for it to subluxate if the child is more than 8 years of age and is in the early parthis stage you yes. must do a preventive or a prophylactic preemptive vdro of pre bent 20 degrees so that you contain the hip deep into the socket and prevent it from going into deformation yes now this paper you should be able to quote because it is by an indian yes. okay you must read the paper in general pediatric orthopedics by benjamin joseph who gave the rationale of yes, early intervention depending on age in early stage of disease before stage of fragmentation yes sir so this qualifies for that so you can say that but you have to justify like that that i would like to do an early vdro because he is a hyperactive child yes, and sir. i will not be able to contain him non surgically i am sure dr dev will uh, tell you that in uk they used to have a ward full of parthis children where people children were admitted for 18 months to 2 years with abduction spica and traction yes. so it's not 8 weeks if you have to treat non surgically yes, it takes 2 years correct yes sir okay so right. your approach to parthis has to be very clear now this is in pre fragmentation stage so you can consider early vdro Yes, or you can also say sir i would at right now the patient has good range of motion i will give expectant treatment with physiotherapy anti inflammatory and i will monitor him closely yes, if sir. i find in fragmentation stage he is subluxating or extruding i will do vdro immediately correct okay so yes, that sir. should be your answer and yes, if yes, the sir. parthis is a late presenting parthis with an extruded large head then you can say that i will do vestibular procedure like a shelf because then you cannot contain a large head which is in advanced healing stage yes sir by okay. the way, by the way you mentioned about hedatris signs can you tell us what are those hedatris signs sir uh, there are uh, the uh, radiological hedatris signs are uh, lateral uh, subluxation <coughs> lateral epiphyseal calcification uh, transverse epiphysis is the horizontal epiphysis uh then the there is uh, the gage sign uh which is a v shaped translucency uh, translucency in the uh, in the lateral epiphysis and uh, the met, uh, and the metaphyseal cysts so these are the five uh, radiological sign that head at risk signs sir. good okay i think uh, we will stop this case here and nayan can you share your screen thank you siddharth thank you thank for you, presenting sir. Thank this you. case thank you Madhav, should we pass him?
<laughs> Sandeep, what do you think? <laughs> Wait, Hello. He, he was actually passing and then you made it sure that he won't. <laughs> Hello. No, no, he has read theory and come. He is not looking at what is in front of him. <laughs> Understanding the disease is important in a practical exam. Correct. Yeah, I know. Hello. Yeah, Nayan, go ahead. Siddharth, can you stop sharing? Stop sharing? Just, yeah. Siddharth, please stop sharing. Yeah, everybody should get a taste of how exam goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now I'm going to shut up. You three conduct this case. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, no, so can I start? <laughs> no, it's okay. Hello. Yes. Start. Can I start, sir? Yeah, yes. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So it's a short case, so I'll be telling a diagnosis first. Uh, the history is narrated by the mother. This is a case of a seven-year-old male. Left hand dominant uh, child with uh, left sided cubitus virus, probably due to malunited supracondylar fracture with functional disability in the form of pain while lifting heavy objects. And the uh, parents are considered uh, regarding the cosmetic deformity without any uh, DNVC. Uh, the patient was apparently all right one year back when he sustained a fracture around the elbow, which was managed uh, in his village with an above elbow cast. The cast was removed after four weeks of application and deformity is present since then. The deformity is non-progressive and right now he has come to, uh, come, he had come to us for uh, pain while lifting heavy objects, a pain in the left elbow while lifting heavy objects and concerned regarding the cosmetic appearance. There was no history of massage or uh, no history of fever, no history of other joint involvement. Said. Okay. Why you say this is supracondylar fracture? Sir, uh, on history, there are uh, the patient uh, remembers that the patient's parents remember that there was a fall on outstretched hand, which was managed conservatively. And after removing the cast, the deformity is non progressive. On history, these two uh, features uh, suggest that it, is, it was a, a supracondylar humerus fracture that time. Okay. Suggest that there was some fracture. Yeah. Around and, the area. Uh, around the I would like to examine further to confirm my diagnosis. This was a clinical picture. And uh, on inspection, there was a typical gunstock deformity which was present. The, on uh, view from the side, there was a hyperextension of the elbow. Palpation, uh, there was bicolumnar thickening of the supracondylar ridge. The three-point bony relationship was maintained, but the plane of that three-point bony relationship was altered. There was no hyperlaxity or no local rise in temperature or tenderness. Uh, while examining the, for the range of motion, there was an hyperextension of minus 30 degrees and flexion up to 110 degrees. Supination pronation was same on uh, both the sides, and there was increased internal rotation at the shoulder joint by 20 degrees. And there was a carrying angle of minus 20 degrees. Okay. Why do you see for supination formation? Does it alter in cubitus virus? Uh, in uh, just to rule out intercondyle or a lateral condyle fracture or a radial head uh, fracture, uh, that is why I wanted to see for supination pronation. In this case, it is uh, it was normal. So confirming my diagnosis of a supra malunited supracondyle or humerus fracture. No, otherwise also because of the rot internal rotation of the distal fragment in cubitus varus, in some patients you get... Sometimes supination can be increased, yes. Supination can be increased, thanks. Okay. So you may say that three-point bony relationship is maintained. So what do you mean by that? What is that uh, normal relationship look like? The three-point bony relationship is, uh, it should form an isosceles triangle when... The three points are formed by the lateral and the medial epicondyle and the tip of the olecranon. In case of uh, supracondylar fracture, since it is above that, the re relationship is maintained. But in case of lateral condyle fracture or a medial condyle fracture, or even an intercondylar fracture, the three-point bony relationship with, will be disturbed. But in this case, because there is an extension and internal rotation of the distal fragment, uh, the even though the Three-point bony relationship is maintained, but the plane is different as compared to the normal side. Does it always is it always uh, uh, isosceles triangle or it can be a scalene triangle also? Scalene triangle, sorry, scalene triangle. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
okay so it is always better to say that i have compared it on the other side and it is same as other side rather than going for some fixed triangles because the views are different in some different examiners yes so do you think that this okay so this confirms that it is supraconductor fracture yes sir okay and fine go ahead go ahead i'll ask next i would like to get an x ray of the left elbow ap and lateral view so this was the hyper increase in hyper extension with some restriction of flexion yes, and uh, as seen by the yamamoto sign the internal rotation is increased as compared to the normal right side and so pronation pronation is uh, same on both the sides flexion is quite good you said it is 110 degrees uh, yes sir 110 120 degrees on the left okay okay even on the right side also it looks in hyper extension anyway fine is there any myositis mass palpable no sir there was no history of massage and no history of any mass or tenderness present so this is still longer duration around say 5 years 10 years duration 6 years duration to be the swaras and patient has come to you and if you find that the medial side of the triangle is smaller as compared to the lateral side so does that rule out your diagnosis of a malignant supraconductor uh no sir that will not rule out because uh, in long standing cases there can be disruption of the triangle there, there can be disruption of the scalene triangle because of uh, any myositis mass formation no no it is because of long standing medial pull of the triceps ah uh, no medial pull of the triangle may be reduced in size as compared to lateral side so your diagnosis is uh, final only one diagnosis or you want to give differential diagnosis in this case uh no sir on examination also i would like to give only one uh, diagnosis of malunited supracondylar fracture or rarely it can also be uh, so lateral condyle so uh, so you want to think of some differential diagnosis what what all differential diagnosis you thought of and rule them out uh so i would think of a lateral condyle uh, fracture lateral condyle non union that can be ruled out because in that there is only um, there is not not bi column or supra condylar thick, uh, thickening uh, there is only one sided non union will lead to rs or valgus that will uh, typically lead to a cubitus valgus deformity correct so, why you are thinking in the rs why are you thinking what is the rationale in a rs case of lateral condyle fracture differential diagnosis Is there any possibility that you can get a varus? Yes, a few cases there can be a cubitus varus deformity. I'm varus. sorry, I don't. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. So at the time of fracture, because of the stimulation of the epiphysis, there is lateral overgrowth, and that can lead to varus deformity. Okay, so how will you differentiate a lateral condylar fracture leading to varus from a supracondylar fracture? In a lateral condylar fracture, there is a unicolumnar thickening of the supracondylar ridge. number 1 number 2 is that the uh, base of the triangle is increased in case of uh, lateral condyle fracture but in case of supracondylar fracture the base is maintained uh, lateral condyle fracture will always be progressive but uh, this uh, supracondylar fracture non union cubitus varus will always be non progressive and lateral condyle fracture will be a uniplanar deformity and supracondylar non union will be a triplanar multiplanar triplanar deformity So that's all. any other diagnosis you thought of and do it out um so there can be arrest of the medial 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 physial arrest lateral physial overgrowth have you thought of any trochlear avian trochlear avian yes can you can it give rise to arrest yes yes trochlear avian also avian of the trochlea okay. so you have thought of many things and come to a diagnosis of this Okay, so show, sorry. Show us the X-ray now. This is the X-ray. This is the X-ray of AP lateral view of elbow with uh, forearm, AP and lateral view. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a typical cubitus varus deformity in the uh, scene. The apex is shifted. Apex deformity is shifting away from the midline. And if we draw the axis of the forearm and the arm, 
uh, the what advice x ray what x ray you will advise i'll advise an x ray uh, of left elbow ap and lateral view elbow is sufficient or you want to have a full length arm and forearm x ray a full length arm and forearm why good to uh, see the deformity to quantify the deformity how will you quantify the so marking the axis of the arm and forearm the, and that angle is the carrying angle in this case the carrying angle is reverse it is coming to around minus 20 degrees and there is shift of the apex away from the midline carrying carrying angle you carry on you, you calculate on the x ray or you calculate on the actual clinically clinically it is calculated on x ray what you x ray what you can calculate as x ray two lines i would be i would like to calculate first is the bowman's angle that angle is drawn uh, from the long axis of the arm and to draw a perpendicular to that and it is uh, the angle is measured from the lateral facial we draw a line through the lateral facial uh, and that angle is the bowman's angle in case of cubitus varus deformity that angle will decrease and also on lateral view i would like to draw an anterior humeral line in a normal case the anterior humeral line will uh, cross the capitulum but in case of extension deformity because of the extension deformity of the distal fragment in supracondylar humerus fracture that will not cross the capitulum so what angle you will draw for quantification of varus angle on x ray uh Bowman's angle. Okay, but you are not sure about it. You are slightly confused. Anyway, uh, will you take other elbow X-rays as well? Yes, sir. other elbow X-ray to plan the Anything surgery. Uh, to uh, decide how much deformity has to be corrected, we'll get the other X-ray also. Mm -hmm. So, so for other PGs who know want to know the answer is you should calculate the humeral elbow wrist angle. So you draw the center of the wrist, the center of the humerus, and the elbow line, joint line, and you calculate the varus angle. So humor that angle you can calculate. If you don't have a full length X-ray and you have an AP X-ray in supination, then you can draw center of the humerus and you can draw. Width of the radius and ulna, center of the width of the radius and ulna, and center of the elbow, and those three points you can join to know what is the radiological varus angle. And carrying angle is calculated on clinical examination. Okay. Next. Yes. What would you like to do now? Uh, since the patient has come to me after one year, I can think of. a surgical procedure as the remodeling must be done so i would uh, go ahead and do a lateral close wedge osteotomy on the femur on the humerus uh, with a modified french bellemose modification of the french osteotomy mm -hmm. okay calculation of the wedge i mean at at present patient's age is you said 7 years 7 years yes mm -hmm. so is it the x ray of the same patient yes sir because medial epiphysis is mm. not very well seen it looks like some medial epiphysis or is like in something trochlear epiphysis is not very well seen the low supracondylar humerus fracture and doesn't look like full extension also but even on x ray hyper extension is not very well seen any so, so answer sir's question so how will you calculate the wedge uh so the wedge is calculated after taking the normal side x ray uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm not sure so. okay So suppose the normal side carrying angle is seven degrees, and on this side it is now minus ten degrees. Now proceed. How? What will you do?
we'll subtract the normal side uh, with this uh, at around uh, Um, sorry, okay. sorry, I'm not. So ten plus seven, seventeen. You want to do so seventeen degrees is the wedge you want to take. That's sure. Seven on the normal side, val uh, valgus, and ten varus. So seventeen you want to take. So now on table, how will you decide how much millimeter wedge you want to take? So so around seventeen to twenty mm of wedge will be taken. So what uh, from where you got this figure? Seventeen to twenty. So you want to do it one millimeter for one degree, or you want to do it in some other way? What you said is exactly right. One is you can do uh, combat, uh, do templating on the normal side, and on radiology, on digital X-ray, after subtracting the magnification, you can exactly get quantification of the wedge. So you want to remove this much millimeter so that you will get. This degree on this patient, so that is one. Is there any other way to calculate? No, sir. I don't know, sir. Some from log table or something. Some hint. Correct. Since his growth is still remaining, he is just seven years. If you, so because uh, the. I'll still go with it because the distal humerus only uh, gives around twenty percent of the growth, and that also at this age uh, that has completed. So I'll still go ahead with the osteotomy even at this age. What are the chances that he may recur this deformity with? Because still he is not in second growth spurt. The second growth spurt will end somewhere at the age of twelve or thirteen. Okay. So, so what is your answer? Can you tell me answer, sir? So, but now it, there is a growth remaining still. He is just seven years. So, if you correct it now. he may come with a recurrence again so what is the chance what for that you may have to calculate the remaining growth and you have to take that into consideration as well sandeep is yes sir what do you feel sandeep is there yes sir is <clears throat> this is a and deformity which is x no, i have a feeling that this x ray is showing some growth arrest on the medial side Correct. Yes. That is why uh, an MRI may be asked for if there is a definite um, trochlear avascularity or um, AVN. You will have to either do lateral epiphyseal disease with your osteotomy or probably uh, defer the surgery or warn the parents that there may be a recurrence which may need one more surgery for. May not for future. And otherwise, suppose this is a case of a regular marionette supracondylar fracture. Yeah. Has come to this age, and yeah. now you want to do surgery. Is the yeah. possibility of recurrence of the deformity at second? No, if if you are not having a medial facial arrest or a trochlear AVN, yeah, yeah. then after one year of complete remodeling, you can offer surgery. You don't have to wait till maturity. And there will not be recurrence also. No, no, that that is that happens only if there is a medial facial arrest. Yes, yes, that's what I was thinking. Otherwise, it won't recur. So you have advised Nayan. You have advised him directly surgery. So have you counselled patient for uh, if uh, it is a cosmetic deformity and you don't do? Sir, uh, the recently they said that it is not just a cosmetic deformity. The, if this is not treated, it can lead to a posterior lateral instability. Or if he falls Nayan. again. Nayan, what is the reference for oil? This is what you are saying. There was a paper by O. Driscoll. You know when it's what when when you said recently it has been found that this happens. Because you know when is this recent? I think recently you found out that there is such a paper. Yes, yes. yes. paper is published in nineteen ninety four, twenty five years ago. When we were students. That is not recent, so you don't uh, make uh, loose comments like that when you give exam. So what are the late? Problems? These are not recent advances. You have recently read it. <laughs> 
anyway so uh, for other boys who don't know what are the problems that they can get like like so there is a chance of posterior lateral instability and if he falls again there is uh, there can be a lateral condyle fracture and uh, rarely there can be a cardiac nerve fracture why they can, why they can have lateral condyle fracture more commonly uh, What is the angle when they fall? What 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 will break? Obviously, look at the gunstock deformity, na. No? So normally the radius is in line with the capital, na. Ah, so in this so case the radial will flow cross over the alna. So it will hit the lateral condyle. It will arm. break. It will break the lateral condyle, na, no? because hand yes. is in varus, not valgus. What is tardy? You can say ulnar nerve palsy. Why? Yeah. Are... Rarely there can be tardy ulnar nerve palsy. Why? Why? Why ulnar nerve? Not tardy. स्नैपिंग <laughs> Okay, yes, so I think on this case you will be quizzed on one prove your diagnosis by giving correct positive findings. Second, justification for treatment, especially surgery, which you should know. Third, when the surgery should be conducted, as Doctor uh, uh, Dev was asking. Some examiners would say that wait till maturity. You can argue either ways depending on your uh, knowledge about the uh, remodeling potential as well as. Understanding that avian on the medial side can cause recurrence, so it's not wrong that this may recur, but you should know the reason for it. Okay, and you must have a plan. There are so many osteotomies described in the textbooks. If you start reading all of them, you will get confused. So it is important that you study one, and then if you are asked the steps, how will you do a lateral closing wedge osteotomy by whatever method you have chosen. Okay, don't get confused and start talking theory. Like I'll do step cut osteotomy, I'll do dome osteotomy, because then you will fail because you know neither of them. Plan one osteotomy and then you have to tell the examiner how to execute it correctly. This is one of the commonest cases that people will get in their short cases in the exam. And again, okay. if you do well, this can fetch you a gold medal or you can fail because nobody pardons mistakes on common cases. If it's a very highly complex osteosarcoma, you will be okay to make mistakes. Here, you cannot afford to make a single mistake in your examination, diagnosis, and plan. Okay, because uh, we are running a little back of time. I think we will stop this case here, and I will hand over to the next session. I think uh, Ashok, we are done with the cases. Hello. <clears throat> Ashok. Next. Yeah, Arkesh, can you announce the next session? So yes, next session is on uh, ward rounds. No, uh, round, no, no, no. Ward rounds is not there. It has. You are looking at the old program. Now you are. We are on orthotics now. Sorry. Yeah, correct. Instruments and instruments and implants. Chetan Pradhan. Yes, I am there. Yeah, yeah. Chetan, sorry. Can you please start your talk? Yeah. Chetan Pradhan is a tra trauma surgeon and chief of trauma services in Sanchet Institute. and i welcome him uh, for this stigosha stimulus course and chetan will share with you his thoughts on the table viva which you have to undergo that is implants and instruments thank you sandeep can you see my screen yes okay so good morning friends and uh, after those plethora of cases since yesterday <clears throat> we are now beginning with table vivas so perhaps one of the most important tables in table vivas is um, that of instruments and implants and uh, just to tell you what i have seen over the years is that by the time you reach the tables most often the 
is, uh, are already done and your results are either made or i mean the result is probably decided so this table is very important because um, if you have not done so well in your cases then this is the time to make up for your impression lost and if you have done very well in your cases then uh, this is the table where you can score a distinction or a medal the purpose of this table is to start some discussion on surgery so it's just an excuse to start a discussion on surgery to assess your knowledge on the plethora of instruments and implants that we use in orthopedics and this gives the examiner a clear idea of how much time you actually spent in the operation theater so typically on the table on this table either the examiner asks you to pick up something either an instrument or an implant or he hands you an implant or an instrument now uh, if he asks you to pick up something then that's tricky because if you pick up something then you better talk everything about it so my suggestion to you all is prepare at least one instrument and one implant so thoroughly well that even the examiner doesn't know um, have the things that you are talking about so that should be your approach to it at least one or two implants and one or two instruments should be absolutely pit pat and if you are given a choice pick that up take your time choose it pick it up and start talking about it without even waiting for the examiner to ask but what is expected on this table is the full name of the implant or the instrument uh, various parts and dimensions of the that instrument indications contraindications of usage and any other specific information um even anecdotal information about that particular instrument so it's virtually impossible to cover all the instruments in uh, such a short time but what i have seen over the years is that nobody asks you uh, anything about general surgical instruments it's usually the orthopedic instruments uh, which are asked whenever any instrument is asked um, it's a good practice to talk about the business end of the instrument first which is the distal end so if you're giving an osteotome then you can say that it's beveled at both the end the business end is beveled at both the ends um if you are given a screw driver then you talk about the the type of the the screw driver and the dimension of the business end and the other end is the butt end which is um, for your grip or for hammering etc so it has a flat top for hammering etc whatever is the description of that uh, butt end users are usually divided into standard users and extended users first talk about the standard users and then any other extended uses that you know specialized use uh, if you know about that particular instrument but don't extrapolate it too much because um, then you might get into trouble now uh, the commonly asked instruments where students usually fumble in the heat of the exam is osteotomes chisels and the corticotomes the wiring instruments because there is a wide variety of tensioners used and you should be aware of most of them nowadays you get a lot of information through various textbooks on the net as well and so you must know what are the various wiring instruments including wire tensioners there is no uh, shortcut to knowing various drill bit sizes tap sizes etc when you are uh, given those and their respective sleeves external fixators and distractors now what happens is this table is unfortunately slightly biased by the examiner specialty so if he is a trauma surgeon uh, like me i would ask mainly those instruments on trauma but if he is a spine surgeon then he'll ask you more about the spine instruments but what is mandatorily required to be known is about the basic bone instrumentation so all of you should go through those and the standard uh, uses extended uses and the structure should be known in details um a few uh you know features which i have seen um, students do is what is the difference between an osteotome and a chisel all of you know that osteotomes are of various types and the end the business end is beveled at both the ends whereas in a chisel it is only uh, beveled at one end whereas this instrument is a corticotome it is specifically used to do a superior steel corticotomy as you see in elizarov procedures whereas this is a bone gouge 
and it is used um, mainly for harvesting cancellous bone grafts from the iliac crest. At times, it may be extended uh, usage, maybe to scrape the tissue inside the bone, uh, as in um, osteomyelitis, etc. Another mistake which is um, commonly made is about wire cutters and bone cutters. Now, there is a again a variety of wire cutters available: the end cutting, the side cutting, the specialized power cutting wire cutters, where you have this um, as a carbide tip. A wire cutter cutting blade attached specifically, it can be detached and changed when it becomes blunt. Whereas this is called as a big cutter or a jumbo cutter, it is actually a Harrington rod cutter. It was devised uh, as a Harrington rod cutter and now being used for cutting various uh, metallic implants as well as um, a plethora of things in the operation theater. Whereas these are not wire cutters, these are bone cutters and there is a difference. The blades are either angled or straight and there are far they are far larger blades if you see and compared to the wire cutters so you must know the difference between the two whereas this is a very specific instrument designed for spinous uh, cutting the spinous processes so this is again a spinous process cutter it is not a wire cutter or a simple bone cutter so don't make this mistake in the in the heat of the exam uh, moving on to implants, now you have intramedullary implants like the nails or rods, the surface implants which are screws, plates and wires and the processes. I have seen mainly hip and knee processes being kept in the exams, very rarely a shoulder or an elbow uh, processes would be kept unless the surgeon himself is a shoulder or an elbow surgeon. But you must know about various nails and various plates in details. A bit about the metallurgy, we have implants which are made of usually two materials, the 316L stainless steel and the titanium. The 316L SS is an alloy of all these metals. L stands for low carbon polymer, which makes it resistant to corrosion. Um, also, it uh, reduces your tissue reaction with uh, the implant. Titanium as a pure metal is hardly ever used. It is used as an alloy with, again, various metals. Modulus of elasticity is half that of stainless steel and six times that of bone. Advantages of titanium implants, less stress shielding, less fatigue failure. It is definitely corrosion, corrosion resistant and it is supposed to be infection resistant as well because it prevents the biofilm formation um, as was postulated by the AO Research Center in Davos. What about bioabsorbable implants? We have three um, varieties, the polylactic, the polyglycolic acid, and the PDS, mainly anchors, screws, and plates. And nowadays we see more and more peak implants being used, which is polyether ketone. They are radiolucent, but beware, they are not bioabsorbable. So if you don't see the implant in the x-ray, it does not mean it is bioabsorbable. It is as supposed to be as strong as stainless steel implants, uh, the peak ones. Let's move on to nails. Now, all of you know that nails are internal splints. They are load sharing uh, implants. Initially share the load and then gradually transfer it to the bone as heals. So obviously that's going to be a race between healing and failure. Various forces which the nails are subjected to are torsion, compression, and bending. Certain things which are asked invariably about nails are working lengths, total lengths. So working length is the length between two locking bolts close to the closest to the fracture site. Bending stress is inversely proportional to the square of the working length and torsional stress uh, is again inversely proportional to the working length. So technically shorter the working length, better is the fixation. The working length is not the same as total length. We must know about a few intrinsic and a few extrinsic factors about nailing. These are the intrinsic factors and these are the extrinsic factors. Very frequently these questions are asked in the exam and I'm going to briefly touch on each one of them. Now, material properties, we've already seen both of these. Anterior bow of um, femoral nails. Normal femoral curvature is about 120 plus or minus uh, 36 centimeters. However, the nails available are always larger in diameter. So why is this mismatch? It is desirable 
to improve the frictional fit of the nail inside the medullary canal so you they come with various anterior curvature and if the mismatch is smaller then inserting the nail is easier but it would be rather unstable so the larger mismatch is on purpose to allow a better fit of that nail inside the medullary canal but if you have not reamed it about 1 to 1 and 1/2 mm more than the nail diameter then you might cause an anterior cortex fracture or you might get an extension uh, angulation when you do a close reduction diameter bending rigidity is proportional to the cube of the diameter and torsion to the fourth of the fourth power of the diameter so obviously bigger the diameter better is the fit and stability minimum diameter that is required in femur is 10 mm in an adult and in tibia it is 9 mm again cross section affects the torsional strength and medullary contact most of the nails are about 15 dig percent of each other longitudinal slot in the nails which was there previously has been discarded because it reduces the torsional stability though it improves the compression strength now whether to use solid or hollow solid nails seem to be better and more resistant to infection than hollow nails but then putting in a solid nail is difficult because you can't put in a guide wire and therefore obviously a reamed uh, nail over a guide wire is much simpler and easier procedure to do than a solid nail uh, previously solid nails have been used in open fractures when you do primary nailing in um, up to grade 3a open fractures interlocking bolts bolts are subjected to four point loads and therefore larger the diameter of the bolts is better however the nail hole size the bolt hole size should not be more than 50% of the nail diameter so in humerus it is usually 4 mm in tibia it is 5 mm and in femur it is between 5 and 6 mm how many bolts should one put it depends on the fracture pattern the location and the nail fit in oblique comminuted unstable very proximal or distal fractures four bolts are mandatory obviously multiplanar locking bolts give you better stability by reducing the toggle especially in tibia or where you have a difference in the medullary canal like lower third middle third junctions or junctional fractures where the canal diameter is going to be uh, far more different in the proximal and the distal fragment then there is a role of multiplanar locking so this is a diagram showing four point loading of the locking bolts now in femur again a frequently asked question is that you have various designs of proximal locking so two parallel bolts give you the same stability as one oblique bolt from gt to at in an isthmic fracture only a dynamic lock will be sufficient and loading can be started a fracture site should be minimum working length should be 3 cm now this can be reduced in far distal fractures of the lower third tibia etc if you have multiplanar locking but if you have a uniplanar locking then the minimum locking uh, working length should be 3 cm from the fracture site so if you have a transverse fracture like this isthmic then a single uh, dynamic lock is good enough and it heals uh, predictably but if you have a segmental fracture like this then you need to have static locking to allow unconsequential healing where about comminuted fractures there's no need to anatomically reduce all this we all know this especially if you're doing a close uh, fracture and a single gt to lt uh, bolt can give you enough stability even in a comminuted fracture like this or like that so however comminuted the fracture if you in in the, in such cases you need a good hold in the proximal fragment therefore two or a one anti rotation locking bolt should be done in the proximal fragment now the common question is two screws one screw or blade which is superior single screw with a derotation mechanism is better than two a spiral blade is better in porotic bones why because if you have two screws then you get the z effect all of you know about this by now this is because of differential loading of um, both the screws so uh, one goes in the other comes out or the reverse z effect where the lower goes in and the upper comes out this is because of differential loading how to prevent this both these 
uh, screws should end at the tip of the nail. Now, better still, use a single screw or a single blade, spiral blade. Advantages of the spiral blade, it causes compaction of the bone. As you can see, this is the hole created by a screw or a bolt, and this is the one created by a spiral blade. So it does not rob the bone from the head. It compacts the bone around it, giving you better stability or better fixation in porotic bones. In tibia, oblique locking is better than to and transverse locking because it reduces the to toggle, especially in the proximal fragment, because you know that proximal metaphysis is far wider in tibia as compared to the isthmus. Again, Herzog's angle uh, is a commonly asked question. All of you know that it is from eight to 15 degrees and higher the Herzog's angle, better is the nail design because it allows you to then address uh, a far more variety of tibial fractures. So choose a nail with a higher Herzog's angle and versatile locking options. So what is a better nail? High Herzog's angle, multiplanar locking at both the ends, especially tip locking distally as shown here. Okay. For extended indications of nailing, blocking screws or polar screws as advocated by Critic can be used and therefore nailing can be done even in far proximal and far lateral, far distal fractures. Reaming, <clears throat> one millimeter reaming increases the contact area by about 40%. And therefore, like I said, higher the diameter of the nail, better is the stability. Therefore, it should be reamed to at least one to 1.5 millimeters above your designated nail side size. Biomechanically, reaming is better than unreamed nails. Why? Because it can allow osteoinduction, it improves the stability and you, allows you to put a larger diameter implant. Disadvantages theoretically are fat embolism, damage to intramedullary circulation, which is transient. It does revascularize within the next six weeks and uh, thermal necrosis of uh, the bone, if, if especially seen in humeral fractures, if you're doing humerus nailing because of a narrow uh, medullary canal and therefore most often the humerus nail is an unreamed nail. Now how do you reduce this uh, intramedullary pressures when reaming? By using a narrow or a conical reamer or the reamer, uh, so reamer design should be conical like this or using this RIA which is the reamer irrigation aspirator system. It also gives you a copious source of bone graft. So these are the advantages and advances in reaming that are commonly asked during the exam. Other things that are asked during nailing are the entry point and about weight bearing. So what is a correct entry point in the femur? It is either pyriformis fossa or the trochanter. Depending on the system of the nailing used, um, it should not be, it should be rather posterior because of the femoral bow, the, the medullary canal is going to point posteriorly when it comes to the proximal entry. However, it should not be too anterior should not be too medial and it definitely should not be very, very lateral. So uh, if you have an anterior entry point, then it will cause a neck femur fracture because of the hoop stresses. Pyriformis disadvantages are commonly asked. Prudendal nerve, again, a theoretical possibility, iatrogenic fractures, abductor weakness and persistent lurch is one of the disadvantages of pyriformis fossa entry. So this is how you can cause a neck femur fracture if you're too anterior while entering into the femur. Trochantric entry theoretically is better because of these reasons, but then more and more um, intertrochantric fractures now, or proximal femoral fractures, the advocated nail entry, entry is the medial slope of the greater trochanter. In tibia, it is 9 mm lateral to the midline and about 25 millimeters in diameter. So it is on the lateral spike of the tibia. In, uh, if you are nailing supra, uh, if you're doing proximal third fractures, then the, you can nowadays use suprapatellar entry points or intra-articular entry points, but beware that it requires a separate instrumentation and uh, a longer conical bolt if you're doing a suprapatellar entry. This is to prevent the apex anterior deformity. Loading, how much and when should you start loading? 
it depends on the fracture anatomy and how well you could stabilize it but to start immediate weight bearing at least 50 percent of bony contact should be there it should be a diaphyseal stable fracture the nail size should be more than 10 mm i'm talking about femur here and you should have two locking bolts distally advances in nailing antibody coated nails are easily available nowadays expandable nails no longer used uh, nails coated bit bmp augmentation nails or augmented nails again now easily available in the market shape memory alloy is not yet available biodegradable nails not yet available so this is um, the augmented nail that i'm talking about the tfna which is now available here you can uh, inject liquid cement through the helical blade in severely porotic uh, bones or in pathological fractures <clears throat> Okay, let's come to surface implants. The commonest surface implant uh, we use is, of course, screws and plates. So, screws, you must know practically everything about all the screws. You all know that it, the structure is divided into head, shaft, thread, and the tip, and you should know uh, various types of screw heads. That's a slotted head, the cruciate head, the hex head, which is the, the commonest use, the Phillips head, the star head, etc. Threads are usually V profile or a buttress profile. Out of the two, buttress is better. So these are the various screw heads and the corresponding screwdrivers available. There are two diameters that we talk about in screws, the core diameter, which is the root diameter, and the thread diameter, which is the actual diameter, which gives you the purchase. Again, pitch distance between two threads, which is less in cortical screws, and more in cancellous screws. The tips, various types of screw tips are there, mainly self-tapping, as you see in locking bolts, or non-self-tapping where you need to tap, pre-tap before you put in the screw, like all cortical screws. Uh, in cancellous screws, you have a cock screw or a tokar uh, kind of a tip, and a variety of self-drilling and tapping screws, which are self-tapping screws, which are more or less discontinued because of soft tissue damage seen on the other end of the screw, other end of the cortex. So this, out of this, this is more or less discarded now and uh, no longer used. Okay, this is a table which I think all of you uh, must have with you and stick it on your toilets or wherever you can see it frequently because some examiners have the habit of uh, giving screws in the hand and then asking about what should be the drill size and tap size and the screwdriver size, etc. So this is the, in any standard textbook, you'll find this and you must know it by heart. Of course, since you've been doing uh, surgery in the operation theater, it's not very difficult, but at least the basic uh, screws and drills and taps, you must know. Plates. Now, depending on the structure and the function, you could divide the plates into following categories. So by function, you have the neutralization, compression, tension band, buttress, and the bridge plate. And based on the structure of the hole, usually you have a round hole, which is hardly ever used now. The dynamic compression plate, the limited contract dynamic compression plate, the locking compression plate, various um, tubular, one-third tubular recon plates, and what is being used uh, currently are more and more are the pre-contoured anatomic locking plates, which are fragment specific or bone specific. Now, the basics about plating, obviously you must know everything about the dynamic compression plate. Usually it requires either a transverse or a short oblique fracture to compress using a DCP. The prerequisite is that you require perfect plate contouring. And the common questions asked by the examiner are, how do you achieve compression with a DCP? So just using a DCP, you can compress it using eccentrically loaded screws or a very favorite question of especially senior um, uh, teachers or senior examiners is the Mueller's compression device. And uh, most of us have not seen it and therefore they are quite fond of asking it and therefore you must make it a point to see and handle that Mueller's compression device. So either by using just the plate or the Mueller's compression device, you can achieve compression across the fracture site. So this is how it looks like. And um, 
you must know how to use it as well if asked how does it work how does it compress it's because of the oval hole and the cylindrical geometry of the cylinder in the oval hole various types of sleeves are available and you will be given a sleeve and a plate in the hand and asked to demonstrate how would you compress a transverse fracture or an oblique fracture and uh, you should be able to correctly point out which sleeve to be used when realize that for a simple simple dcp a golden colored sleeve is used with the arrow pointing towards the fracture whereas for an lc dcp a green colored sleeve is used screw direction in a dcp or an lc dcp can be changed 7 degrees side to side and about 25 degrees in the long axis of the plate pre bending is again a commonly asked question you do it when the far cortex is opening you do it in a transverse fracture you should do it in between the central two screws about 2 mm only when you are doing pre bending the basic rule is to apply screws from the center to the periphery various types of healing the primary and the secondary bone healing is asked on this table as well realize that the conventional dcp the stability depends on the friction between the plate and the bone and exact contouring of the plate to the bone is required for which obviously an anatomic reduction is required and a good bone quality is required these are the prerequisites of a dcp to work well to give you absolute stability in a fracture so you must know the concepts of absolute stability and relative stability uh, you could find them in any of the ao manuals uh, relative stability is usually achieved by a bridge plate or nailing is an example of relative stability external fixator is a example of relative stability whereas a dcp being used for a transverse fracture is absolute stability in a single bone you could have both the principles working like say proximal tibial fractures the articular component is fixed using absolute stability whereas the metaphyseal combination is used uh, fixed using relative stability adverse effects of plating infra plate osteopenia stress shielding stress concentration damage to the soft tissues this was um prevented by modifying the design of the plate holes from dcp to lc dcp the limited contact and the pc fix or um, point contact in porotic bone the dcp fails by individual screw toggling or individual screw sequential screw failure and there's no angular stability causing loss of secondary reduction and a secondary loss of reduction and failure now this was taken care of by lcp which came in early 2000 mainly invented for the use in porotic bones but like later on extrapolated for universal use so the hallmark of the lcp is the combi hole wherein you can compress the fracture using the dcp part of the hole and lock the screw using the lcp part of the threaded hole so this is an essential part three types of screws are used in an lcp the cortical and the cancellous for uh, standard compression type the self tapping locking head screws for locking and the self drilling lcp screws which are discarded no longer used anymore various advantages of um, lcp are angular stability no need of accurate plate contouring it can stay off the bone less damage to periosteum and less failures by loosening two important concepts as far as lcps are concerned are commonly asked in the exam that is the plate span width which is the ratio of total plate length on upon the fracture length and it should be about 8 to 10 in simple fractures and about 2 to 3 in comminuted fractures so if you have a comminuted segment like this then the total length of your plate should be 3 times the comminuted segment then it heals predictably this is an example of an inadequate plate span width leading to failure another concept is the plate screw density which is the ratio of number of screws on the, upon the total number of holes and it should be about 0.5 in an lcp when you are using it as a bridge plate so if you use something like this putting in screws in each and every hole that you see then there is tremendous amount of stress concentration here in the middle of the plate and failure so it should be ideally 50% in 
depending on the total number of screw holes. So these two concepts are commonly asked and one should know about it. Again, you may be asked to demonstrate how to use an LCP. In this, the angle of the locking head screw is very important. It will lock only at right angles to the plate unless it's a polyaxial locking plate. So optimal stability is at 90 degrees and not uh, in any other angle except in polyaxial locking. Another concept, do not insert a non-locking cortical screw once you have locked the screw in one fragment of the one segment of the plate. Okay, do not insert a locking screw at an angle and do not insert a compression screw after inserting a locked screw in the same fragment. Pre-contoured plate or fragment specific plates are now more and more in use. They fit to the anatomic shape and you must know the perfect placement of uh, the plate on the bone. So many times I have seen the examiners give bone and uh, the plate in the hand and ask the student to show where exactly to place that plate. For example, the commonest uh, bone model given is a humerus and the phyllos plate is given. So you must know exactly where that plate should sit because the plate will not sit anywhere else. It is supposed to sit at one particular place on the bone only because it is pre-contoured to that shape. If you do not place it uh, there, then you are going to lose your reduction. Disadvantages of lock plates, off-centered plates, penetrating screws, pole welding, persisting distraction and rigid fixation. So this can happen if you're, like I said, it's a pre-contoured, so it will sit only here. And if your reduction is not perfect, you're not going to get the screws centered onto the bone. Joint penetration, especially when you're not using polyaxial locking, this can be prevented by using polyaxial locking up to 30 degrees. Cold welding, again, a phenomenon seen with uh, titanium plates and screws, over tightening of the head into the plate because you don't get the feel of the bone when you're using an LHS. And uh, therefore the solution to that is to use a torque limiting screwdriver always when you're using titanium implants. And of course, to keep removal instruments ready. So this is a mandatory instrument. There is cold welding. Again, a commonly asked question is how do you remove a cold welded screw? Then there is a specialized drill bit to drill the screw head and a corkscrew extractor for removing that cold welded screw. So friends, at the end of it, uh, again, I, I must say that it's not possible to cover each and every implant and instrument in a short time. What I've tried to give you is what happens uh, on the table, on this table, and what is frequently asked. But again, I must say that prepare at least one instrument and a couple of implants thoroughly well. So if you're given a choice, Take your time to pick up only those and then talk everything about it. If you're given, not given that choice, and if you do not know about any implant or instrument, be honest. Be, uh, tell them that uh, because then you stand the chance of being given something that you know. Talk about the common usage first and then the extended usage. Speak confidently and clearly. This is your table to either score a medal or uh, make it or break it. I wish you all the best and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan. That was indeed an excellent <coughs> exposition on all the modern technology plates, screws, nails. Chetan, you will find that there are a lot of questions for you in the Q&A box. Mm -hmm. So if you can just uh, address them, type in your answer so that all the delegates will uh, be okay. benefited. Okay, what book to read for implants and instruments? No, 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 you just type it in so that we will continue with. Answer them online by typing in your answer. Fine. And uh, yeah, I welcome uh, Dr. Chetan Puram and Dr. Atul Patil to Good conduct afternoon. the next session on clinical cases again. The first case to be presented by Dr. Abhishek Divan and then Dr. Samad Thakkar. So Abhishek, please share your screen and start your presentation. Dr. Nagesh Naik and Dr. Sanjay Dev are also additional examiners and as is Dr. Chetan Pradhan. We have 40 minutes for both cases. Yes. Hello. Yeah, Abhishek, please go ahead. Yes, yes sir. Can I start, sir? Yes, please. Yes, yes, Don't. Yes, sir.
Uh, good afternoon, sir. I will be presenting a short case. Uh, the okay. diagnosis for my the diagnosis for my short case is it is an aseptic non-union with implants in C2 in one year old L severe operated case of uh, a tibia shaft fracture with middle one third shaft fracture. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So it is a, a, a fracture uh, with a, a right middle to one third shaft fracture with uh, a right lower limb shortening and external rotation deformity with functional deficit in the form of uh, restricted ankle dorsal flexion and inability to walk full weight bearing without any support with current disability in the form of restriction of activities of daily living. Uh, the person presented with a history of uh, uh, he was a 64 year old gentleman who, who was a farmer by occupation, who was a literate uh, uh, and a resident of Dhuwe, Maharashtra. He mm -hmm. present history of uh, pain or right lower limb while walking, uh, full weight bearing since the last one month. Uh, the patient had a history of road traffic accident one year back, which resulted in right mm -hmm. lower limb, which was treated conservatively with an above knee cast for three months. Uh, the patient was non weight bearing uh, uh, walking for the last for, for the three months. And the cast was removed at three months by another surgeon after uh, and uh, treated operatively. Uh, the patient was made to walk non weight bearing for the next three months. It was followed by gradual weight walking, uh, progressing to full weight bearing walking over the next three months. Uh, and the patient started developing gradual onset pain over the operated, operated limb while walking, uh, of weight bearing, uh, which uh, made it made difficult. And the patient, the current, uh, patient, uh, currently, the patient is walking for, uh, with a stick support. The patient is a known case of HIV infection or antiretroviral therapy. Uh, since the last eight years, the details of the uh, antiretroviral therapy are not available. Uh, were not available at the test taking. Uh, the patient does not have any history of addictions. Uh, the patient has a normal appetite, and there are no any sleep disturbances. The patient has normal bowel and bladder habits, and uh, the other any the patient does not have any relevant medical or surgical need. And as uh, uh, the social status of the, uh, the patient is that he is a low middle class person. Yes, go on, Abhishek. We'll stop yes, you if question. Okay, okay, sir. So on general examination, uh, the patient was conscious, cooperative, oriented to time, place, and person. The patient had an antalgic gait. And uh, and uh, uh, the attitude of the patient was that the patient was uh, on examination. The patient was lying down comfortably with the hip uh, in, sup in supine position, with the hip and the knee in extension, ankle in dorsal flexion, with both the patellae facing upwards, but the right angle was in slight external rotation. On uh, local examination, the patient had a hypo hypopigmented linear scar. The smooth margins, which was which had healed by primary intention, over the anterior middle aspect of the uh, lower leg, extending from the proximal third of the ear, just just to the medial malleolus. There was no any swelling or any discharging sinus over the right lower leg. Both the knees were at the same level. The right uh, right medial malleolus appeared to be at a slightly higher level as compared to the left medial malleolus. Uh, the right foot appeared to be in an extra rotation as compared to the left. There were no any dystrophic changes distal to the operative side. On palpation, I had, I had confirmed my findings of inspection. There was no any warmth or tenderness over the right lower leg along the entire length. On bony palpation, there was irregular thickening of the anterior lateral and the anterior medial borders in the middle third of the tibia without any step. The implants were palpable along implant was palpable along the anterior medial border of the uh, tibia, which more prominent over the medial malleolus. The surgical scar, uh, the skin surrounding the surgical scar was supple. There was abnormal, abnormal mobility of over the middle third of the tibia and the peripheral pulses were palpable the sensations were normal over the legs and the lymph nodes uh, no any were palpable along the uh, right lower limb on movements the patient had normal hip and knee movements on the affected side and there was reduced ankle dorsiflexion compared to the opposite side uh, the patient had a limb length discrepancy with 1.5 cm opening on the right side as compared to the left which was in the tibia uh, there was a uh, right thigh waist 3 cm and a right calf is of 2 centimeters. 
increase external rotation of the right limb uh, of the right collapse compared to the left. Okay, go ahead. Well, yes. So are you Hello. done with your examination? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm done with my examination, sir. Okay. So why do you say it is non-union? Uh, so the uh, positive findings in the history are that the patient had a history of road traffic accident a year back, which was treated conservatively initially and later surgically. And the patient was made to walk non-weight bearing for the next three months, which uh, progressive weight bearing walking. And after the patient uh, gained weight bearing walking, he started developing a gradual onset pain, uh, which was so, more prominent. So when, you, you, when, when you are asked about when you, uh, why do you say it is non-union? So don't start with the non-specific things. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, so there is what is the uh, most important uh, point suggesting of your non-union? Uh, so there is abnormal mobility at the uh, fracture site, sir. In the coronal okay, plane and the subject plane. That will come first. Yes, sir. Then other things will go down on inspection, what is happening, on palpation, what is happening, on history, what is it. But the give, which is the first important thing, that is abnormal mobility in all three planes. That is the most important thing. Which planes do you check abnormal mobility in? Uh, so we check abnormal mobility in the sagittal plane and the coronal plane, and uh, so we'll also yeah. assess. Yes, yeah, so we'll uh, assess whether there is any uh, abnormal rotation mobility. Uh, yes, so anteroposterior, plane. Medial lateral as well as rotational. Suppose yes. you have anteroposterior abnormal mobility and no medial lateral. What does that signify? There are two bones there. Yes, yes, sir. So it will suggest that either it suggest that the uh, fibula may be intact, sir, and the only the yeah. uh, TBM may fracture at the initial injury, which must not have united. So while mentioning in your examination findings, make it a habit to mention in all three planes whether it is present or no. So that will yes, give sir. you indirect clue. Okay. Is, is there any is there any tenderness at the fracture site? Uh, so there is no any tenderness at the fracture side, sir. Can you define non-union? Uh, no. So uh, uh, as per the textbook, non-union is defined as uh, failure of the fracture to uh, heal within an expected time interval, and uh, with and uh, the fracture won't heal without an active intervention. And as per the FDA definition of uh, uh, non-union, is defined as uh, uh, the failure of fracture of a failure of a fracture to heal uh, within of nine months from the time of injury. And no radiographic progression of uh, healing over a period of three months. And uh, which is and which is which is less likely unite in further course of time unless and until you intervene surgically. Yes, sir. Now, so that is most important thing. Yes, Abhishek, that is an important line. Abhishek. Yes. When, when you are asked a definition, you must give all the criteria that you know. So it is defined as that situation in the fracture site where the progress of union or healing has come to a complete standstill as evidenced by painless abnormal mobility in all the three planes, failure of callus formation or absence of progressive callus formation in two views taken six weeks apart over a period of three months and is likely to remain so unless intervened surgically. This is the full definition of a non -union. So clinical, radiological, and interventional. Very important. Okay. So is what you will like wound? to... Is there any wound over the non-union? Uh, no, the so there is... Uh, the, so there is no any wound over the uh, uh, non-union side, sir. No sign. Implant palpable. Yes, sir. So... And there is abnormal mobility. So what do you think is the status of the implant clinically? Uh, uh, so clinically, there can be two possibilities. Either the implant may have loosened out or the implant may have broken, which may be, which may be, uh, which may be causing the abnormal mobility at the fracture site. So, okay. in your view, which of the two is possible in this case? Uh, so since it is a surface implant, the, uh, along the entire length of the bone, the chances of the implant being broken are, high, are more likely as compared to an implant loosening. 
what would you how would you like to proceed uh, so i would like to do non union which type of non union uh, so it is an aseptic non union sir okay so what would you like to do for this patient uh, so i would like i would like to do x ray of the uh, fibula and uh, fibula in the whole length including the knee joint and the ankle joint and uh, okay. blood investigations so, in the yes sir so this is the latest x ray of the patient sir so it is a, a full length uh, it is a plain uh, uh, x ray of the tibia and fibula in the anterior posterior and lateral view showing the uh, knee joint along with the entire length of the tibia uh, compression plate is visible on the uh, medial surface of the tibia with two interfragmentary screws in the fracture side okay and so there appears to be a, a break in the implant on Uh, in the middle uh, in the middle part of the implant at the just uh, just proximal to the uh, uh, proximal interfragmentary screw okay perfect with abundant callus so, sir now what you, so does it confirm your diagnosis uh, so yes sir, it confirms my diagnosis and i would like to add broken implants uh, to my diagnosis sir okay good so now what we like to do Uh, so I would uh, since the so I would also like to do a uh, blood investigations for the form of hemogram, the ESR values and the CRP values. And since the patient is also a, a case of HIV infection, I would like to do the CD4 uh, count of the patient and the serum proteins to assess the immune status of the patient. Sir. Okay. Good. So what does CD4, CD8 count in uh, gives you a value? So when you uh, do sir, surgery, when when you will uh, not sir, do surgery. Uh, so the CD4 count uh, will help us. To, uh, the the CD4 count will uh, let us know the immune status of the patient, whether the patient can achieve a good wound healing or not. And when the patient is on anti-retroviral therapy, a CD4 count of less than 200 cells per milliliter will indicate that the patient has uh, a low immune status and which will impair wound healing and also render the patient at a high risk of infection. The ideal CD4 count should be more than uh, 500 cells per milliliter of blood. so when do you what do you think why this patient went into non union uh, so initially the uh, initially the fracture was treated with a mini cast and uh, which may not have been aligned well and later the uh, later it was fixed with a locking compression plate and with two interfragmentary screws and also uh, the operating surgeon has put screws pro- uh, very close to the fracture site uh, within a adequate length for adequate working length for the plate So whether it is a biological failure, mechanical failure, or both. So it is a mechanical failure because adequate callus formation can be seen on the anterior posterior view uh, and in the lateral cortex and uh, in the uh, posterior cortex on the lateral view uh, in the in the tibia. And uh, it is a mechanical failure because uh, less working length has been provided to the plate, sir. So it's a very long plate. It's spanning the entire tibia. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, the working length between the Uh, two or more screws is very less uh, uh, from the fracture side, and once uh, the dis- the the screw in the uh, distal part of the plate appears to be uh, through the fracture side. Sir. How much was the shortening there? Uh, so one point five centimeter of shortening was uh, uh, visible, sir. So the shortening, yeah, uh, the fibula not not overlapped. So and it has gone in non-union. Why it is so? Uh, so there appears to be some uh, external rotation deformity also, and the X-ray suggests of slight valgus defo- uh, valgus deformity as well, sir. Or was fibula tummy done at the time of surgery? No. Uh, so, so here, so here your plate is very long, but yes, uh, bone failed to unite. It's a tibia subcutaneous bone, so uh, maybe a uh, vascular issue plus patient has a immunocompromise. So. primarily biological secondary mechanical leading to failure of the implant the plate is of long di- distance and you want second surgery a stiff implant so it has provided stiffness but it has not united because of biology as well as immunology because of that reason plate failed dr puram you want to add anything yes i just want to know if there is an additional scar over the fibula Uh, so no so there was no any scar of the fibula side that then probably a, a cuff resection was done since it was delayed fixation plus he has shortening as well as there is 
a gap visible at the fibula probably we yeah. don't know yeah. Yeah. okay so now given this situation and his lab boy is okay to go for surgery now what will what will be your implant or what will be your further plan uh, so my plan will first be implant removal uh, if the patient is fit for surgery if the cd4 come normal then my plan will be uh, so first will be implant removal uh, refresh the bone edges assess if there is any uh, underlying uh, infection of fracture site my friends of course or not if there is no infection then proceed with refreshing of bone edges uh, ream the distal and manual and the proximal and manually and fix it with uh, fix the fra uh, fracture with uh, with an interlocking nail for the tibia with uh, helicarus bone grafting okay so what will be the problem with uh, bone graft uh, internal fixation when you will resect the sclerotic end yes sir. it will be a huge amount of shortening initially yes, already it is short and once you remove the sclerotic part it will be around further 4 to 4 cm so initial 2 cm and this 4 cm will be huge shortening yes sir then is it okay can you do that much shortening acutely uh so uh, uh, no sir the, this much amount of shortening cannot be done acutely sir what is paprika sign Uh, so paprika sign is seen in cases of chronic osteomyelitis, where after refreshing of bone edges, we see a punctured bleeding from the bone, indicating that the uh, indicating the part of the bone which is viable. So you have to see this sign till you cut the bone, and till you see that sign, then you go on resecting the tibia, and then there will be assessment of the shortening. So any other modality will be available. So the other modality available for this is implant removal followed by. Uh, external fixation with an elizaro ring assembly in hiv patient do you want to do elizaro you will uh, be the surgeon uh, so uh, not in this patient so because the chances of pentrac infections will be higher as compared Are to other patients infection ke pehle tumko injury hoga na progenic injury yes sir you will get punctured with the wires so assistant and surgeon will be exposed to the injury so what next And still, you want to do external fixator? Any, any other model? Any other external fixator, which is uh, so, safer to apply? A uh, safer than Elizor will be a uniplanar uh, limb reconstruction system, sir. Okay, good. Okay. So if good. you if you find that there will be too much of shortening on table, which will be failed to provide you by doing an interlocking nail, so you will keep ready of monorail external fixator, and in this case, you will not use Elizor because of his. HIV status. Yes. Anything you would like to add if you, when you are using the external fixator to aid healing and to oh. address the other problem he has. Uh, so if on table, I on table assess that the patient has been shortening, and uh, my you plan is to use preoperatively use. Yes, sir. Here one point five. Yes, sir. I would like to add a proximal corticotomy for the patient to uh, restore the lens. <clears throat> good it will serve dual purpose it will restore the length as well as enhance the biology okay you should be vigilant in correcting the rotational deformity that is overlooked many a time how do you clinically assess the rotational deformity uh, so on table we operating this patient in supine position so to assess the rotational deformity i will use the cable wire technique Where uh, uh, for the preoperatively, clinically, uh, uh, so preoperatively, uh, clinically to assess whether there is an external tear or torsion or not, we can use a thigh foot angle to see uh, whether there is an uh, the calculated degree of external rotation deformity as compared to both sides. <coughs> okay, and then we, which can be corrected intraoperatively, and intraoperatively can use a cable technique to see whether the uh, the middle uh, part of the patella is with the uh, first web space or not. Yes. So we go ahead with the second case now. Yes. Who is uh, so or... there are some questions. Puram sir and Atul sir, there are some questions in the Q and A box. Yes. yes. Just go through them and answer them. Yeah. We'll second case by after some... the second Earth. after the sec second case. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Who is presenting second case? Dr. Samad. Samad. 
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन आई बी प्रेजेंट इन दिन केस इज माई स्क्रीन विजिबल फुल स्क्रीन ओके प्रेजेंटिंग द गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन प्रेजेंटिंग केस ऑफ इयर ओल्ड फीमेल राइट हैंड डॉमिनेंट हाउस वाइफ इज इट शॉर्ट केस और लॉन्ग केस लॉन्ग शॉर्ट केस सर ओके सो वॉट इज योर डायग्नोसिस वॉट इज योर डायग्नोसिस my diagnosis is a 6 month old right sided distal end of radius malunion complicated with epl tendon rupture and crps okay okay what's the okay. history why do you say uh, it's a uh, coming to history sir uh, uh, 50 year old female right hand dominant housewife came with chief complaint of a visible deformity in the right wrist since 4 months stiffness of the right wrist and fingers since 4 months pain and burning sensation over the right wrist and hand since 4 months and weakness of the thumb since 2 months uh, 6 months back she had a fall on outstretched hand a low energy trauma for which she had a closed injury to the wrist she underwent a plaster cast application for a duration of 2 months prior to which she does not recollect any reduction or any other surgical procedure after removal of the cast she noticed the deformity following which as she resumed the activities she noted stiffness and pain over the right wrist and the hand pain was continuous was burning in nature uh, was also associated with night pains and it has been static with no reduction in it since last two months she has been noting a thumb weakness and difficulty in grasping and doing a uh, fine activity of the hand there is no use to any medications for these complaints there is no use to any physiotherapy following removal of the cast she is a housewife and her daily activities of uh, household work are affected she has no other comorbidities or medical or surgical illnesses coming to examination on inspection we can see there is a manus valgus attitude or alignment of the hand and the wrist it is associated with a dinner fork deformity with broadening and widening of the right wrist as compared to the left side there is swelling noted diffusely over the right wrist and hand and there is no skin discoloration but the skin appears to be dry there is a subtle wasting noted in the forearm there is no wasting in the thinar hypothenar or the intermetacarpal regions the snuff box boundaries of the right side appear to be less well appreciated as compared to opposite side coming to palpation the skin of the palm appears to be cooler as compared to opposite side and appears to be dry also the tenderness is palpated diffusely all over the wrist and the hand typically over the wrist joints there is a palpable thickening and irregularity of the distal aspect of the radius felt uh, classically over the dorsal aspect and there is tenderness noted around the lister's tubercle there is and there is the level of styloid processes when marked shows that both are at the same level but on the opposite side the radial styloid appears to be 1 cm distal to the ulnar styloid the swelling examination on uh, pitting it uh, it appears to be pitting uh, the swelling <clears throat> coming to movement examinations uh, the palmar flexion uh, is drastically reduced compared to opposite side being only 0 to 30 the dorsi flexion is subtly reduced being 0 to 60 the ulnar deviation is grossly reduced being 0 to 20 while the radial deviation appears to be increased being 0 to 30 the pronation is uh, drastically reduced being 0 to 20 and supination is reduced being 0 to 40 the elbow movements are normal the mcp and the ip joints of all the five digits appear to be reduced all these movements are only terminally painful and during the range of movement there is no crepitus that is felt coming to the measurements there is a 1 cm circumferential difference at the forearm level the radial column of the right side is 1 cm shorter but the ulnar column bilaterally as identical coming to neurovascular examination sensations there is hyperesthesia hyperalgesia and allodynia noted over the wrist hand and the fingers of the right side from 5 cm proximal to the wrist going till the tip of the fingers the motor examination of the intrinsic muscles of the hand shows normal power and none of the intrinsics are wasted or weak but the motor examination of forearm muscles the epl tendon appears to have 0 by 5 power In vascular examination the radial pulse and ulnar pulse are well felt and allen's test is negative 
coming to special tests uh, the test for the distal radial nerve joint lano key sign for distal drug instability is negative but the foveal sign is positive and the press test is positive carpal tunnel syndrome tests are negative <clears throat> thank you have you checked for radio ulnar varials radio ulnar varial clinically sir uh, by the level of the radial and ulnar styloid processes yes going to opposite side in this case on the right side index side it was both the styloid were at the same level but uh, on the opposite side left side uh, the radial styloid was approximately 1 cm distal to the ulnar styloid so what does that indicate so that indicates a loss of radial length or radial height following a malunion or a fracture displacement okay so <clears throat> no operative treatment was done no, only sir. a cast was applied yes sir why do you think the there is an epl tendon rupture so there is a delayed rupture of the epl tendon in the course of the history sir uh, i would suspect it secondary to the uniting fracture malunion because there is a tendon attrition that could have happened on the dorsal surface of the distal end of radius because of the irregularity of the healing bone at the callus how common is that very uncommon sir what is more common i mean epl rupture happens due to what more commonly more industrial common. radial fracture acute uh, epl rupture the more common sir because of the due shatter. to what due to what so uh, in operated cases uh, when the roller yes. is used with longer screws they can have yes, good. screw tip irritation with uh, any of the uh, extensor tendon injury good, good. Exactly. and and the tip of the nail yes sir okay so are you sure in this are you sure in this case that the fracture is united uh, sir i like to take an x ray to check that first sir so in the exam examination wise there is no abnormal mobility or uh, deep bony tenderness but because there is diffuse tenderness everywhere i am not very able to differentiate between a bony and soft tissue tenderness what are the movements uh, are the fingers supple uh, sir the there is no ffd sir there is no flexion deformity but the flexion range is limited in the ip joints the uh, flexion is restricted to 60 degrees only and shoulder <clears throat> shoulder and elbow is fine sir full range okay okay what do you want to do now sir i would like to first proceed with getting an x ray of the in the pa view yeah. and the lateral view okay show me so on the left side is the x ray in pa and lateral views okay sir it uh, uh, it describes uh, it, it shows a distal radius malunion uh, with the loss of radial height a dorsal tilt uh, and uh, uh, la lateral tilt also sir with that okay. uh, uh, the fracture line appears to be going just into uh, drg space sir what okay. kind of fracture was this to begin with Th this appears to be an extra articular mm -hmm. fracture simple transverse uh, oh. which was extending into the druj joint though but extra articular for radio carpal joint okay anything on there also appears to be patchy osteopenia in the subarticular and the periarticular regions anywhere else you see osteopenia on the x ray So osteopenia could be due to multiple reasons. One would be wasting because of displacement. And other bones of the hand. Yes, sir. The carpus also appears to be osteopenic. The metacarpal is more than the carpus. What do you feel is the cause of that? Uh, uh, going by the clinical examination of CRPS, that could be one of the reasons. But also disuse and uh, prolonged casting disuse. could also be a cause. Disuse. Okay. What will so, what will do now? Um, so considering the patient has three main problems, one is a malunion, 
one is a crps and thirdly it's an epl tendon injury uh, i like to address three of them but the first i will address is crps uh, because the other two require surgery and the crps will require medical and phys- uh, physical therapies so i'll start with uh, medical therapy in the form of um, calcium vitamin d calcitonin uh, vitamin c high dose tablets bd and uh, no, neuro, uh, neurogenic medic, neurotropic medication to reliever of the pain simultaneously a physiotherapeutic consult to start with uh, uh, aggressive mobilization of the wrist and the hand uh, why, why why do you say it is a calcitonin is needed sir to prevent further osteopenia calcitonin is known that it is it is used in crps there is some evidence is the, sir, where is the reference sir i don't recollect the reference sir so do you get do you have this in your textbook of cr uh, campbell or rockwood green i don't recollect sorry sir okay so only high dose of vitamin c uh, and physiotherapy will take care of your uh, crps okay sir and so once what, it is, is, what, is, what is the working of this patient she is a housewife only sir she doesn't have an age care. age age is 50 sir 52 yes sir so if by doing uh, physiotherapy now the patient is fairly is uh, okay and now patient is able to use the hand and no pain and because of crps the diffuse tenderness goes away then what is your plan sir uh, yeah. if the hand function comes back to reasonable uh, amount with pain also reduction my only problem will be epl tendon and not the malunion sir because malunion only if she has adequate if she has sufficient uh, limitation in activities of daily living will i like to address so then okay. my now now the situation is crps is healed patient has uh, decreased pronation supination and wrist dorsiflexion extension and epl rupture so what you will do i like to address both of them surgically sir uh, how will you address so for the epl tendon sir uh, it will first require an ex- uh, first i like to get a ultrasonography pre operatively to identify the tendon continuity if it is not there then the location of the stump of the tendon okay the and then uh, clinically i'd like to check for availability of palmaris longus and then when i'm planning to reconstruct the tendon or a tendon transfer i so will not not operated uh, ks it will be a clean cut injury which is retracted you just mobilize it you will get the length so in a chronic case sir generally mobilization is difficult and the segment fibrous and scarred we cannot utilize the tendon length so a graft not always be- not always you will find if it is possible otherwise yeah. you can tend to type of rupture is the cpl rupture is it a traumatic rupture see it's a chronic it's a late rupture sir. it's not a acute or early rupture so it's called attrition attritional tear attritional rupture okay so how will you fix your bone so bony the, realignment bone procedure bony alignments so first i like to compare with the opposite side left side pa and lateral view of the wrist sir as shown here that is there yeah i'll i'll get the radial height the radial tilt and the palmar tilts uh, get my desired correction uh, where will be your incision how will you go so i like to uh, take a volar incision through fc volar if you are exposing yeah. dorsal in for epl and it is if you are expo- if you are exposing for dorsal epl rupture why not to do dorsal plating so dorsal plating also has a tendency of causing lot of tendon irritation and tendon problems so i would like no, to with the latest with the new no, new profile plates new plate because anyways you are opening it for a epl rupture so i will accept this if you are doing it only for a deformity correction not epl you, you are opening for for epl dorsally so then why do you want to open the volarly okay sir okay sir then i'll consider dorsal plating with the new limp, uh, with the new low profile plate sir that can be considered yes. or also a dorsal even external fixator can be utilized with the correction and bone graft so again there will be crps when you are immobilize the joint yes, then uh, okay sir i'll stick to dorsal plating only with yes the, mm, samarth what is the main reason for crps 
sir uh, the long duration of casting i believe is the source of crps here no any But, time any time the reason for crps is persistent pain in a predisposed patient yes so don't you think stabilizing the fracture will get rid of the pain to allow you for proper rehab correct sir yes and then if you use exon six at a second time again it will indirectly fix the radius not directly so again you will have a problem of crps so exon six at a has maximum problem is of crps okay sir i'll stick to and it. being epl being repaired or uh, re uh, reconstructed you will use the same approach and you will correct the deformity by using a plate correct sir yes sir okay so dr chetan anything more anything for the distal radio ulna joint because she has pronosupination restriction yes sir uh, so will you resect it sir i like to first address the minor loss of height only with the radial sided uh, correction if the radial uh, osteotomy in the correction regains back the correct radial height sir and the druj is congruous and stable intraoperatively checked with ballotment then i will not like to touch the ulna sir but if it Very is good. so i will like to do ulnar shortening and then i like to see further okay which out of which ulnar shortening or or direct which will you prefer sorry sir i didn't hear you can you please repeat ulnar shortening or lower in ulna excision direct which will you prefer if sir, it is doesn't come always ulnar shortening first sir as long as there is no obvious druj arthritis okay good dr puram's question sir radial would you like to uh, do the osteotomy i mean the opening of the osteotomy so, sorry sir can you please repeat which side of the radius would you like to do the opening of your osteotomy so opening will be dorsal and on the radial aspect because i want a radial yeah. tilt to increase and the palmar tilt to increase very good okay. i think you have done well it's yeah. good presentation and good uh, confident okay. answers So I think Dr. Patil, if you can just summarize a malunited lower end radius for PGs, what they should say, and then we can move on to the next session by Dr. Naik. So, so malunited lower end radius. Most important thing is first you have to ask for a duration, the dominant hand, complaints of the patient. If patients have complaints and associated complications like ruptures or a CRPS. so you have to take care of all these things and hand should be supple before you do uh, any corrective osteotomy option remains uh, only physiotherapy and get the uh, painless movement acceptable but if not getting painless movement and deformity then you have to correct it usually when you don't have any problem on the dorsal side you can do volar correction because that is a safe side and the flatter side but if you want to do anything like uh, epl reconstruction and you are opening dorsally you do dorsal plating and again distal radial ulnar joint you correct the height you get the druj in line don't resect ulna if you don't then if you don't get then shorten the ulna and maintain the druj and if you have a druj arthritis you, you can do direct okay thank you okay. so thank you dr patil and dr puram for uh, excellent conduct of two short cases mm -hmm. there are a couple of questions on non union in the question and answer box if you could just address them and i think uh, the next three talks are going to be very very important and interesting because this is something nobody teaches uh, post graduates and neither do they have any access to proper literature or textbooks as to where to read from so i invite dr nagesh naik who is the head of department of orthopedics at bharti vidyapeet medical college at sangli to start with his talk on orthotics that will be followed by dr gr joshi who is going to talk to you about how to approach specimen stable and finally dr madhav khadilkar will teach you how to read x rays and x ray on the x ray table over to you dr naik thank you very much for being here can you hear me Hello. yes sir ah. yes sir i thanks and then for giving me this sir sir there is an echo ek one is it clear now 
Yes. Uh, so I I thank Sandeep for giving me opportunity to talk here. This Corona has brought many changes in our life as it has changed this webinar, uh, changed this session from physical session to webinar. The DNB has changed its exam pattern from physical to OSCE, OSPE. So I thought I should also change my uh, presentation to question answers or OSCE type so that it will be useful for boys in that way also. So I have changed uh, my presentation from lecture type to OSPE type question and answer session. Only thing is that if it would have been physical, I would have interacted with you boys by asking questions and then telling you the correct answers. Here, I'm asking question to myself and I'm myself answering them. So first exercise, so what is this? Identify this. What is the type of orthosis? And describe it different parts. So as you can see, this is a orthosis which is holding the wrist in functional position in dorsiflexion and holding the hand in functional position. So this is a called a long opponent's orthosis. First question is what is it? It is a long opponent's orthosis. What type of, second question was what is the type of orthosis? So this is a positional orthosis or static orthosis. In due course, I will tell what is a positional and what is static. So what are different parts and its function? So this part will, uh, can you see this arrow? Can you see this arrow? So this part will... Yes, yes, sir. So this part is useful in maintaining the wrist in dorsiflexion. There are two bars, palmer and the dorsal bars, which maintain the metacarpal arch, hold the hand in structure, hand structure nicely. And there are two bars. One is the opponent's bar and one is the abduction bar, which holds the thumb in opponents and abduction. So describe these are the parts and the function is, so it will hold the hand in the, when the orthosis is worn, you can oppose the index and middle finger to the thumb. So this is a forearm bar will prevent dorsiflexion, palmar flexion and controlling radial alveolar deviation. So this is a long opponent's orthosis. So I have chosen the commoner things which are asked in exams. So first was long opponent. So I, I told you it is a static type. So what is static type? It immobilizes joint or body body part. It position and maintain correct joint alignment. It protects recently injured tissues. It prevents tendon shortening and contracture. And it stabilizes one or more joints to improve function of other joints. And dynamic is it substitutes irreversible loss of function or maintain useful position for maximizing the function. It activates paralyzed or weakened. You must have seen radial nerve split where there are rubber bands which extend the uh, fingers passively and patient does flexion of the fingers actively. So those are the dynamic type of orthosis. So we'll go to the next ortho, uh, splint. So identify this and enumerate three principle for its use. So everybody must have uh, noticed this. What is it? These are some of the types of cock up splints. Hmm? So this is a wrist control orthosis in orthotic terminology, or you can call it a cock up splint. It is a positional type of orthosis because it maintains the position of the wrist. So what are the principle of use? So it tightens the finger flexors by tenodesis effect, thus increasing the strength of the grasp. Because it is you are in dorsiflexion, the flexors are stretched, your grasp strength increases to prevent palmar flexion and to prevent stretching of the weak wrist extensors. In case, suppose there is a wrist drops and then the wrist extensors will be stretched. If you don't keep them in dorsiflexion there, it is useful to prevent stretching of weak wrist extensors. Third question, so identify this. Now what is this? If you see there is a arm part, there is a forearm part and there is a turn buckle in between. So now you must have realized that by turning this turn buckle, you can gradually extend this elbow, which is in fixed position. So yeah, this is orthosis to extend the flexed elbow. So what is the, uh, this, uh, what type of orthosis is this and indications for use? So, <coughs> So this is called as an elbow extensor orthosis. So type of orthosis is, this is a static progressive splint or corrective orthosis. So I will tell you what is static progressive splint. And the turnbuckle component is to incremental increase of the elbow extension so that it is used in correction of fixed flexion deformity of the elbow. So I will tell you what is static progressive splint. The low load 
prolonged tensile stress so gradual stretching of the tissue produces stress relaxation and stimulates the connective tissue cells to increase the tissue turnover and remodeling and when this occurs the remodeled tissues are in elongated position thus the remodeled tissues are longer than before treatment and allow greater range of motion so gradual stretching at sequential increments so maintaining the joint at its end range position can be achieved by series there are two types again serial static and static progressive serial static all of you are knowing so all of you have seen previously the flexion deformities in polio of the knee joint we used to correct by sequential cast so we used to cut the wedge and gradually got extension of the knee joint so that is serial static and serial progressive is one which i showed you by turn buckle you gradually stretch the tissues so some other examples this is a finger flexion deformity which is corrected by serial casting so this is serial static so each splint is statically increasing the movement and one more example of dynamic this uh, is here is a turn buckle which gradually can cause which gradually can cause abduction of the shoulder so this is called as gunslinger splint or holzer splint so this is a, a splint or a device which can give you gradual abduction of the shoulder so these are serial static splints so by now what we have seen one we have seen positional splint second we have seen serial static splints so now we will see one more splint so this is if you see this splint being over you can see the fingers are in flex position and this there is a rubber band which is trying to flex it further and here the spring is trying to extend the metacarpophalangeal joint are you fine i'm getting so there is a spring which is trying to extend and this mechanism is trying to flex so now from the name itself is so you are bending the knuckles in this splint so this is called as knuckle bender and you are extending the np joint so this is called as reverse knuckle bend so i'll show you so first one is metacarpophalangeal flexor orthosis other name is metacarpophalangeal flexor orthosis or also called as knuckle bender while the second one was metacarpophalangeal extension orthosis or a reverse knuckle bender what is the type of orthosis this is a corrective orthosis why corrective orthosis because if the np joints are flexed in fixed in extension then usually when the plaster is not allowing it to do good physiotherapy and do not, doesn't allow it to flex it completely in cast they get fixed in flexion extension there you want to achieve flexion of the np joint so this is a <coughs> which you are using so that is correcting the np joint extension to flexion so that is a corrective orthosis and first i told you the number of rubber bands as you go on increasing there will be increasing bending force which will be utilized for gradual flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint this splint should be worn for at least 30 minutes three times a day and in second orthosis tension force in the spring causes gradual extension of metacarpophalangeal joint next question identify this what is the type of orthosis and indication for use from this shape itself you can see it is touching it will when you wear it it will touch whole of the hand wrist and forearm here also this is covering all of the dorsum and making keeping the fingers flex so this is giving some good support to the whole of the hand so this is called as wrist hand stabilizer first one is volar and second one is dorsal what is the type this is a protective orthosis so first one was positional second we saw corrective now we saw a protective so we are seeing all types one by one so this is a protective orthosis in it protects the injured hand so this is a protective type of orthosis next exercise i will show you so what is this so from picture you can see this is a ankle foot orthosis because this has got this is fixing the we have, this is used for around the below knee problems second is enumerate parts of this orthosis and indications for its use if you see carefully the angle between the uprights and the shoe is less than 90 that means it is remaining in less than 90 degrees why because there is a spring which is keeping it in dorsiflexion that means this is orthosis where there is there is dorsiflexion assist so this orthodic terminology you call this as afo with 
dorsi assist because this is used in cases of foot drop where there is loss of dorsiflexion power but the plantar flexion is good so when patient wears this orthosis he will do dorsiflexion actively and dorsiflexion passively by the spring and plantar flexion actively by the muscles so the what are the parts so each afo has got two uprights one metal band and a velcro closure ankle joints the ankle joints in the first case was having dorsi assist mechanism this part of the orthosis which goes into the shoe this part of the orthosis which goes into the shoe is called stirrup there are two types of stirrup one is a split stirrup and another is a solid stirrup so this is going into the shoe one piece going into the heel of the shoe so this is solid stirrup if it is a split stirrup there is a box into the uh, into the heel from which you can disconnect on either side and you can change the shoe so that is a split stirrup so this is a solid stirrup to repeat the two uprights ankle joints one metal band with velcro closure two stirrups and a shoe so these are a standard parts of any ankle foot orthosis then next is identify this is on one more which is commonly kept in exams so this is enumerated function of the orthosis and modifications that can be done for different purposes so this is a ankle foot orthosis again because it has got a calf part which is a shoe with a velcro enclosure ankle joint problem area and the plastic so this is made up of whole of plastic and this is called as posti afo which is called as psi posterior shoe insert why it is called psi because on this orthosis you can use a regular shoes no specific shoes are required only thing you have to use one size larger shoe on this side so if your shoe size is 6 one side you use 6 and this side you use 7 so this is called as posterior shoe insert so what modifications you can do if you see the ankle joint is here the trim lines these are the two trim lines of the orthosis so these are going posterior to the malleoli so the, uh, uh, because these are posterior to the malleoli that makes it little flexible and allows some amount of plantar flexion and dorsal flexion as against if you bring the trim lines more anteriorly like this anterior to the ankle joint it makes it stiffer and the ankle joint will not move or if you will increase the flange on one side so if you increase it on the medial side it will control valgus if you increase the flange on the lateral side it will control varus in this it is which are readily available or which are to be used with a regular shoe so this is a hemi spiral orthosis picture i am showing so all these are afos PSI posterior shoe insert type. Where you will use this? It is uh, what what is the function of a AFO? Normal AFO. It is providing mediolateral stability during stance phase to prevent twisting of the ankle. So two uprights and ankle joints are there from both sides so that it will prevent mediolateral stability. The toe pick up during swing phase to prevent dragging of the toes and stumbling and falling because you know, as I showed you there is a spring assist into the ankle joint so which will pull the ankle into dorsiflexion because of the spring ridge so that there will not be stumbling or in that case you can use a posterior stop so that it will not go in plantar flexion and in cases of foot drop or you can use a plantar flexion uh, stop so that you do not get a plantar flexion uh, movement at the knee joint so these are the ways by which it works and last is push up stimulation during lateral part of stance phase so if you combine a dorsiflexion stop to a sole plate you may not be knowing this technology dorsiflexion stop means you block dorsiflexion at 10 degrees suppose and a sole plate if you do then your knee uh, flexor movement will reduce or you can put a plantar flexion stop at 5 degrees so that your ankle joint will remain in plantar flexion this i will tell you in next orthosis how this works okay so this is the kafo ankle foot orthosis so this is controlling the knee joints also so what are the parts of this orthosis so the parts are again there are two stirrups on both sides there is ankle joint this is split stirrup i was talking of split stirrup so that these are two stirrups which will fit into the box of the shoe so that you can remove this and change the shoe so this is split stirrup 
then there are two carp one carp in band with the enclosure two thigh bands with the enclosure and a knee joint so what is the commonest knee joint that is used in uh, uh, practice is called as drop lock why it is called drop lock this part when patient wants to sit patient pull sit up so that when patient sits patient can sit with knee flexion and when patient stands automatically by gravity this pulled rectangular part will fall down and the knee locks so that the patient uh, doesn't have to lock the knee manually so that is why it drops automatically that's why it is called as drop lock next orthosis i told you i will to show you this is a see this orthosis carefully anteriorly this is going above the knee joint so this is part which is covering patella so this is theoretically a kafo because this is extending above so this is a kf but posteriorly it is open so that this will allow full flexion of the knee and the ankle joint is kept in 5 degrees or 10 degrees of plantar flexion so now you can must have realize what is this this is a floor reaction orthosis why this is called a floor reaction orthosis because the ankle is flexed in 5 degrees of plantar flexion when you want to touch the uh, the ground stance at the beginning of the stance phase instead of heel touching to the ground your forefoot will touch to the ground so that touched forefoot will give a posterior movement to the knee joint so in which conditions you need this if there is a quadriceps weakness then you cannot hold the knee in extension and in the knee will buckle and patient will fall down. so they will have what type of gait they will have post polio quadriceps zero center then you will have hand to knee gait so to prevent hand to knee gait if you patient wears this orthosis when patient touches ground this first forefoot will give a extra hyper extension movement at the knee joint and knee will not buckle and then heel will touch and patient will walk so that is the principle of floor reaction orthosis this is used in this is used in post polio residual paralysis with quadriceps weakness same thing i have the first part to touch the ground will be forefoot that will give you a hyper extension movement at the knee joint so that the knee will not buckle that's why it is used in quadriceps weakness floor reaction orthosis quite very commonly asked in exams then next is from this orthosis you must have realized this is a hkf why because the hip joints are also controlled in this orthosis so this is a hkaf hip knee ankle foot orthosis different name different parts of the orthosis and indications for its use you don't have to mug up you have to see what joint is moving how much it is moving then you, which patient you will prescribe so this is a pelvic girdle with an abdominal corset so this will hold control the pelvis then there is a hip joint which is single axis type means it is allowing only flexion extension this is doesn't this is a single axis hip joint it doesn't allow adduction abduction then these are upper and lower thigh band enclosures this is a drop lock for knee joint then there is a patellar cap to hold the knee in extension there is a calf band to hold the leg area there are two uprights the ankle joint is there but it is fixed no movement there is a solid stirrup which is fixed to the shoe you can see here and if you see the shoe this is a full opening shoe right up to the distal line shoe is open so now after looking at all these parts you can say me for which patients you will use so i will tell you one by one why this shoe is must have been given the patient may not may be having flail foot with no movements in the toes so you should see at the till the end of the toes whether they are crumpling inside the shoe so fully opening shoe you can see all the toes whether they are crumpled or not and there may be some sensory problem why the ankle is fixed the ankle must be also flail why the knee joints are uh, knee cap and all these things are there the limbs must be having very less power and they might be trying to go in flexion so to make keep them in extension this device is there and only the drop lock is there to placidly sit okay then why is single axis hip joint single axis hip joint is given that means patient must be having flexor power of the hip joint means iliopsoas must be good but the adduct adductors and extensors may not be good that's why he must have given this so that patient can sit and stand so this must be patient so now 
for which patient this be used in post polio or any other paralytic condition with a flail foot, flail ankle, flail knee, with hip abductor, with good flexor extensor power into the hip joint, SOS sensory issues in the foot. So by looking at the orthosis, you can take for which patients you will prescribe this orthosis. So you don't have to worry. So next exercise, identify this. So this is the footwear you are weighing it from the plantar side. So this is a heel. So this area of the heel is called as heel breast. So anterior bark. So in orthopedics also there is breast. So this area is called heel breast. Okay. So now in this picture, if you see, this is medial side and the heel breast is extending anteriorly. As compared to this, this is extending distal. So this heel is called as Thomas heel. So Thomas heel is also called as crooked and elongated heel. This is a commoner name and the short form is C and E. So everybody knows this short form. It is not a standard one. So C and E, crooked and elongated heel or Thomas heel. The distal border of the heel breast extends distally on the medial side under the medial longitudinal arch, thus supporting it, thus used in orthotic management of flat foot. If it is done opposite way, then it is called as reverse Thomas heel. So we'll go to the next exercise. So now if you see this surface, then if you see this section, the heel is increased in width on the medial side. The heel is increased in width on the lateral side. And here there is increase in width, but it still proximally in, uh, extends over the heel counter, over the shoe. So this is pro still proximally extending. So what are these three? and where they are used. So this I told you, this is called as medial heel flare, where the heel is flaring medially. This is lateral heel flare, where the heel is flaring laterally. And when the heel flare extends over the posterior part of the shoe, then it is called as heel offset. So heel offset is little further more supporting the shoe, while heel flare is only over the heel area. So that is the difference between a heel flare and a heel offset. So we'll see what is heel flare and heel offset. So heel flare increases the width of the heel either on medial side or lateral side. In offset, the in addition to the offset, extends proximally over, provides reinforcement and buttressing to heel counter. So this is used in combination with heel wedges. Heel counters are usually used in combination of heel wedges. I will tell you what is heel wedge. So Suppose a patient is having fixed hind foot virus, means what? The virus is not correctable. The heel is remaining in virus and you cannot correct it manually also. Then you want to keep the heel in virus itself and still you want to make the footwear plantigrade. Then what will you do? You will give a medial heel wedge with lateral heel offset so that this supports the fixed virus deformity and provides additional lateral reinforcement to prevent unwanted inversion injuries. So that's why it is used in fixed virus. So now what is heel wedge? So if you see, the heel is increased in height on one side. So this is medial side. So there is medial heel wedge. So this is medial heel wedge. So where you will use this heel wedge? So I will tell you what is this. So suppose this is, this is used to address rear foot problems like fixed or functional hind foot virus, valgus or equinus deformity. Now you tell, I will tell you what is fixed virus and functional virus. Functional means virus which is correctable, while which is dynamic virus. While fixed is already the deformity is fixed and which is not correctable. Now suppose the deformity there is a flexible hind foot virus. That means it is correctable virus. Then you give lateral heel heel wedge. If the virus is correctable, then you give lateral heel wedge so that you shift the center of pressure medially during weight bearing and it will give you some corrective force. While if the hind foot virus, if it is fixed, then you give it opposite way. So for a flexible hind foot virus, you give a lateral heel wedge. Then collar. So the regular collars are there, cervical collars. They may have provision for adjustment of height and stiffness. It provides mechanical restraint to flexion extension and lesser extent rotation 
and it is a reminder to the patient. So it doesn't primarily immobilize any movement. So it allows all movements, only the stiff terminal movement gives a reminder to the patient that there is some problem to his neck and he should not do uh, extremes of movement and to offer a better neck control or prefabricated foam others are available. One second. Pictures with me. One second. In between the pictures are not seen. Because all these question and picture slides are not seen. Should I re-load uh, the slides? Sandeep? Yes, what sir. What is the issue, sir? The question and picture slide is not coming. Only next slides are coming. I think the PPT has got corrupted or something like that. Like that. You I can re-share. Re you can stop sharing and re-share. There is nothing on the slide, sir. Ah, pictures are here. Next slide it is in the photograph. Just go ahead. I think now you can, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. you have hidden those slides. Now I'll see. So this is a color slide. So this yeah, I was seeing. No, I think I, I. Yeah, I think you have hidden the slides. Okay. You have hidden those slides. So I say the cut. Okay. Ah. So so now see what is this? If you see from the anterior side. If you see. From the anterior side, there are two uprights and a sternal part. If you see from the posterior side, there are two uprights and a interscapular part. That means there are four posts. So what is this? This is a four post collar. Okay. So this is a four post collar, which is so anterior portion consists of a sternal plate and two anterior uprights and a mandibular support, while posterior section consists of an interscapular plate with two posterior uprights and occipital sword, as, as I showed you here. So there are four posts, and the anterior and posterior portions are connected by straps. These are uprights are adjustable in end. So this is a little good immobilization, but it still allows little rotation and lateral flexion. So still it restricts around 60 to 70% of the movements. Then this is a commonly asked orthosis in the exams. So what is this? So from the anterior side, there is one plastic device from which two uprights go to the occiput and one central comes to the sternum. So it is immobilizing the neck completely. So this is a sterno-occipito-mandibular immobilizer. So this is a sterno-occipito-mandibular immobilizer or SOMI. So this is commonly asked exam. It differs from the post the device in posterior uprights arising from the sternal plate. So why it is more popular? Because most of the times these devices are to be attached to the persons with cervical spine injuries. And they are having quadriplegia and it is difficult to make them sit. And you are you want to still immobilize them. So four post collar, if you want to apply, you may need to pay, make the patient to sit up. While the sternooccipitomandibular immobilizer or SOMI, you can apply while patient is in sleeping position. So in quadriplegics with cervical spine injuries, so this is commonly asked in exams, so why you prefer so mean quadriplegics with cervical spine injuries? Because you can apply this in sitting, sleeping position. Now next exercise. So now identify this orthosis. Now this is further more immobilization of cervical spine. So now this is covering all of this part and it will not allow much movement of the neck. So we are gradually increasing the cervical collar was immobilizing only terminal wrist movements. Then we went to post devices, either four post collar or SOMI. Then we moved to this custom molded appliances. So this is, these are molds, either thermoplastic or leather formed over plaster model, thermoplastic material, or directly over low pressure thermoplastic form directly over body. And this, this is called as curious type. The curious type which extends superiorly from the occiput to the mandible. While this is called Minerva type, you must not have seen this, but when we were PG students, 
that time some surgeons used to put plaster cast like this and we they used to, we used to call it as minerva jacket where whole of the skull and the forearm band is there whole of the neck is immobilized and uh, sternal and anterior body plaster cast was there so this is called cuirass type where there is no head band and this is called minerva type but nowadays we make it from thermoplastic material i or leather formed over plaster model so these are custom molded appliances these are further more immobilizing the cervical spine so still further if you go you can mobilize the 100% immobilization if you want you can go for this halo vest or halo pelvic appliance so what is halo pelvic appliance it has got greatest control of the cervical spine it components are halo ring distractor rods are there shoulder bars and distal fixation either to a vest or on the iliac spine so these are halo cervical orthosis so you can have these are the distractor units halo vest and a garden bell or a halo ring which is attached to the skull then next is this is a commoner one which is asked in exams i always show in my lecture because this this orthosis was given to me in my exams and uh, i still remember the two examiners had got dispute in which is the anterior part and which is the uh, posterior part and then they cancel this orthosis and they gave me the other orthosis because there was dispute in themselves so that's why i usually keep these figures in my slides so this is what this is a milwaukee brace huh? so always remember any orthosis if you want to see spinal orthosis that the area where the two uprights are paraspinal so this is posterior in all orthosis and single one is anterior so this is a pelvic enclosure and this are these are the occipital support and the chin support remember that uh, there are few things which are commonly asked in the, on this orthosis why this chin support is there so it is not for resting the chin it is a reminder to the patient that he should not touch the chin to the skin, uh, chin support and he should try to extend and stretch it out so that as the patient stretches out the deformity will reduce and further you can go on adjusting the chin proximally but the problems are because of the pressure over the chin over the children growing children you may get bite deformities so this is a milwaukee brace it consists of molded pelvis section with three uprights one anterior two posterior connected to a neck ring pelvic section and neck ring opening posteriorly for comfort there is a throat piece at the nowadays we are using a throat piece instead of a chin piece to prevent bite deformities and occipital pads are attached to the neck ring and pelvic section is custom molded so all mil usually yeah. milwaukee brace is used with some pads so if the major curve is high thoracic you will use a trapezius pad the thoracic you use a thoracic pad thoraco lumbar you use a lumbar pad or lumbar curve you use a lumbar pad so how it works the three or four point corrective force systems means actively when patient extends the chin and stretches out of the orthosis at the same point you go on pressing with the pad to correct the rib hump so that the active element is present due to discomfort of the pads and patient actually pulls away from the pads and you just go on tightening the pads how much it is useful average correction of 18% to 20% or slightly less for left high thoracic more for lumbar curves at the end of one year but if you see the long term use over 5 years you should, you realize that you come to close to pre brace curve setting suggesting you just control the curve and you cannot correct the curve with a milwaukee brace if you start we suppose with a 40 degrees riser then at the end of the 5 years you will realize that you have still come back to a 40 degree riser so you have just control the curve and not corrected the curve thus the orthosis should be thought as a and uh, not as a turning large curves into small curves but as preventing progression and keeping small curves small then we'll go to the next orthosis this is again always usually kept in the exams because this is commonly available everywhere in all centers so what is this this is juvet hyperextension brace now i will tell you how to name suppose you don't may not know what is juvet name you know how to hyperextension brace so you have to tell how you name orthosis so now you see this orthosis which part it is controlling thoraco lumbo sacral area so this is a plso then it is only 
preventing flexion. So because the, there are two pads here, it is allowing lateral flexion, it is allowing rotation, it is allowing extension also. So this is only controlling flexion. So how will you name this? This is a TLFO, TLSO with flexion control. By this part, even if you don't tell, this is orthotic terminology for this orthosis. TLSO, flexion control. So like that, some other terminology I will tell you. It consists of anterior and lateral frame which are attached to sternal pad. Oh, so the slots are in uprights and bar may prevent at, permit adjustment. So this is where used. Where is this is used? In old age where they start developing divider's hump because of the osteoporosis and anterior wedging of the thoracic vertebrae. There if you want to prevent the kyphotic deformity, they use this orthosis and so anterior hyperextension brace. Then some conservative treatment of benign wedge fractures of the vertebral, vertebral fractures also you can use this. So this is commonly kept in exams, juvet anterior hyperextension brace. Similarly, now this I have done diagrammatic. Now if you see there are two posterior uprights, there is nothing laterally. That means what this, your, this orthosis will not allow flexion extension. This orthosis will not allow flexion extension, but this will allow lateral flexion and rotation. So now what is the name of this orthosis? Flexion extension control. So TLSO, because it is controlling thoracolumbar spine, thoracolumbar sacral orthosis, FE control. Oh, yeah. So that is the name for a Taylor's brace. So this is commonly which is available is Taylor's brace. So this allows flexion, this restricts flexion extension, but allows the other movements of the spine. Then if you go further, similarly, if you go to LSO, means only lumbosacral orthosis chair back type, where there you allow only lumbosacral control. So that is LSO. Similarly, mm -hmm. if you go to lumbosacral orthosis, flexion extension, lateral flexion control, means if you, for a Taylor's brace, if you add lateral uprights or lateral crutches, if you can call, then you will not allow it lateral flexion also. Then you call it night orthosis or LSO flexion extension control. Similarly, orthosis are there, different names are there. It is not easy or necessary to remember these names. When you see the orthosis, you, uh, you see to it what movements it is allowing. Now, if you see this orthosis, it is covering whole of the body. This is controlling thoracolumbar uh, TLSO, thoracolumbar sacral area. It is covering whole body jacket is there from anterior and posterior side. And it is not allowing flexion extension, lateral flexion, rotation. So this is a TLSO FLER because this is not a flexion, uh, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation. Everything is controlled. So this is TLSO FLER. That much if we can tell in exams, that is adequate. So this is a plastic body jacket, which is restricting all the movements. So I thank you for your attention. So I have restricted myself only to important orthosis, prosthesis and some detailed orthosis I have not taken for time constraint. Uh, I thank the organizers for giving me opportunity. Stop sharing. Sandeep? Sandeep, are you there? Sandeep? Uh, Anybody will uh, continue the next session? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful session on orthotics. Now I would request uh, uh, Jia Joshi, sir, to talk on uh, specimens. Uh, okay, I'll just share my uh, screen.
Okay, is the screen visible? Uh, not yet, sir. It... Screen is, screen is not at visible, sir. Okay. Yeah, now it is visible. Yeah, now. Okay. Fine, it is visible. I'll go ahead. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Fine. Good afternoon to you all. And uh, though the tables have been allotted very uh, less marks, but those of you who have done well, you will be able to pass with flying colors. And those of you struggling to make it, yes, table will push you to pass. So that is it. And uh, most of the Arthos uh, specimen, they come from two categories. One is uh, tumors, the other one is the infection. So you know what you are going to face and you should be well prepared. Fine. When you come to the specimen table, so you look at this specimen, make a mental picture of the what is the specimen, what are the features that are there, and go ahead uh, with describing. Once the diagnosis is right, and uh, the discussion will proceed. Now, this is the first thing. Uh, I'm showing you here is a, a piece of uh, a bone that is lying in front of you, and it is poorly white. Surface is irregular. If you observe closely the end margins, fine, they are sharp and rough, irregular. Oh, now you come to know what it is at this stage. This is a specimen of tubular or diaphyseal sequestrum. Fine. Now, then the subsequent uh, discussion will proceed in this way. What is the definition of uh, sequestrum? So you all think that it is a very simple and straightforward uh, uh, question, but it is not so. Most of you say it is a dead bone or a necrotic bone. This is not enough. This is not enough because that is can be osteonecrosis or aseptic necrosis also. To make it sequestrum, you need to add necrotic bone along with infection. So, sequestrum is a dead bone or a necrotic bone resulting from the infectious process or infection or it is a sequestrum dead bone lying in a cavity lined by granulation tissue. So you are making clear that the bone is dead, there is an infection. So that is what it is. Now then the next questions are go in a very routine fashion. What are the different types of sequestrum? When I have already shown you the uh, diaphyseal sequestrum, then the ring sequestrum, which is seen commonly in the amputation, where excessive periosteal elevation is done, uh, or in case of external fixation, uh, where you use the power tools to fix your Steenman pins and the uh, shan screws, where because of the thermal necrosis and subsequent pin track infection, ring sequestrum takes place. Feathery sequestrum occurs in uh, syphilitic periosteitis. Fine. The sandy sequestrum is because of the uh, thrombosis of or vasculitis of small vessels producing a very uh, sand-like sequestrum. Bombay sequestrum is uh, uh, called when a sequestrum, when it is exposed to a very pollutant air, there is a formation of some blackish uh, discoloration over the sequestrum because of uh, the sulfur dioxide that is there in the atmosphere forms a hydrogen sulfide. Fine, this is because the pollution levels are very high in Mumbai and it is often known as uh, Mumbai or Bombay sequestrum. Fine. So, the next is next types of uh, sequestrum is the uh, marble sequestrum, marble or ivory sequestrum. This is uh, often seen in. Uh, uh, this uh, chronic syphilitic osteomyelitis, where there is a formation of a gamma, and this gamma infiltrates all the bones that are affected, and subsequently it gets calcified. As a result, bones are pearly white, dense, and there is no medullary canal. That's why it is called, it looks like a marble, and that's why it is called 
a marble sequestrum. Again, take a closer look at this specimen. In the base of the jar, there are multiple bodies lying. They can be, they may be uh, cartilaginous or osteochondral. Fine, the shape is irregular. Size varies from one to two centimeters. Fine, you can say that this could be a loose body. Loose bodies are fragments of cartilage or bone or any other material that are floating inside the joint. Either they can be fixed or they can be moving, which are known as unstable loose bodies. Right. There are very causes of uh, loose bodies. One is chondral, other one is osteochondral, rice bodies. Rice bodies are the organized fibrin uh, uh, tissue which is, has got a very smooth surface and looks like a rice. When there can be metal bodies because of the splintering or because of the broken arthroscopic uh, uh, instruments. When these are the various causes. The osteochondral fractures in case of osteoarthritis and uh, the neuropathic joints, the uh, pigmental villonodular synovitis and uh, various other metallic or wooden loose bodies can be there. Management is most times it is through the arthroscopic removal. And very rarely you need to remove them uh, by open method. Come to the third specimen, have a closer look at this. Fine. This shows a cartilaginous or a osteochondral body that has got an irregular surface and surface is nodular. Fine. You can see the areas of the calcification and probably this seems to be the star. Fine. I think there is no difficulty for you in making a diagnosis of uh, uh, there is a no difficulty in making a diagnosis of osteochondroma. Fine. It is uh, you can describe it as a regular cartilaginous tissue, calcified, bony swelling with a star. Fine. Now it occurs mostly in the uh, childhood and in adolescent age group. Fine. And uh, common sites are around the knee, proximal fibula, proximal humerus. Right. There are various uh, theories of formation of this osteochondroma. This is also otherwise known as exostosis, solitary exostosis. One theory is that, uh, which is known as the Vrikos theory, uh, he, it, he says that the elements of uh, the physis, they get sequestrated into the metaphysis, turn 90 degrees and start forming the bone and the cartilage. And the other theory says that there could be a damage to the perichondral tissue. As a result, physis tissue comes out and grows. And uh, third theory is that there is a periosteal layer, cambium layer. It has got a, li uh, uh, a live tissue. Find the other one is the fibrous. Here, there is a metaplasia takes place in this tissue and it gets converted into a cartilage and starts growing. Whatever it is, one thing commonly accepted is that, yes, it is the source from the physis and it starts growing. Why it grows perpendicular to the axis of the bone and all is not known, but uh, one strong uh, reason that it arises from the physis is that it the growth of the exostosis stops when the growth of the child also stops. That is one uh, strong link. Now coming to the radiological features, there are very interesting radiological features uh, you can see. Uh, one is that it is in the metaphyseal region and uh, cortex of the osteochondroma is continuous with that of the bone. Medulla of the exostosis is continuous with that of the bone. This is very characteristic. And in the cap, you will see areas of calcification or loosency or the densities. This is basically the calcified cartilage and the uh, islets of the cartilage, fine. And in the, you know that this is an immature bone and it is grows away from the physis. So these are the very characteristic of this uh, exostosis. Now coming to the management, fine. Uh, by and large, they are not um, uh, treated because most of them are asymptomatic. They are treated only when they become symptomatic. Uh, causing pain, bursitis, fracture, turning malignant, and uh, causing pressure over the joint, muscle, tendon, nerves, etc. So these are also the complications of this uh, osteochondroma. Only during this time you remove them. 
Fine. One uh, uh, recommendation that preferably they should be removed uh, when the growth of the child stops. Fine. Uh, reason is that uh, yes, if it is uh, closer to the metaphyseal and the vices, you may end up damaging the growth plate if you do early. Fine. And they also say that there are clusters of cartilage that are there in the spongy bone of this uh, uh, osteochondroma. Once you remove it, subsequently they grow. So these are the reason and uh, management is usually end block removal fine, in symptomatic patients. Now coming to the ortho specimen number four, this is, uh, I did not have the uh, particular specimen, I have taken a picture because in most of the medical colleges you will find this particular picture, this specimen lying there. Fine, it shows a picture of the leg which is swollen both on the plantar aspect and on the dorsal aspect and uh, surface is irregular. There are multiple sinuses that are located and uh, they are discharging, they may be discharging the granules, fine. So it is a spot diagnosis of mother apput. Mother apput is a disease of bacteria, filamentous bacteria, what is known as actinomycetes, or it may be caused by the true fungi. So since it was earlier discovered in the state of uh, Madura long back, and it is how uh, leveled as Madura foot. All this, uh, uh, the uh, march of the events in case of Madhura foot is that there is a prick, some kind of a prick uh, in a person uh, walking on a bare foot. The fungi or the bacteria gains entrance into the subcutaneous tissue. It starts forming the granuloma. Granulomas coalesce together and they form a nodule. Ultimately, the nodule breaks and start discharging the granules. And the granules are of different color based on the uh, type of infection. Fine. So this is a very indolent course. It takes years, uh, months and years to manifest and cause the symptoms. Most of the time it is painless as a result patient comes late. You can also see the uh, picture of uh, Madura uh, infection, this mother of foot kind of mycetoma uh, infection on the back because most of these uh, laborers and the farm workers, they sleep in their farm bare back with, uh, with the, uh, uh, without clothes in their fields. As a result, the entrance, entry of the bacteria or the uh, fungi can takes place through the uh, back also. That's how uh, this is a rare kind of thing. Now coming to the uh, treatment. Uh, though it is quite painless and over a period of time it affects the function of the foot and it becomes a nuisance because all the time discharging and uh, huge uh, this uh, size of the foot and uh, the bacterial mycetoma responds to the treatment. So that is a combination of cotrimaxazole and the dapsone. Fine, it is given for a long period of time. Interestingly, the, uh, this is uh, Madhura foot is basically the disease of the soft tissue. Over a period of time, it starts involving the uh, tendons and also the bones. And it doesn't spread by uh, through the lymphatics to the regional nodes or to the systemic. Uh, a spread cannot take place. So it is a more local infection. Right? And uh, when it comes to, you need to, uh, grow this uh, particular uh, granules and identify the organism and accordingly treat them. Eumycetoma purely responds to the antifungal agents, that is ketoconazole or itraconazole. The treatment extends for a long period of time. Many times the true fungal madura food doesn't respond to the treatment. So during uh, uh, for this you may require repeated surgical debridement to control the growth. And uh, if it becomes a nuisance, you may have to go in for an amputation. So uh, this is the granuloma of the Madhura foot. I'm coming to the next uh, uh, specimen. Right? And uh, 
Have a closer look at uh, this specimen. It is a very classical uh, picture and uh, makes it a spawn diagnosis. So you can make out that this is the lower, uh, this is a femur bone and the tumor is in the lower part of the uh, 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 femur. So you can also see the well delineated posterior uh, capsule in the cortex and it is not invading the posterior cortex of the femur. In fact, the posterior cortex of the femur is more thicker where the tumor is located. So one thing is that, yes, it is relatively uh, uh, less malignant. So what can be the diagnosis? Fine. So coming to description of the tumor, well delineated tumor arising from the posterior surface of the femur arising from the cortex. Okay, and there is no medullary involvement or no soft tissue involvement, and it is a low grade tumor. More often, this is a, a patient who is presenting, he is a female patient in the age group of uh, 20 to 40. It has got a low grade. The diagnosis is parastial osteosarcoma. Fine. The histology shows uh, something a benign nature. Tumor composed of spindle cells and the collagen fibers, and it doesn't show the classic tumor osteoids. So this is a very benign tumor. Now coming to the uh, treatment part of it. This is graded based uh, on its histology and uh, grade one and grade tumors are benign and they are treated with uh, marginal resection. Right? And the cure rate uh, is almost 100% in this. The problem comes when the tumor is of high grade that is three and four. It behaves something like in classical osteosarcoma. So in these cases, the patient may need uh, preoperative chemotherapy and subsequent uh, uh, this uh, wide uh, resection. Fine prognosis, I told you that uh, in grade one and two, it is 100% five year survival. And in case of third and four, it is something similar to the osteosarcoma. Now coming to the specimen number six. Again, take a look at this. This is a um, specimen of the uh, femur and it shows a large exophytic growth. There is no distinction of cortex and the medulla and there is also a soft tissue involvement. Fine. The description goes like large tumor arising from metaphyseal region of the proximal femur. Cortex is breached and there is a permeation into the medullary canal, fine. So then you can see the areas of necrosis here and uh, the, uh, necrosis is suggested in the preserved specimen as a pits. And uh, you should uh, take it that uh, it is liquefied and it has uh, disappeared in preservation. If it looks dark and uh, probably that is hemorrhaging. Here, the classical picture is the spindle cells, minimal uh, interstitial collagen, and there is a tumor osteoid that is lined by osteoblast. This is very classic. The moment you see the tumor osteoid, this is osteosarcoma. Fine. And uh, coming to the radiological feature. Again, the radiological features are very classic. So the age group is 10 to 20 years. Most of the times, the uh, skeleton is immature. So metaphyseal location, immature skeleton, and it is expansile with destruction of cortex and extension into the medulla. Of course, there may not be any uh, uh, wide soft tissue shadow may be there. And uh, it uh, shows aggressive periosteal reaction, which is seen as a uh, Codman triangle and sunburst appearance. Okay. The tumor may have a thick opacity due to excessive calcification of tumor osteoid and calcification, or it may be lytic, total lucent. So in case of telangiectic uh, osteosarcoma, and most of the times the lesion is mixed and uh, destruction of the bone is both by uh, permeation and by moth eaten. And the zone of transition is quite wide. You do not make out where actually the tumor starts. Now, invariably, once you know this radiological features, now definitely come to the management. So in the morning, Dr. Panchwak had said that you need not know the details about the chemotherapy. However, it is better if you know it. Fine. And uh, 
all these cases after they are staged and uh, they are offered the treatment. If it is a man, uh, a non-metastatic and confined to the limb, in that case, uh, they are offered pre-operative uh, pre neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Most of the time, the combination is high-dose methotrexate, a cycl uh, cyclophosphamide, the adriamycin, and cisplatinum. Every hospital has its own uh, regime. We used to follow the adriamycin, cisplatin, and ephosphamide. Fine. And uh, once you give the pre-op uh, chemotherapy, tumor markedly regresses. All the vascularity that is there disappears. It lessens. Bone that is fluffy looking, it becomes dense, more calcified. If there is a pathological fracture, it will heal. So that is the time. And lot of edema that is there, it will also subside. So for a surgeon, pre-op chemotherapy is uh, very essential to facilitate the surgery. Now, what is limb salvage surgery? Earlier, the treatment of uh, all the bone sarcomas are amputation. Nowadays, in 80% of the cases, you can go in for limb salvage surgery. Limb salvage surgery is ablation of tumor with preservation of function of the limb. So this is the definition. So you are getting away with the tumor also and as well preserving the function. Fine. There are uh, different types of limb salvage surgery and they were enumerated by Dr. Panchwag in the morning. Now, my seventh specimen is, uh, observe this. This is the tibia. Fine. And uh, the proximal part is affected. You see multiple loculated cystic uh, cavities. And they are looking black. Obviously, they contained blood. Now, uh, yes, this is expansile centrally located lesion in the proximal part of the tibia. Cortex is thinned out, and the contents of the cyst look like spongy. There are multiple blood filled cavities. And this is the diagnosis of uh, the aneurysmal bone cyst, what they briefly called it as ABC. Fine. You also see sclerosis in these cases and you also see the periosteal reaction. Many times fluid levels are also visible when the x-ray is taken in a uh, supine position, in a quiet position of the patient. So these are the very char uh, characteristic. Again, the tumor occurs in the age group of 10 to 30 years of age and uh, X-ray. Again, the findings are very characteristic. You can see the location is metadiaphyseal. Right? Metadiaphyseal. At times, it extends pro uh, proximal to the epiphysis also. And you see the honeycomb appearance due to multiple osseous septations. These are all the blood sinusoids and uh, they are uh, lined by the uh, bony septic. Right? And uh, there may be marginal sclerosis and uh, periosteal reaction may be there. So this is characteristic. The differentiating point between the GCT and the ABC is the periosteal reaction, which is not there in the GCT. Right? And again, GCT is purely uh, epiphyseal. Here it is metaphyseal, can extend to the diaphyseal. Fine. The treatment is extended, correct taste like you do in case of giant cell tumor. So the rate of recurrence in ordinary uh, situation is 25 after you do the extended curettage, bone grafting, cement filling, and uh, or synthetic bone graft. The rate comes down to almost 6%. Fine. The eighth specimen you can uh, see, uh, this is the specimen of uh, humerus. And the location of the tumor is in the metaphysis. Again, there is a lot of necrosis and the black areas that are seen. And there is no distinction between the medulla and the cortex that is uh, being destroyed. But uh, what I want to see here, I'll show you here is, here, there is a, Thin glistening, some structure, it is very well, not uh, very classical. I will show in the next specimen if it is uh, there. So it could be a contrasarcoma. Tumor uh, occupying 
proximal humerus shows areas of white shine hyaline cartilage and uh, there can be scalloping of the uh, cortex thinning out and uh, medulla and there are areas of the calcification may be seen again the chondrus sarcoma occurs in the later age 40 to 60 years type fine it commonly affects the flat bones like ileum scapula and uh, it is a metaphyseal location in other places Yeah, this is the X-ray, and these are the features. Yes, classical uh, uh, this chondrosarcoma will look like this. This is the central picture. Observe it, glistening, pearly white, glistening, blue colored cartilage that is visible, and you can see the scalloping of the inside. Fine, right? there may be soft tissue, shadow may be there, and characteristic uh, X-ray calcification is there in a punctate form, comma form, and uh, various. That is very characteristic. And uh, coming to the treatment, this neither responds to the chemotherapy nor to the radiotherapy. Fine. The sheet anchor of treatment is the surgical excision. Fine. Again, uh, you can uh, do the uh, limb salvage surgery and replacement with mega processes or custom made processes. Now, coming to the uh, Specimen number eight, the giant cell tumor. Lower end of the, lower end of the femur, identify this anatomically first what it is. And uh, the eccentric location of the tumor in the epiphysis. Fine. Let us see eccentrical located tumor, epiphysis of the distal femur, shows cortical th thinning and cavity contains large fleshy tissue with areas of hemorrhage. Again, 20 to 40 and the female preponderance and the epiphyseal location. You don't see GCT in the, in the immature skeleton or in the metaphysis or diaphysis. The commonest site, 60% of the lesions occur around the knee joint. Others are proximal humerus, distal radius. The characteristic HP is the spindle cells there along with the uh, giant cell which look like a osteoclast. The uh, interstitial uh, uh, interstitial tissue is very minimal, is a collagen, and characteristically the osteoid is missing in this case. Okay, now coming to the radiological picture, you are all very well versed with the radiological picture of the GCT, location, uh, epiphysis, in a skeletally mature patient, or at times it can be uh, centric and the expansile lesion, there are multiple septae giving rise to the appearance of soap bubble appearance. So this causes uh, classically the geographic destruction of the bone and you don't find periosteal reaction, remember this, uh, uh, the periosteal reaction and the sclerotic margin. Again, uh, Okay, coming to this, uh, uh, again, a tumor patient, I'll uh, skip this considering the time constraint, fine. So, I'll come to this uh, picture, tumor in the proximal humerus, and uh, again, the permeation and moth, it, uh, the destruction of cortex and classical picture of uh, the wing sarcoma. Yes, there can be differential diagnosis of osteosarcoma also. So because both are metaphyseal in origin if they are present, but classically if it is in the uh, diaphyseal region, again, then the diagnosis becomes the Ewing sarcoma first. Here, the aggressive periosteal reaction is in the form of uh, layers of periosteum and uh, on X-ray, it is described as onion peel appearance. I'll come to that X-ray finding. This is the picture, histopathology picture, sheets of round cells with a blue cytoplasm and minimal interstitial tissue. And they show high uh, uh, hyperchromatism uh, and mitotic activity. Fine. Now coming to the, yes, onion peel appearance, you can make out 
layers of periosteum around the diaphysis. And it can also give a sunburst appearance. Don't think that it is exclusive to the uh, osteosarcoma because what uh, uh, sunburst is a kind of an periosteal reaction. Now coming to the treatment, yes, the standard treatment is workup staging and uh, then pre-op chemotherapy. Here you use the phosphamide, vincristine, adriamycin, and cyclophosphamide. Right? Excision of the tumor and uh, reconstruction with custom-made processes or uh, readily available mega processes. Fine. Here the survival is 62% uh, for five years. And this is also one of the very aggressive. I'll come to the very unusual specimen here. And uh, this you can make uh, make out that. This is a, look wise, it looks a semilunar fibro uh, cartilage type. And uh, there is a longitudinal tear with wide separation. Fine. And uh, this could be medial uh, meniscus with a tear, uh, a longitudinal tear, and could be described as a uh, bucket handle tear. And bucket handle tear. So a lot of fibrous tissues are there and it looks more wider semicircle unlike the lateral meniscus. The incidence of uh, uh, meniscal tears are 10 times more in the medial, the medial side than on the lateral side. Remember mechanism of the tear. Whenever knee flexes, the meniscus move with the tibia in flexion and extension. When there is a rotation, meniscus moves with femur. Fine. The medial meniscus is quite mobile, whereas, uh, sorry, uh, lateral meniscus is quite mobile because there is the attachment of uh, popliteus and uh, it moves during a rotation and it takes away uh, uh, getting caught between the condyle, whereas the medial meniscus is large and it is fixed to the capsule. Uh, as a result, when there is a semi-flexed loaded knee going in for a rotation. Invariably, the meniscus gets caught and has a longitudinal tear and fine. So presentations, most of the times, you know, and uh, clinical findings, McMurray's test is present only in 40% of the cases. In remaining, uh, you need to diagnose clinically by the clicks and ultimately the MRI, which clinches the diagnosis. There are various types of tear longitudinal tear, radial tear, and the horizontal tear, parrot beak tear, bucket handle, flap, etc. You need to know them. Fine, I think again, this is the last specimen. It is a uh, specimen of vertebral column. You can well make out that. It has been cut uh, uh, this uh, vertically. And these are the discs, IV disc. And here is the vertebra. It is totally collapsed. So once you look at this, yes, vertebra is de destroyed, the discs are normal. Your differential diagnosis should be metabolic bone disease, multiple myeloma, osteoporosis. The common source of uh, secondaries to the bone is lung, breast, prostate, and the lung. And most of the times you can take a guided biopsy and uh, also do the kyphoplasty at the same time, if there is a cortically, it is intact. This will relieve the pain, fine. Now, coming to the, this is the kyphoplasty that is then. Otherwise, most of the time spinal uh, mets are treated either by chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Surgery is recommended when they, there is a significant canal invasion or cord compromise. You do decompression and stabilize the spine. I think that completes the specimen talk and uh, I complete. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. That was quite... ...comprehensive. And, and as the PGs can see, most of the long case, short case, or even in... Uh, sorry to interrupt, your voice is breaking. Bring some net issue. Yes, sir.
Dr. Joshi will have to unshare his screen. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Madhav, can you just yeah. share your screen? Yeah. And today, this is today's last talk, radiology, how to interpret x-rays. Over to you, Madhav. Yeah. Is it is the screen visible now? Yes. Just make it full screen. And am I audible properly? Yeah, I will. I will. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to see how to make a slide show. Okay. Am I audible now? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Please continue. Okay. Can I start now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sandeep, Ashok and all the organizers of the PG course. Uh, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Uh, ideally, usually we conduct this as an interactive session, but unfortunately because of these unusual circumstances, this time we are having an online thing. So we will have to make some changes in the, uh, you know, the type, the how we are going to take this lecture. So like every time we will just go through the basics of reading of an x-ray and then instead of normally I ask someone to read an x-ray and then we have discussion on that instead of that I'll show you an x-ray and I only will tell you what is expected of you while reading that x-ray so I think let us start now uh, as you all know that x-rays were discovered accidentally by William Ronton while working in his lab uh, in 1895 x-ray is uh, most commonly and one of the first investigation that is ordered in an orthopedic patient. But unfortunately, uh, pathology on an X-ray is visible only after 40% of the bone that is your viewing is involved, unless it is a case of a fracture. It is a unidimensional modality and hence at least two images as close to 90 degrees to each other as possible are required to view the maximum area of the bone. So as it is said, one view is no view. At times, you may have to take multiple views like oblique views or comparison views or, uh, you know, the x-ray of the opposite side to, uh, so I just, one minute. I'm, there is some bar which is coming below. I can't take it out. Okay. So the next two slides will uh, uh, prove that uh, you need to take AP and lateral x-rays to get a proper view of what you are looking at. So look at these films. So this is what it is. So now this x-ray of an elbow, if you have a cursory look at it, you might pass it off as a normal x-ray. Although if you look very closely, you can see that the joint space is not normal. Uh, you can't see the complete joint space, but at times you could pass this x-ray uh, as a normal. But when you take a lateral, you realize that this is the kind of injury that the patient has. So this proves how important it is to take AP and lateral, both views. Now coming to interpretation of images, uh, there are no strict or laid down patterns or rules as to how you should read an x-ray. But what is expected is you follow a systematic search pattern. Uh, make up a one for each of you for yourself, which helps to ensure that nothing is missed. So you decide how you would like to read the X-ray and follow a systematic pattern. Secondly, spend enough time looking at the X-ray as more than one pathology can coexist in the same film. Okay. Look at this. Now, this is the, these are the x-rays of the same patient. So here is a fracture, subprochantric fracture, which has been fixed with a uh, intramedullary nail. But this is the x-ray of the pelvis and the skull. So this is either a metastasis, a case of multiple metastasis, or it could be multiple myeloma. So you should spend enough time with the x-rays to see what is what you are looking at. 
ह्यूमन टिश्यूज फॉल इन टू फोर रेडियो डेंसिटी कैटेगरी एयर ऑन एन एक्सरे प्लेट अपियर्स द ब्लैकेस्ट और द डार्केस्ट एंड द बोन अपियर्स व्हाइटेस्ट द फैट एंड वॉटर वुड फॉल समवेयर इन बिटवीन दीज टू Now, while looking at the X-ray, you look in a systematic pattern, as I said. First, look at the alignment. You look at the size of the bone, the presence or absence of the bones. If the bones are deformed, how are the bone contours and alignment of joint surfaces when you are looking at the joints? Next, you look at the bone density. First, you look at generalized density of the bone of the part that you are looking at, and next. you look at the part of the bone which are uh, which is uh, pathological or which the patient is suffering from some disease so look for bone density whether there is generalized osteoporosis or there is a localized osteoporosis periarticular osteoporosis so all these things you need to know so alignment bone density then cartilage spaces that is the joint spaces so whenever you are looking at the joint you look for the joint spaces the epiphyseal spaces the surfaces whether they are irregular or regular all these things you need to see last but not least you have to look at the soft tissues so you look at the muscles the capsules fat pads and various lines that are important in diagnosing certain things so now let's come to actual reading of a x ray when in a exam on the table viva when you are given a x ray and you are asked to read a x ray so what is expected of you so first thing that you should see or say is what type of a x ray i mean uh, x ray it is that is whether it is a plain x ray it is a ct scan it is a mri or an ultrasound film what so you say that whether that this is what when it is given to you you say that it is a uh, plain x ray of whatever part of the body so next you say is which part of the body is visualized in the x ray then which side so when it is uh, related to limbs or joints you always say which side you are looking at whether it is the right side or left side usually it is marked on the x ray so you say the side of the uh, part which is you are looking at next whether it's a mature or immature skeleton this is very important because there are certain when you are especially in uh, when you are looking at x rays of tumors uh, you must you have to be aware that there are certain tumors which are uh, which occur only at particular ages that is below before the bone maturity some of them appear only after bone maturity so you have to say whether the x ray that you are looking at is of a mature or of a immature skeleton next look at the name of the patient and date of the patient uh, date of the x ray so this is very important because of two things you have to be sure that the x ray that you are looking at belongs to the patient that you are looking at and secondly that the x ray has been taken very recently you can't have a old x ray looking at uh, old x ray and then trying to diagnose what the patient is suffering from today many a times the patients have been x rayed many a time multiple times and then they give you some old film so you have to be very uh, cautious and look at the date of the x ray next you come for the looking at the pathology of the x ray that is as we said before as per your uh, convenience whatever you have decided how you want to look at the x rays you look for the contours deformities alignment of the bones and joints bone density that is the generalized and local joint spaces epiphyses so once you uh, uh, in a proper sequence you see at the x rays you will come to know what pathology you are looking at so this is what is expected when you are actually taken given a x ray in your hand this is what is expected and this is how you should read the x ray a type of x ray which part of the body which side whether it is a mature or an immature skeleton name date of the x ray and then pathology okay <clears throat> this is something very important that you should know uh, william dafner who is a professor of radiology at new york university has you know let down certain few criteria that you should evaluate while assessing x rays of the tumorous lesions of the bone and joint so again when you are looking at a tumorous lesion of the bone you if you have in your mind certain things that you have to look at then you are likely not to miss things you know you make a like a checklist ki you have to look at this you have to look at this 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 so if you have a checklist with you then you are likely not to are likely to miss anything from the findings while reading a x ray 
okay so this is known as the daphnos predictor variables so this is especially when you are looking at tumor x rays so what do you look or uh, look for when you are looking at a x ray of a tumor first is a nature of bone destruction as all of you know that uh, there are three types of uh, bone destruction that you basically look at in a tumorous lesion first is a geographic type which is again subdivided into three types that is type a type b and type c second is a moth eaten type and third is a permeative type so when you look at the type of destruction in the bone lesion you get an idea as to what type of tumorous lesion you are dealing with whether it's a very aggressive it's a slow growing or uh, probably a benign or a, mal a malignant lesion so first thing is you look at the nature of destruction next is you look at zone of transition that is the intervening or the uh, interposing tissues that is between the pathological area and the normal bone so that is known as the zone of transition so it can be a narrow zone of transition or a wide zone of transition that means the demarcation if between the tumorous lesion and the normal bone if it is very clear and well demarcated it is known as a narrow zone of transition in a narrow zone of transition it probably tells you that probably you are dealing with a benign type of benign type of lesion or if it is not very well defined that that zone of transition is not very well defined and the tumor uh, is you know uh, uh, generally spreading into the uh, surrounding bone without a proper uh, zone of transition then it is known as a wide zone of transition so when you have a wide zone of transition in the lesion that time you are probably dealing with a either aggressive type of a benign lesion or a malignant lesion next you look for penetration of the cortex or joint by the lesion so in the juxta articular lesions or in the uh, diaphyseal lesion when it is an intra osseous lesion you look for whether the lesion is still inside the bone or it has breached the cortex and gone into the soft tissues or it has breached the uh, articular surface and gone into the nearby joint so this is what you should look at behavior of the lesion that is how what type of uh, activity is going on in that uh, particular tumorous lesion whether it is a osteolytic or osteoclastic activity where there is more of bone destruction or whether it is a osteoblastic activity that is where more bone is being laid down or it is a mixed type of lesion so this will give you a clue as to what you are looking at next is what type of matrix is filled in the cavity or in the tumor so whether it's a osteoid that is whether the bony or a matrix or whether it is a chondroid or a cartilage type of a uh, matrix or again it's a mixed type of uh, uh, the matrix that you are dealing with next is the periosteal reaction whether a periosteal reaction is present and what is the type so there are various types of periosteal reaction that you uh, get to look at at in various lesions first is a solid type of uh, periosteal reaction where there is a generalized thickening of the bone and the cortex and this is usually you get to see this in chronic lesions like osteoid osteoma or a very low grade infection the second periosteal reaction that you commonly see is the laminated type which is created by multiple concentric planes of ossification or bone is being laid down in multiple sheets or uh, layers and which looks like a peeled onion that is one after the other layers of bone is being deposited this is usually seen in very active bone destroying lesions especially uh, acute osteomyelitis or a tumor like uh, ewing sarcoma so a laminated or onion peel uh, type of periosteal reaction is classically seen in an ewing sarcoma next is the spiculated uh, type of a periosteal reaction the spicules are a result of new bone formation along the radial vessels uh, in the tumor and it classically gives an appearance which has been described classically as the sunburst appearance and very classically seen in an osteogenic sarcoma okay so these are the types of periosteal reactions that you should be aware of we have already said that 
age of the patient and the maturity of the skeleton is extremely important you should know what whether the skeleton is matured or of an immature skeleton because that will again give you a clue as to what type of lesion you are dealing with margins of the lesion so when there are intra osseous uh, destructive lesions uh, whether they are very sharp margins or they are poorly margins uh, poorly defined margins so again it will give you a clue as to whether it's a malignant or a aggressive type of lesion very sharp margins are usually seen in a benign or slow growing uh, tumors and poorly defined margins are usually in aggressive benign lesions or malignant lesions uh, next what you need to look, look at is the shape of the lesion in the bone that is inside the bone whether the lesion is longer than it is wider or it is wider than it is longer so a longer lesion uh, than wider is a slow growing uh, tumor or a lesion and a wider lesion is a more aggressive lesion because there is quick uh, destruction which is going on and there is a expansion of the cortex from both sides so wider lesion suggests that it's a more of an aggressive lesion locus of the lesion within the bone so this is a diagrammatic representation of the various types of tumors uh, that are found in the various locations of the bone uh, you will find this in any one of your textbooks so you know non ossifying fibroma fibrous dysplasia where a gct like classically a gct is a uh, epiphyseal tumor uh, osteogenic sarcoma is a metadiaphyseal tumor so the location of the lesion inside the bone Uh, will also give you a clue as to what type of lesion or a tumor you are dealing with so this is in short uh, what i would like to say about uh, what you need to know about what you should be looking for in the x ray when you take up a x ray if it's a fracture then it's uh, different i mean as i said before uh, you look at all the things but in the tumorous lesions these are the important uh, seven eight things that you need to keep in mind look at them and read them accordingly okay so you are not likely to miss the things so this is about how you should read a x ray this is the theoretical presentation uh now we will actually go in the next half of the talk we will actually go to the uh, looking at some x rays and how one is expected to read those x rays uh, basically this part of the that is the second part we usually have a interactive type of a part where i ask one of the students to read the x ray but as i said it is not possible today so i'll be showing you a x ray uh, look at the x ray for a couple of seconds uh, think of how you would read that x ray and then i will tell you what is expected of you okay okay so this is a x ray so in the next slide i will i'll be telling you what what all points you should be saying or what you should be saying about this x ray okay i think i'll go to the next slide so as you can see this is a x ray of the foot and ankle you uh, in a ap of a left ankle and foot ap and lateral views uh, okay so this is how you would probably uh, read this, this x ray so it is a plain x ray of the left foot and ankle lateral views and ap views of the foot of a mature skeleton in the lateral view you can see there is gross osteopenia there is destruction of bone and loss of joint spaces in ankle subtalar and tarsal joints there is subluxation of the mid tarsal joints with collapse of the longitudinal arch in the ap view there is gross gross destruction of the mid tarsal talonavicular metatarsophalangeal joints except the first metatarsophalangeal joint so if you see the first uh, metatarsophalangeal joint here is intact rest all of the mid tarsal joints are completely destroyed and there is some new bone formation as well <clears throat> there is lateral sub, 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 severe soft tissue swelling if you see this 
as i said you should not be looking only at the bones you should also look at the soft tissues so there is severe soft tissue swellings okay so this is how you would probably uh, read all the findings and the diagnosis would be either it is an infective type of arthritis or and the next uh, this thing is it is a charcot or a neuropathic joint okay so let's move on to the next x ray <clears throat> okay so you can have a look at this x ray mother just carry on yeah yeah okay so this is a x ray of the uh, pelvis with both hips uh, there are three films as you can see so there is some difference in the three films it is a uh, case of a intertrochanteric fracture of the uh, femur and uh, these two films that are below these are the valgus and the varus strain views so probably this is a old fracture which has been untreated okay so as i said this is why is this not going okay so it's a mature skeleton uh, pelvis with both hips ap and stress views valgus and varus stress views of the uh, right hip uh, so what you need to sure say is it's a mature skeleton the shenton lies is broken there is an intertrochanteric fracture with subtrochanteric extension that is an extra capsular fracture on the right side the greater trochanter is proximally migrated the lesser trochanter is fractured there is callus present around the fracture the fracture is ununited as seen on the varus and the valgus stress views and there is a varus at the neck shaft angle so the diagnosis would be an ununited intertrochanteric fracture of the right femur so i am saying ununited and not non union because on the x ray it is unlikely that we will be knowing the duration of the fracture so you should say that it is an ununited intertrochanteric fracture of the right femur okay now coming to the next film so this is the x ray of the right femur with the knee joint and the hip joint ap and lateral views in an immature skeleton with a some lesion in the metaphyseal metadiaphyseal region of the distal end of the femur <clears throat> okay so now again as i said this is plain x ray of the right femur with knee uh, there is a lytic cystic lesion in the lower end of femur uh, which is juxta juxtafacial sclerotic well defined margin it is centric with slight uh, eccentric uh, expansion of the cortex but there is no breach of the cortex so you can see now all these points are being covered it's a cystic type of lesion it is juxtafacial there is a sclerotic well defined margin so the transition zone is narrow it is centrally located in the femur there is no breach of cortex or the epiphyseal plate so it has not breached the cortex into soft tissues nor it has crossed the epiphyseal line and gone into the physis there is no periosteal reaction there is slight expansile the cortex lateral cortex uh, lateral cortex has expanded little bit on the lateral side it is lesion is longer than wider in dimension so probably it is a uh, benign type of a or not a very aggressive type of a tumor or a lesion there are calcified septae crossing the cavity so most probably the diagnosis would be a benign tumor of the lower end of the right femur either a aneurysmal bone cyst or a simple bone cyst okay so you can just go back and have a sorry okay so this was the x ray we saw okay and this is what you are likely to uh, 
uh, or expected to see. See, there is a expansion of the lateral cortex. There are multiple septae crossing the uh, cavity. It's a lytic lesion. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now this. Okay, so this is a plain X-ray, right femur, AP, and lateral views. Uh, the fracture in the middle third of the shaft of the femur is ununited. There are two Ender's nails in C2. The fracture line is seen in both the views, that is AP and lateral, with sclerosis of bone ends. There is a hypertrophic callus seen around the fracture. There is no evidence of infection in the form of infective callus or a sequestrum. So the diagnosis would be an hypertrophic non-union mid shaft of the right femur with implant in C2. Here I'm saying non-union because there is clear cut evidence of there is sclerosis of the ends. The fracture line is clearly seen in both the views and there is a hypertrophic callus. So I can safely say it is a non-union. Okay. So this is again another tumor which we are looking at. So here what you would say is, it's an X-ray of the right femur with knee, AP and lateral in an immature skeleton. Uh, there is a tumorous growth engulfing the lateral, anterior and the posterior aspects of the lower end of femur. So it's an extra osseous growth. There is erosion of the lateral cortex of the lower end of femur with invasion of the medullary cavity by the tumor. The periosteal elevation up to the uh, lower one third of the femur and there is evidence of a cordman strangle, a classical cordman strangle you can see. See here. This is the cordman strangle, okay, where there is an elevation of the periosteum. So this is a tumor which is engulfing from outside. There is breach of cortex and the tumor has gone inside. So it has become intraosseous now, an outside tumor. It has breached the cortex and gone inside the medullary cavity. There is peculiar calcification seen in the uh, tumor mass. The epiphysis is not involved and there is no evidence of pathological fracture. So as you see, I have covered all the points that have been described in the Daphnus criteria when you are looking for the tumorous uh, lesions on X-ray. Okay, so the diagnosis here would be uh, parosteal osteogenic sarcoma of the lower end of right femur. Okay, so another tumor again. So as you can see, this is the humerus and the shoulder part of the shoulder joint is seen. Uh, here you can see EXT and internal rotation. So these are rotational views, internal and external rotation views, AP and lateral views. Okay. Okay. So X-ray of the left upper two third of the arm with shoulder, AP, lateral, internal and external rotation views of an immature skeleton. There is a multilobulated extra osseous sessile type of bony growth arising from the lateral, medial and the posterior part of the upper end of humerus. The epiphysis is not involved. There is no evidence of fracture. There is calcification at the apex and within the growth is seen. There is widening of the upper end of the humerus is also seen. Here you can see that the upper end of the humerus is widened here. This is the growth. There is calcification at the apex of the lesion plus there is some spicule calcification here okay so this is how you describe the lesion so the diagnosis would be a sessile osteochondroma of the upper end of left humerus okay so now here we are looking at a x-ray of the left knee ap and lateral views so look at the x-ray for a few seconds and then i'll go to the reading of the x-ray. Okay, so x-ray left knee, AP and lateral views. In the AP view, 
there is total loss of joint space there is erosion and irregularity of the joint uh, surfaces there is subchondral lytic and sclerotic shadows are seen in both femur and tibia there is lateral subluxation of the tibia on the femur look here the tibia is subluxated laterally abnormal soft tissue swelling is also seen in the ap view the lateral view shows the same findings as in ap with the reduction of uh, patellofemoral joint space posterior soft tissue shadow is seen here there is a huge soft tissue shadow which is seen posterior to the knee joint and in the suprapatellar region bony sequestra in the suprapatellar pouch are seen there is generalized rarefication of bones in the periarticular area so this is what the diagnosis you should give arthritis or infective rather infective arthritis probably a tuberculous or a septic type of arthritis okay so this is another tumorous condition okay so x ray of the right forearm with wrist ap lateral in a mature skeleton there is an expansile osteolytic lesion involving the lower end of the radius geographic type of uh, destruction uh, metaphyseal region with poorly defined margins wider than longer its radiocarpal articular surface is intact see now you can see that the radiocarpal articular surface is intact but the volar cortex is completely vanished there is nothing left on the radial and the volar side the tumor has completely breached the bony cortex and come into the soft tissues thin cortical shell is preserved on the ulna side and breach of cortex with invasion of the soft tissues on the radial side is seen pathological fracture at the proximal end and soft tissue swelling is seen scalloping of ulna is also seen so if you can see look here the tumor which is growing has caused the scalloping of the radial side of the ulna distal third okay so these are small small things which you should not miss while looking at the x ray so the diagnosis probably it's most probably it's a giant cell tumor of the lower end of radius right okay okay so x ray of the left humerus with elbow and shoulder ap and lateral views in the mature skeleton there is an expansile centric lytic lesion of the middle third and lower third of the humerus geographic type of destruction homogeneous matrix with ill defined margins lobulated with septae are seen widening of the medial canal medullary canal and thinning of cortex and there is deformation of bone if you see see there is a deformation of the bone the lateral cortex is uh, expanded like this and the margin there it's not a sclerotic margin complete inside uh, it's not a very good uh, zone of transition okay but it's more longer than wider so probably a benign diaphyseal bone tumor of the left humerus either a fibrous dysplasia a unicameral bone cyst or a aneurysmal bone cyst okay this is interesting x ray of the left elbow and lower end humerus ap lateral in an immature skeleton ap view shows a distal end of humerus shows uh, increased density with sclerosis periosteal reaction is seen on the radial border olecranon fossa is not visualized properly joint surfaces are well aligned lateral view there is a uniting supracondylar fracture of the humerus when the fracture line is still seen see you can see here the fracture line which is still seen the fracture is still uniting posterior superior bridging callus is seen posteriorly heterotrophic ossification or immature new bone formation seen in the anterior muscle mass of the lower third of arm and anterior to the coronoid so diagnosis is malunating supracondylar humerus 
with myositis ossificans so this is a classic case of myositis ossificans okay you should not miss this this is not callus don't say this is callus this is a newborn formation in the brachialis muscle so this is a myositis ossificans usually as a result of massage which is given by the bone setters and uh, you know this is what happens when uh, there is uh, bone formation in the muscle uh, sandeep yes madam sandeep yes yes uh, it's almost 35 minutes Can continue yeah, or yeah. we should stop how many more x rays are there what how many are there uh, ek minute just let me check maybe you can just show a couple and then because we are already half an hour over time yeah yeah i know it's all our maza tap 35 minutes are over so i just ask you kai kar okay so this is another interesting x ray Instead, x-ray of the right knee, AP and lateral in the mature skeleton. Uh, this is the joint space medial more than lateral. See, this is basically an osteoarthritis x-ray. There is a gross reduction of the medial joint space more on the medial side than the lateral side. Then there are multiple. There is soft tissue swelling posteriorly, and these are basically multiple osteocartilaginous loose bodies which are present in the joint. Okay. there are lot of osteophytes uh, in the superior and the lower pole of patella and on the margins of the tibia and these osteocartilaginous loose bodies are basically uh, synovial chondromatosis so the diagnosis here is a multiple syno synovial chondromatosis with tricompartmental osteoarthritis of the knee okay so this is a very interesting x ray another x ray uh, this is a classic mortar and pestle type of a uh, protrusio that is seen in the hip joint probably again most commonly seen in the tuberculosis uh, of the hip see this what has happened this is a classic mortar and pestle type of appearance in the hip tuberculosis of the so the joint space is decreased but there is protrusio there is severe osteopenia in the periarticular area uh okay so again infective arthritis most likely to be tuberculosis yeah i think that was the last slide okay thank, thank you. you very much so thank you very much thank you madhav that was absolutely exhaustive and classic cases where you have shown really good uh, x rays with classic findings and as everybody now who was attending should realize that detailing of x-ray reading is very important to come to a precision diagnosis so at the end i would like to thank dr jia joshi dr sanjay dev dr madhav khadilkar for excellent cooperation and superb talks for the post graduates um, i have received request that if you can share these ppts we will be sharing the recording of this whole proceedings to all registered delegates soon we'll let you know how you can access them through the whatsapp group and if possible if i get the ppts from faculty and they agree i will share the ppt also uh, so thank you ashok for uh, wonderful technical support it went yes, flawless sir. and uh, we hope to probably conduct a physical in person course next year at bharti vidyapeet medical yeah. college let's hope corona yeah. goes away and happy holi to all happy holi thank you thank you very much to sandeep thank you ashok yeah. it was lovely dr sandeep thank you dr dev and dr joshi any concluding remarks from you before we wind off uh dr sandeep in this difficult time also we were uh, able to manage this uh, pg training course and uh, that is a wonderful and uh, there was a very excellent response from the pgs and uh, we are all quite happy so they are also keen to learn and uh, fine uh, the same uh, uh, event will be there next year at bharti vidyapeet and uh, we'll be face to face with each other there will be interaction and that is how the real uh, orthopedic uh, learning and teaching is done i hope 
you will be <clears throat> there next time uh, some of your juniors you can convey them and uh, it was wonderfully conducted by the dr wonder uh, dr patwardhan and his team i am very thankful to him hello uh, thank you sir dr dev yes sir uh, thank you for uh, uh, including me in this particular course uh, the course was conducted very nicely jointly by the varthi vidyapeet dr joshi sir and his team dr khadilkar and everybody and from sanchati hospital uh, i would like to thank dr parag sanchati dr patwardhan sir and all the team members and it was a very nicely conducted course for all the pgs and hope uh, we, we will be able to conduct such a course next year with face to face thank you very much thank you very much thank you sir so we are happy that we still have 86 pgs listening to the last word that we are saying and with that i think we will wish everybody goodbye and uh, see you again next year at bharti vidyapeet thank you very much